Echo in Time, Echo Trilogy, Book One, written by Lindsay Sparks, writing as Lindsay Fairley, narrated by Dana Day. Prologue Mesweth, know yourself, and you shall know the gods. Mesweth, trust yourself, and you shall trust the gods. So it ends from start to finish, as found in writing. Taken from the Prophecy of Nuin, Old Kingdom, C. 2180 BCE. I thought I knew people. I didn't. I thought I could trust my family and my friends. I couldn't. I thought I at least had some idea of who I am. Wrong. But here's the real kicker. I never thought I'd be in the heart of an ancient temple, driven by desperation and hatred, ready to kill my own father. Screaming, I launch myself at him. My rage and sorrow are so great that I no longer have room for any other emotions. Coherent thought is foreign to me. I have one purpose, to destroy him. He doesn't see me coming. He can't see me coming. I'm moving too quickly, bending time to my will. It's impossible, but that doesn't make it any less real. How? My father doesn't have time to finish the question. I've already torn the gun from his grasp and pressed the muzzle against the side of his head. I flex my index finger. Click. Part 1. University of Washington. Seattle, Washington. Chapter 1. Unreal and Real. No! I screamed as a speeding, moss-green station wagon slammed into my graduate advisor, who had been running across the street. Dr. Ramirez's body rolled up onto the hood, his head hitting the windshield with a sickening crack before sliding back down and settling on the asphalt. His arm flopped out to the side, landing in one of the many puddles created by the morning's incessant drizzle. Oh my God, Dr. Ramirez? I sprinted the rest of the way down the paved path, across the sidewalk, and onto the university's main drag. As I knelt beside Dr. Ramirez, I dropped the copy of the Journal of Mediterranean Archaeology I'd been carrying. I'd been intending to show him an article on the discovery of a new Iliad manuscript, but the journal's pages lay askew, dirty, and collecting droplets of rain. My hands hovered over Dr. Ramirez, but I was too afraid of injuring him further to touch him. He was wearing his usual casual professor's garb, medium wash jeans, and a heavy navy blue raincoat, but it hadn't protected him during the collision. The hair on the left side of his head was matted with blood, and his forehead looked slightly misshapen. I'm so sorry, the driver cried as she lurched out of the car, leaving the driver's side door open. I didn't see him. He just ran out. Oh my God, I... I ignored her and the flurry of activity taking place around us, instead reaching for Dr. Ramirez's limp hand which still lay in a puddle. Trembling, I placed two fingers on his wrist to check his pulse, but I felt nothing. You killed him, I said hollowly. The driver looked at me, into me, her eyes filled with horror. Gasping, I jerked upright. My right leg was curled under me, numb, I'd fallen asleep in one of the wooden torture devices that doubled as desk chairs in the anthropology graduate office, and, according to my stiff joints, it hadn't been a wise decision. My beloved monstrosity of a desk, a battered oak roll top that might have been worth something if it wasn't covered with as many dents and dings as carvings, had been an equally foolish place to rest my head. Damn, I thought as I took in the disarray under my elbows. A chaotic jumble of open books, photos, and papers was scattered across the desk's surface, 
some with brand new folds and wrinkles, and one with an unfortunate drool spot. Fabulous, I muttered, wiping away the wet stain with a tissue. Once again, I'd been attempting to decipher the ancient, oh-so-frustrating puzzle that had been driving me nuts all quarter. A combination of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, two parallel vertical lines, one with a flag-like protrusion, the profile of a lion's head, a filled-in half-circle, and a full circle with a smaller circle cut out of the center. That seemed perfectly content to remain undecipherable. Shaking with adrenaline lingering from the awful dream, I sighed, shifted my leg from under me, and lowered my head to rest my cheek on the desk. I stared at the end of my coffee-brown ponytail, unbelievably glad that I'd been asleep and that Dr. Ramirez hadn't been hit by a car. It had been a dream, just a stupid, freakishly realistic dream. Hey, Lex. <laughs> I exclaimed, jumping slightly and causing the invisible pins and needles poking into my reawakening leg to jab with renewed gusto. At seeing the short, excited man standing beside my desk, I shook my head and laughed. It was almost impossible to be irritated at Carson, whose diminutive build, artfully mussed brown hair, and bright blue eyes made him look more like a member of a boy band than a fellow grad student. Seriously, Carson? Was that absolutely necessary? He slapped his hand down on one of the open books, lifting it a few seconds later to reveal a folded hundred-dollar bill. You win, he said grudgingly. I still think my article was far superior, but apparently my opinion doesn't count. He tossed an academic journal onto the desk beside the money. It was open to an article titled, Fact from Myth, Cross-Referencing Texts Across Ancient Cultures to Decipher Unknown Symbols. My article. With a smug smile, I crossed my arms and sat back in my chair. We'd made a bet several months back a Benjamin to whichever of us was published by a major academic journal first. Though we'd both been co-authors or contributors to other people's articles, neither Carson nor I had been published for our individual work. Until now. I'm surprised they didn't take one look at that monstrous title and toss your article into the trash, Carson said. Ouch! You wound me with your pointy words, I exclaimed clutching my chest dramatically. Carson flopped down in a chair beside my desk and let his head fall backward with a groan. It's not fair, Lex, he whined, only amplifying his pubescent image. You're ridiculous, I told him, laughing. I patted his knee, happily noting that my own leg was back to normal. Maybe you'll be in the next one. Doesn't Mediterranean archaeology come out tomorrow? I thought you submitted a few things to them. Remembering my dream, the Journal of Mediterranean Archaeology, discarded on the grimy road, I stifled a shiver. Carson raised his head and stared at me with annoyance. That's the latest issue of Mediterranean Archaeology, he said, pointing to my article. My blood instantly chilled, and this time I couldn't repress a shiver. It was Thursday, and that particular journal was always delivered on Fridays. It's just a coincidence, I told myself, pointing to the open journal I asked. So, other than my amazing article, is there anything else in there worth noting? Carson shrugged. Mostly it's just the usual. Retranslations of this or that text, an update on Pompeii, and the volcanic activity at Mount Vesuvius, an explanation of some new techniques for underwater excavating. Suddenly excited, he leaned forward and rubbed his hands together. And an analysis of a new Iliad manuscript. It's fragmented, but it's also the oldest version ever found. Something in my chest tightened, and my lungs felt too weak to draw in enough air. When I didn't say anything, Carson added, Awesome, right? He specialized in the classics, Homer, Plato, Catullus, practically worshipping the long-dead poets and philosophers. Uh, yeah, 
I snatched my iPhone off the desk and checked the time. Half past 11. In 15 minutes, I was scheduled to meet with Dr. Ramirez in his office downstairs for my final advisory meeting of the quarter. He'd barely been able to squeeze me in between appointments with professors and other students, so there was no reason for him to be crossing the road as he'd been doing in the dream, even if it did pass right by our building. Suddenly, my phone vibrated, and a blue text message alert box appeared in the middle of the screen. The message was from Dr. Ramirez. Running out for coffee. We'll try to be back in time for our meeting. No effing way, I hissed, standing so quickly my chair nearly fell over backward. I grabbed the journal, then shook my head and tossed it back onto the desk before speeding through the maze of desks and cubicles honeycombing the communal graduate office. Lex, where are you going? Carson called after me. Be right back, I said, not even glancing over my shoulder. I raced down the dim, narrow third-floor hallway and shoved the heavy stairwell door open. It slammed against the wall with a loud, metallic thud. In a matter of seconds, I descended the two flights of stairs and exploded into the main hall of the first floor. I bumped into someone, receiving a masculine grunt as we both crashed to the linoleum floor. My knee and elbow hit the floor so hard that bruising was inevitable. I'm so sorry, I exclaimed, extricating myself from beneath the legs of Dr. Ramirez. Oh my god, are you okay? Dr. Ramirez tall, dark, middle-aged, and dignified, stood and made a bit of a show of dusting himself off. He studied me, holding back a smile. I was still sprawled on the floor. I'm going to assume your rush was caused by excitement about the recent publication of your work, he said. Blushing, I stood. I... Yes, I lied. Well, since you're here, Alexandra... Do you want to come with me to get coffee? Dr. Ramirez checked his watch. I don't think I'll have another chance all day. But then he might cross a street. And there might be a moss green station wagon and... No, I blurted, thrusting my hands out in front of me. When his eyebrows rose, I added, I'll go get coffee for us both. I'm sure you have better things to do. Spinning away from him, I jogged to the main doors. From the ache in my knee, I could tell the bruise was going to be a beauty. You just stay here, I said over my shoulder. It wasn't until I was through the glass doors and halfway down the steep, slippery stone steps that I realized I had no clue what kind of coffee Dr. Ramirez liked. I turned around and, when I poked the upper half of my body through the open door, was only half surprised to find my advisor standing exactly where I'd left him his face utterly bemused. I forgot to ask what you wanted, I said, breathlessly. Chuckling, Dr. Ramirez said, just black coffee, large, please. Okay, great, sorry about, you know, I'll be right back. Again, I hurried down the stairs, not caring that it was raining and that I was wearing only a thin sweater, jeans, and slouchy suede boots. I paused when I reached the sidewalk and road that had featured so prominently in my midday nightmare. Looking up the street toward the campus gatehouse, I spotted a single car approaching, but it was too far away to distinguish any details. I squashed my curiosity and changed direction, heading for the coffee stand in Suzalo Library instead of the cafe in the Burke Museum, which was closer, but across the main road. My psyche wouldn't be able to handle passing a moss green station wagon, coincidence or not. My phone buzzed as I was walking back up Denny's steep front steps, one to-go cup of piping hot coffee in each hand. I sat both on the campus newspaper stand, beside the glass doors, and pulled my phone out of my back pocket. Dr. Ramirez had texted me again. Check your email. Intrigued, I opened my inbox and quickly scanned through the newest messages. Three were from students and were utterly predictable. 
Two of my undergrads were asking for extensions on their final papers, and one wondered how much it would affect his grade if he skipped it altogether. Shaking my head, I snorted and muttered, too much. The fourth message also had a University of Washington domain, but it wasn't from anyone I knew. Hello, Miss Larson. I am a visiting professor in the classics department here at UW. I contacted your department head, and he directed me to you. I need an on-site ancient languages specialist at an upcoming excavation in Egypt, preferably someone with a background deciphering unfamiliar symbols. Please let me know if you are interested, and I will send you the specifics. If you agree to participate, you will be abroad during the latter half of spring quarter and most of summer. Please let me know if you have any questions. I hope to hear from you soon. Marcus Bahur, Professor of Classical Archaeology, University of Washington, University of Oxford. I studied the email, rereading it several times. A professor, visiting from Oxford, wanted me, specifically, to accompany him on a dig in Egypt as an ancient languages specialist. I'd worked on a half dozen excavations all around the Mediterranean, but mostly just as a grunt, a field school student. Being a specialist would give me the chance to pursue my own research along with that of Professor Bahur. The opportunity sounded too good to be true. It also sounded too expensive, and there wasn't enough time to apply for grants to cover room, board, and travel expenses. If it cost anything on my end, I'd have to pass. Rushing, I replied, vaguely proclaiming interest and requesting more details. As I typed, I thought, please be free, please be free, please be free. Again, with coffees in hand, I headed back into majestic Denny Hall. Built late in the 19th century, it was the university's first building. Accordingly, the exterior was stunning, a combination of stone and archways and small pane windows that befit a French chateau far more than a university building. But aside from the first-floor professor's offices, the interior was laughably mundane. After squeaking my way down the wide hall, I knocked loudly on the heavy wooden door to Dr. Ramirez's office. Come in, he said, his voice rumbling. As I entered, Dr. Ramirez was placing a book on the top shelf of the built-in bookcase beside his desk. Ah, I see the coffee has arrived, he said, his eyes laughing, though he wore no smile. After taking in my appearance, he asked, Did you take a dip in the fountain on your way? I glanced down at myself, unsurprised to see that my clothes were more than a little damp, clinging to me like plastic wrap to ceramic, which was pretty much how they felt. I forgot my coat, I said lamely. I set the two cups of coffee on his well-organized desk, but didn't sit in either of the wooden visitor's chairs. I didn't want to be rude and drip all over them. Noticing my internal predicament, Dr. Ramirez said, Please, Alexandra, sit. For the thousandth time, I noted how lucky I was to have landed him as my graduate advisor. A sturdy, former college football player, he was like a towering, slightly intimidating father figure to everyone in the archaeology department. He was both stoic and sage, and tended to hand out criticism far more often than praise, but the criticism was always of the constructive variety. I sat in the chair on the right, unable to repress my desire to examine the cluttered bookshelves lining the walls on either side of the office. They were filled with volumes of every color and size. Many of the spines were faded with age, some even flaking, making them stand up next to their younger brethren. Beside books on many of the shelves lay little trinkets and photographs from all over the world. Like always, I felt the overwhelming urge to examine each item, to discover its meaning, origin, and personal value to Dr. Ramirez. 
So, Alexandra, Dr. Ramirez said, interrupting my visual reverie. He'd seated himself in his old-fashioned brown leather executive chair. How do you think this quarter went? Unashamed, I said, really well. Dr. Ramirez smiled. Specifically, what do you think your top achievements were? I crossed my legs, pursed my lips, and thought for a moment. Finally, I said, my dissertation proposal was accepted several weeks ago, as you know. I'm really excited to move forward with it next quarter. My ability to translate hieroglyphic, hieratic, and demotic texts has progressed really well, and I started learning Coptic, too. I wiggled my foot. Um, I won't know for sure until after I've graded their final papers, but I think my undergrads did really well this quarter. I paused, knowing I was forgetting something. Oh, and I was published in a major archaeology journal, I added proudly. Leaning back, Dr. Ramirez intertwined his fingers and rested his hands on his belly. For a moment, he merely studied me, and I tried not to fidget under his pondering gaze. You know I don't usually take on graduate students, but I have to admit, accepting you was a very good decision on my part, he stated giving himself a verbal pat on the back. I half expected him to physically do it, reaching his arm over his shoulder. He didn't. Thank you, I responded, stifling the sudden urge to giggle. I glanced down at my hands. I've spoken with all of your professors. They're all very impressed with your progress and your proposal. I'm really quite excited to see where this project ends up taking you, I'm expecting great things from you, Alexandra. At the moment, all I could do was smile and blush. Dr. Ramirez's overt praise stunned me. Now, unless you have any questions, I believe we're done for the quarter. Grade your students' papers early and make sure you enjoy your break and get some well-deserved rest, he ordered with mock severity. Hearing the dismissal, I stood. I will. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez, I said before heading for the door. Oh, and Alexandra. Pausing with my hand on the doorknob, I looked back at him over my shoulder. I hope the excavation works out. I know you're perfect for the job, he told me, grinning, before turning his attention to some papers on his desk. Thanks, I replied quietly. Have a nice break, Professor. I slipped out of his office gently pulling the door shut behind me. An hour later, I was unlocking my apartment door. I was more than ready to begin winter break, even if it was as low-key as hanging out with my cat in my seventh-floor apartment, grading mind-numbingly boring final papers, and overindulging on pop culture via the television. The only thing to break up the glorious couch time would be a three-day Christmas visit with my family in central Washington. My little brown tabby, Thora, I'd named her after the adored Egyptian goddess, Hathor, greeted me with a soft meow from her perch on her favorite windowsill. The building was nearly 100 years old, and it had the single-pane windows, scuffed hardwood floors, and steam radiators to prove it. It worked out well for Thora. The windows made the cars, buses, and pedestrians who trafficked the street below sound like they were in the apartment, and thus provided her ample entertainment. But it was more of a bummer for me. I liked quiet and sleep. Hey, Thora, are you ready for break? I sang, crossing the cramped living room to scratch under her chin. I earned a loud purr in response and watched her bright green eyes narrow to happy slits. My apartment was pretty standard to a century-old building, the kitchen was tiny, with ceramic tile countertops, a deep porcelain sink, and absolutely no dishwasher. The living room was cramped, with barely enough room for a Sienna microsuede couch, an antique walnut steamer trunk that doubled as a coffee table, a pair of tall, matching bookcases, finished to resemble walnut, and a small, flat-screen television. And beyond the living room, the small bedroom, adjoining bathroom, and closet were equally as spacious, as in 
Not at all. The place was cozy, and I loved it. I dropped my messenger bag on the couch and headed straight for my room to change into comfy, dry clothes. A plain white t-shirt, a zip-up hoodie displaying the name of my favorite band, Johnny Stopwatch, and some black sweatpants that had long since faded to gray. Finally, feeling more like a human than a swamp monster, I sat on the couch, pulled out my thin, steel-gray laptop, tapped the power button, and waited. As the slender machine hummed to life, I stared through the rain-streaked window. I had a view of the university campus, an artful arrangement of graceful brick buildings and emerald green grass and pines. People hurried along crisscrossing paths like ants in an ant farm, eager to get to the next class, if only to be out of the incessant drizzle. Unexpected anticipation fluttered in my stomach as my attention returned to the computer screen. The email window was open. It almost always was. And there was a new message from Professor Bahur. Hesitantly, I opened it and began to read. Ms. Larson. I am excited to hear of your interest in participating in my excavation. Attached, you will find a document containing further details of this project and your potential position. I would like to set up a time to meet so we can solidify your participation. I also want to make sure you know what you are getting into and that you have time to prepare. It will be quite the adventure. Are you available to meet up the Thursday or Friday before the start of the new quarter? Please let me know what time is good for you, and I will rearrange my schedule accordingly. I am looking forward to meeting you, Ms. Larson, as you come very highly recommended. Marcus Bahur, Professor of Classical Archaeology, University of Washington, University of Oxford. For the first time, I wondered what the mysterious visiting professor looked like. His permanent position was at Oxford, so I figured he was British, and his formal language patterns indicated someone older and gentlemanly, possibly with a crazy mustache or overgrown eyebrows. Shaking the frivolous thoughts away, I opened the attachment and scanned it, looking for dollar signs. I found them. Oh, my God. I sat back on the couch, staring at the screen. I could more than afford to participate in the dig. Housing and food would be provided, and along with a stipend for leisure and travel expenses, I'd get paid a sizable commission for my fines. The bigger the discovery, the more money in my pocket. It was, in a word, unbelievable. Without hesitation, I sent a quick reply to Professor Bahur, informing him that I was eager to participate and that I was available to meet with him on either that Thursday or Friday, whenever worked best for him. Despite my curiosity about the professor and his extravagant excavation, I could wait the three weeks. Barely. Just as I clicked send, my phone vibrated. I plucked it out of the little pocket on the side of my bag, and seeing the caller's name, answered. Hi, Mom. Hi, honey, my mom, Alice, replied. Disappointment was heavy in her voice. What's wrong? I asked, instantly concerned. Is Grandma okay? Oh, it's nothing like that. I was hoping to surprise you by showing up at your place tonight, but the darn pass is closed, but I should be able to make it over there by tomorrow afternoon. Oh, well, I didn't know you were coming. That's so sweet, Mom, I said, genuinely excited. It had been more than six months since I'd seen my mom, and I missed her. Besides, I could barely wait to tell her the great news about the excavation. I'm excited to see you. Me too, sweetie. Let's just hope the weather behaves. My fingers are crossed, I said, actually crossing my left index and middle fingers. Will you call me when you leave? Of course she exclaimed, laughing. I want to make sure you have time to clean up all the piles on your floor. I rolled my eyes, avoiding looking at the various mounds of books, clothes, and mail strewn haphazardly around the apartment. Thanks, Mom. That's so thoughtful of you, 
I said dryly. I'm just being your mom, Lex, trying to take care of you, she stated with mock concern. Yeah, yeah, I'll talk to you tomorrow. I paused, then added, and mom? Hmm? I'm glad you're coming. Me too. Bye, sweetie. Bye, mom. I tapped the screen to end the call. After only a few seconds of thought, the phone was back up to my ear. In the middle of the third ring, I was greeted by the voice of Kara, a young, prosperous businesswoman, and one of my best friends. Hey, Lex. So, I just found out something amazing, I said, leading her with my excitement. What? Guess, I ordered. Um, you're a princess? I laughed out loud. Definitely not. Didn't think so. You won a Caribbean cruise? Nope. You dropped out of grad school and decided to pursue life as a nun. I choked on nothing. You've got to be kidding me. That's ridiculous. All right, I give up. She sighed, and I could hear a smile in her voice. After listening to me tell her about the two emails from Professor Bahur, and that I would almost certainly be working as one of the leaders of an excavation in Egypt, my dream, Kara squealed, very, very loudly. Unfortunately, I pulled the phone away too late, and my ear rang from her high pitch and volume. Even Thora stirred from her study of the pedestrians far below to glare at the phone. With obvious urgency, Kara blurted, This calls for immediate emergency celebrating. I'll call Annie right now, okay? We'll be over in a couple of hours for dinner before we go out. Um, I don't really have anything to make. No problem, Annie and I will stop by the store on our way. We'll surprise you, she said, her words bursting with enthusiasm. Sounds good, I replied. Great, see you soon. She hung up before I could say goodbye. Glancing at my laptop screen, I noticed there was a new message in the inbox. It was from the professor. I couldn't believe how quickly he'd replied. Ms. Larson, very well. How about Friday at 3.30 in the afternoon at the cafe in the Burke Museum? Please let me know if either the time or location is unsuitable to you. Until then, Marcus Bahur, Professor of Classical Archaeology, University of Washington. University of Oxford. If nothing else, Thora, this should be interesting, I muttered, reaching over the arm of the couch to rub the top of the tabby's head. I'd been waiting at the bar, shoulder to shoulder with dozens of other patrons, for about ten minutes. Finally, a harried bartender finished making the three drinks I'd ordered, all vodka cranberries, and set them on the bar. I paid in cash and reached for the drinks just as the woman on my right lurched against me. In my attempt to grab the bar for support, I knocked two of the glasses over, and bright red liquid splashed directly onto the man beside me. Oh, he exclaimed, leaning away too late. Oh, no! I stared at the blaring crimson stain marring the lower half of his formerly pristine pale gray shirt. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. I trailed off, losing all sense of coherency when I glanced up. Eyes the color of Baltic amber held my gaze, too vibrant and rich to be considered brown. I couldn't help but wonder if they were an artifice. Strong, straight, and defined, his bronze features were equally as striking especially when paired with a hint of dark-as-night hair covering his shaved head. He was absolutely stunning. As he watched me, frustration seemed to blanket his face. It's not a problem, he assured me in a deep, smooth-as-milk chocolate voice. It was slightly accented, sounding Middle Eastern with a sprinkling of French and maybe a touch of German or Swedish. But but, was all I could say. The corners of the stranger's mouth turned down in a partial frown, and he shook his head. Really, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Are, are you sure? I asked quietly, incapable of breaking eye contact, but 
desperately needing to, I blamed my awkwardness on the wine I'd consumed during dinner. He's just a guy in a bar, I told myself. Get a grip. Yes, perfectly, he assured me again. I believe your friends are waiting for you, if those. He smirked as his eyes flicked to the table where Kara and my other best friend, Annie, were sitting. Are your friends. Following his eyes, I found Annie and Kara watching us in awe. Their wide-eyed expressions mirrored mine perfectly. Um, yeah, those are my friends, I admitted, and then I remembered that they had been two-thirds of the reason I'd been at the bar. Damn, they're drinks. Now I'll have to wait for another ten minutes, I muttered. Within seconds, the enthralling stranger had snagged a bartender and ordered replacements for my spilled beverages. I'll help you carry them, to make sure they actually make it to their destination this time, he teased. I didn't know how to reply to that, and he didn't wait, so I just followed him to the table, where Kara, a blue-eyed Goldilocks, and Annie, a half-Japanese beauty, sat and stared. They gaped at my new acquaintance as he set the drinks on the table, I hope you ladies have a nice night, he said, flashing us a tight-lipped smile. He met my eyes one last time, then turned and walked away. Whoa, Kara nearly shouted. Uh, yeah, Annie added. I know, I agreed, wishing the gorgeous stranger had joined us. I searched the crowd for him, but he'd already disappeared. Chapter 2. Mom and Dad I sat down beside my mom, curling my legs under me and relaxing into the couch with a satisfied sigh. My belly was full of the most delicious takeout Thai food the university district had to offer. My mom was with me, and nearly as excited about the upcoming excavation as I was, and I had nothing but free time for weeks to come. Damn, life is good. Sweetie, my mom began in a voice that instantly told me something was wrong. I came out here for a reason, not just to surprise you. She took a deep breath, either to calm her nerves or strengthen her resolve. Your dad and I were talking the other night, and we decided that, well, Lex, haven't you ever wondered why you don't really look like your dad? She asked gazing intently at the empty wine glass in her hand, sickly yellow light from the kitchen reflected off its convex, crystalline surface. What's that supposed to mean? Tons of people don't look much like their parents. Why would she ask me that? Unless she can't mean that dad's not my... My mom had asked me a question, but her words, I couldn't figure out what they meant. Deciphering the true hidden meaning behind words was what I was best at, but I couldn't decipher these words. They implied that there was something I should have noticed before, something that should have been obvious. But she can't mean that Dad's not my... not my... Suddenly, I was more aware of the bite-sized living room than ever before. The bookcases set against the opposite wall, were in serious need of dusting. And I had the urge to reorganize the hefty collection of historical fiction and romance books packed onto the shelves. The framed prints on the wall between the bookcases captivated me more than ever before. Dolly's persistence of memory stood out beyond all others. I felt a strange kinship with the melting pocket watches, like I, too, was losing form. On my right hand, my grandpa's ring became hypnotizing. Grandma Sue's, his widow, gave it to me on my 16th birthday, and I'd had the wide silver band resized to fit my slender ring finger. Its inky obsidian stone seemed to suck in the light rather than reflect it back to the waiting world. Was my greedy ring sucking in all of the air, too? I couldn't seem to draw a full breath. Haven't you ever wondered why you don't really look like your dad? 
It was true. I didn't really resemble my dad. Had I noticed before? I looked so much like my mom that I'd figured I'd inherited less obvious characteristics from my dad. His laugh, the way he walked, his single-minded determination. But now, I realized those characteristics were undefinable as well. Truth stared me in the face, forcing me to see. She really means that dad's not my real dad. But why tell me now? How did this happen? Possibilities, vile and corrosive, swirled around in my mind. Had my parents separated and been with other people before I was born? Had my mom had an affair? Had I been adopted? The last, I knew without a doubt, was wrong. Other than differences in coloring, I was practically a physical clone of my mom. But an affair or separation was still a possibility. Is my happy family a lie? Carefully, I reached for my wine glass with a trembling hand, hoping to numb myself with its contents. As my fingers touched the smooth stem, fear cleared my thoughts. Fear and unexpected anger. If I was someone else's daughter because my mom cheated on my dad, what do you mean exactly? I asked, voice sharp and eyes narrowed. It felt like eons had passed since my mom initially asked the question, but my chaotic thought process had borne conclusions in less than a minute. Hesitantly, my mom raised her warm brown eyes to search mine, and then she shifted them to focus on the wall behind the couch. Grandma Betsy had a really hard time having kids. She was given certain drugs. At the time, doctors were giving specific hormones to women who were at risk of miscarrying. Betsy, well, she was one of the women treated that way. So, I prompted, impatient. Suddenly, my mom was looking at me, weariness in her eyes. She sighed. The treatment had an unforeseen side effect on the children. They were sterile, Lex. Your dad couldn't have children. Dad couldn't have kids? That meant mom never had an affair. They never separated. Relief flooded my body. It began in my lungs as I involuntarily inhaled a delicious breath of air, and it flowed out toward my nerve endings. Mom and dad were never separated. My family is real. I was ecstatic. My mom furrowed her brow. Abruptly, relief fled from my body. If dad couldn't have kids, then who's my father? This can't be happening. We went to the best place where the donors were all guaranteed to be intelligent, talented men with a healthy family history. But none of those intelligent, talented men were Joe Larson, my dad, or rather the man I believed to be my dad until two minutes ago. Despite my best efforts to hold it together, my chin began to tremble. The quivering spread to my cheeks and then throughout my entire body. But I didn't cry. I was too stunned to cry. Watching my devastation, my mom said, Maybe I shouldn't have told you, but your dad thought... Again, she sighed. I pulled my legs up to my chest and fit my head between my knees. My mom tried to comfort me by rubbing my back, but I flinched at her touch. I stared down at the hardwood floor, trying to focus, trying to breathe. Me, the very essence of my being, retreated inside seeking the only haven available. Solitude. The thump. The thump. The thump. I focused on my heartbeat. It was still the same. It hadn't changed in the last few minutes, unlike everything else I knew about myself, or thought I'd known. I'm still me. Right? Chapter 3. Nightmares and Dreams 
Are you sure you... Let's just go already, Mom, I interrupted. I knew I was being a brat in the worst way. My mom felt awful for lying to me about my parentage for 24 years, and I was taking out my inner turmoil on her. But she'd lied to me. So had my dad. And it wasn't just a little, I broke your favorite vase and told you it was the cat lie. Oh, no. It was a whopper of a lie, requiring me to do a complete identity overhaul. I couldn't just pretend that everything was hunky-dory. I'd never been a good liar. Searching for a safe place in my mind, I focused on the beads of rain clinging to the passenger window of my mom's dark red sedan. As the car picked up speed, the droplets seemed reluctant to stream across the glass, moving in a stuttering rhythm. Part of me worried about leaving Thora alone so abruptly, but I knew Annie would take good care of her. I'd sent her a text in the wee hours of the morning, asking her to cat sit for the next three weeks, and she'd agreed immediately. She hadn't asked a single question. Annie had the kind heart of a saint, and I loved her for it. As I felt myself falling asleep, a small sense of relief washed over me. Haven't you ever wondered why you don't really look like your dad? My mom asked, her voice echoing all around me. I was standing in front of a wood-framed mirror, hung at eye level, on a seemingly endless wall. A picture of my dad's face was pinned to the mirror's frame. I examined his features closely, and then did the same with my own, attempting to reconcile their many differences. Maybe his lips, I thought. Those could look a little like mine. But after cross-referencing the reflection of my own narrow, rosy mouth with his, I realized they weren't a match. Horrified, I stared at the photo of my dad, watching his mouth disappear completely. When I tried to scream, there was only silence. I looked into the mirror, and with gut-wrenching terror, realized that my own mouth had vanished as well. My ears were next, as were my dad's in his picture, and then my long, dark brown hair. I brought my hands up to my face, attempting to hold the remaining features in place. As my nose vanished, so did my ability to breathe. I panicked, trying to suck air through a smooth expanse of unbroken skin. I watched my frantic brown eyes until the lack of oxygen caused dark spots to wash over my vision. I glanced one last time at the picture of my dad, before my world faded to black. All I could think was, I am nothing. I woke with my head resting against the chilly car window. Involuntarily, I brought my hand up to feel my face. Everything was right where it belonged, including the salty tears streaming down my cheeks. Glancing out the window, I realized the rain had turned to light snow and we were nearing my hometown. Yakima, the central Washington city where I'd grown up, was really quite demonstrative in terms of the stereotypical seasons. There are four distinct times of the year. Sweat-inducing summers, reddish gold falls, snowy winters, and flowery springs. I was always amazed by the way the fruit trees in the countless orchards accentuated the seasons. Nothing screamed winter like bare branches, sheathed in ice, or heralded spring like apple and cherry blossoms. As the familiar, mostly barren landscape of the high desert glided past, I wondered if coming home and seeing my dad was going to make the realignment of my identity any easier, or would it become infinitely more difficult? Silently, each unique, beautiful snowflake found a home on the deck around me. In the back of my mind, I felt envious of the moonlit flakes. Each was well-defined and individual. I, on the other hand, was vague, undefined. They didn't have to worry about where they might fit in, let alone where they came from. They would just land. Where am I supposed to land? I'd been home for two weeks, and so far, the frigid, Yakima winter had proven to be the only thing that could bring me peace. 
the falling snow offered a distraction from my morose thoughts, and because it rarely snowed in Seattle, sitting outside in below freezing weather didn't belie my sanity too much. It was snowing, after all. At a knock on the sliding glass door, I jumped. I heard it open partially. Lex? It was my mom. Yeah. Kara's on the phone, sweetie. She said she tried your cell, but it went straight to voicemail. She sounds really worried. You should talk to her. My mom had always been a master guilt tripper. I took a deep breath, closed my eyes, and surrendered. Fine. I could only avoid talking to people for so long. And if I was being honest with myself, even I was getting sick of the moping, sullen woman I'd become. I needed to rejoin the world, bask in the sunshine, seize the day, and, you know, all that bullshit. As I entered the house, my mom handed me the phone with a sympathetic smile. I wandered upstairs to my old bedroom and shut the door, sitting cross-legged on the burgundy duvet. I focused on taking long, deep breaths, then closed my eyes and raised the phone to my ear. Hey, Kara, I said in a reluctant, slightly hoarse voice, not speaking for days tended to do that to a voice. Oh my god, Lex, it's so good to hear your voice, she said enthusiastically. So, are you going to let me know what the hell's going on? Why'd you just take off? I mean, weren't you planning on staying in the yak with your fam for only a few days during Christmas? How much family time can you really stand? Aren't things still bad with your sister? I really didn't want to lie to Kara, at least not outright. After searching for the courage to respond to her barrage of questions, I spoke carefully. Uh, yeah. I was planning on only being here for a few days. True. But when my mom was about to leave, I suddenly felt like I needed more time with her. Also true. So, on a whim, I just sort of decided to ride back to Yakima with her and stay until after Christmas true-ish. Success. But I couldn't ignore the sick feeling churning in my stomach. So, you're not, like, dying or anything, she joked. Nope, not that I'm aware of. I guess I've just been really distracted here. It's been a long time since I've been home. The partial truth was coming more easily. Don't worry, darling. I'll see you when you get back, Kara said. And I smiled sorrowfully at her usual term of endearment. Definitely, I replied. Love you, Lex. Don't be a phone stranger. I mean, you can only expect me to survive for so long with Lex deprivation. <laughs> Surprising myself, I laughed. Got it. Love you too. After goodbyes were said and the call was disconnected, I stood and stretched. Still clad in my winter deck wear, I was extremely overheated and a little sweaty. I tore off my mittens, unzipped, and removed my navy blue down jacket and slid my feet out of my waterproof, fur-lined boots. I traded my jeans for some purple and blue plaid pajama bottoms before curling up on a bed that had always been mine, in a room that had always been mine, with the odd sense that neither belonged to me anymore. That Lex no longer existed. Unsure of how I'd fallen asleep so early in the evening, I awoke. Night had fallen completely, darkening the room. My first thought was of being cold, so I quickly maneuvered myself under the covers. My second thought was one of relief. For the first time in two weeks, I had slept without having the nightmare. My third thought was about the strangely vivid dream I'd just awoken from. It had taken place in my parents' house, and it could easily have been real, except that the dream switched back and forth between two time periods. The more I thought about it, the clearer my memory of it became. Standing in the doorway between the kitchen and dining room, I saw my mom sitting at her brand new oak dining room table her hands clasped together on the surface. My dad was sitting across from her. 
Shaking her head, she said, I just think it's too late. We've gone such a long time with this secret. It just seems easier to keep it. But Alice, don't you see? The girls have a right to know who they are, where they come from. My dad reached across the table and covered her hands with his. It's just not fair to keep hiding it from them. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Suddenly, the scene shifted. I was still in the dining room, but the table was our old, battered one. My mom and dad, who seemed to have lost a couple decades, still sat in relatively the same places. I just don't know, Joe, my mom said, shaking her head. I think we should wait until they're old enough to understand why we had to do it. My dad sighed. I wish we wouldn't ever need to have this conversation with our little girls. I just... Okay, I guess a couple more years couldn't hurt, but we will tell them eventually, Alice. Closing her eyes, my mom nodded. In the blink of an eye, the scene shifted back to my mom and dad sitting at the new table, his hands covering hers. All right, Joe. This weekend... I guess I'll visit Lex and tell her. If she doesn't take it well, I'll just bring her back with me. But if it's too hard for her, then we're not telling Jenny. She's just not as, well, as strong. When my mom glanced up at my dad, her eyes were as fierce as those of a lioness. My dad scooted his chair back, stood, and walked around the table to her. As I followed him with my eyes, I noticed a flicker of movement just beyond the wide arched doorway leading into the living room. Lying in bed, I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd really been present during my parents' conversations. A sense that a dream was more real than, well, just a dream was something I'd experienced before, but it had only happened when I'd awakened from a dream that was really a memory. Once, when I was a freshman in high school, I forgot my locker combination. It happened near the beginning of the school year, but I'd already stashed a couple of books inside. After sharing a friend's locker for more than half the year, I had a sudden need to get into mine. The library was going to send a bill home for the books I'd lost in my locker, and I really didn't want to pay the fee to reset the combo. The day before the library fine was due, I went home resolved to pay the reset fee the following morning. That night, I had a vivid dream. In it, I was sitting on my bed after the first day of school going through my backpack. In my hand was the card displaying the elusive combination to my locker. When I woke from that dream, I hastily jotted down the locker combination, absolutely positive of its accuracy. Later that morning, I opened my locker for the first time in months, saving myself a hearty sum of money. That dream had felt the same as the one I just had, absolutely real. But so had the dream of Dr. Ramirez getting hit by a car, and that never actually happened. I couldn't possibly have remembered the conversations between my parents in my dream because I hadn't been there. It's nothing, I told myself. I'm just being obsessive. For the second time in two weeks, I laughed out loud. If I mentioned anything about my crazy dreams to my mom, all of her worried looks and concern over my mental stability would quickly give way to a leather couch in a psychiatrist's office. No thank you. Regardless, I couldn't ask my mom or dad if they'd had any conversations like the ones in my dream. For their sake, I was pretty sure I'd been making the past few weeks fairly hellish on them and I wasn't about to make it worse. I eventually chalked up the dream to my overreactive obsession with understanding who I was, where I came from, who my father was. Gradually, like a dimmer switch lighting up my thoughts, I knew where I could get more information. From Grandma Sue's. My indecisive mom discussed nearly everything with her mother. Tomorrow. I told myself, I'll drive over to Grandma Suze's house and hopefully get some much needed answers.
Chapter 4 Answers and Questions When I cracked my eyes open, the glowing green numbers on the clock on the nightstand read 743. For the first time since I'd been home, my cheeks and pillow were dry of tears, and even with the odd dream earlier in the night, it had been the best night of sleep I'd had in weeks. Groaning, I stretched languorously and tossed the covers to the foot of the bed. I pulled on a sweatshirt and some socks, arranged my hair in a loose ponytail, and padded downstairs to the kitchen. The coffee maker was my first stop. My delightfully over-prepared mom had already loaded the filter with fresh grounds and the machine with water, so I just had to push the start button and wait. My favorite mug, covered in cheesy, cartoony Egyptian images, was already set out on the counter beside two other, far more grown-up mugs. Catching my reflection in the window above the sink, I raised my eyebrows. I'd been smiling. For no apparent reason. Maybe I really am still me, I thought with wonder. To distract myself from too much pre-coffee psychological analysis, I decided to make a big fancy breakfast for my parents. I still had about a half hour before they came downstairs for their oddly rigid morning routine. Plenty of time to make a Christmas Eve breakfast feast. After filling my mug with coffee, a splash of milk, and a spoon of sugar, I gathered some necessary ingredients on the counter. I was going to whip up a scrumptious batch of French toast. As I cooked, the sound of footsteps on the stairs forewarned me of my mom's arrival. I turned from the stove to see her watching me from the doorway, smiling. Smells great, Lex, she said cautiously. What brought this on? Translation, why are you acting normal? Oh, I don't know. Consider it a thanks for putting up with me breakfast, I replied, returning my attention to the bacon popping and crackling in a large frying pan. Just as my dad entered the kitchen, I set a platter of food on the table. Joe Larson was a big man, a little over six feet tall and thicker around the middle than was probably healthy. His face had gained wrinkles and a certain middle-aged plumpness, but his crinkled eyes and easy smile still bespoke his gentle, friendly nature. His light brown hair was damp from his morning shower and his face was freshly shaven. I smiled, thinking his morning routine hadn't changed over the years. Although he'd probably been attempting something resembling stealth, I caught the questioning look he aimed at my mom, as well as her answering grin. By the time I sat down across from him, my dad's expression had changed to a self-satisfied smile that glowed with a silent, I told you so. I refused to focus on the fact that, in the dream, he had expressed confidence in my ability to handle the information about my paternity. It's not real. The thought was closely followed by another. I need to talk to Grandma. Mom, I asked, drizzling syrup over my French toast. She was chewing, so she only looked at me and mumbled, Mm? -hmm. Well, I know how you have a lot of cooking and whatnot to do today, so... I was thinking I might do something to make it a little easier for you, I said, my eyes wide in an attempt to look innocent. You want to help me cook? Forcing a smile, I replied, Um, I'd love to when I get back. I was actually thinking I could go pick up Grandma for you. That way you guys won't have to leave at all. You won't have to drive in the snow. My mom frowned slightly. I don't know, Lex. You aren't on the insurance for our cars anymore. What if... Seeing my eager expression falter, my dad stepped in on a fatherly rescue mission. Come on, Alice, he said. It's not really that far, and Lex hasn't seen Grandma Susan in a while. Let her go. I'll help you cook while she's gone, if you want. I gave my dad a huge, grateful grin before glancing at my mom, eyebrows raised in hope. She blew out a breath. Okay, but you have to promise to be careful. Of course, Mom. 
Attempting to not appear in too much of a hurry, I excitedly told my dad everything I knew about the excavation, which wasn't very much, and the supervisory role I'd be playing. My mom had already heard it all back in Seattle, but she didn't seem to mind. Eventually, I finished my breakfast and offered to help with the dishes. After all, I'd created most of them. Don't worry about it, my dad told me. Why don't you just go get ready and then head over to Grandma Suze's? Surprised, but not wanting to waste my escape route, I rushed out of the kitchen to prepare for the day. I got ready in record time. Sitting in my mom's parked, ruby-red sedan, I stared out the windshield at my grandma's home. A true product of its time. The house was all bricks, winter barren ivy, white trim and huge windows with a large arched porch that led to the front door. Its street was filled with other brick tutors that looked just like it, and yet were completely different at the same time, all remnants of the early 1900s. After a few contemplative moments, I abandoned the warmth of the car and crunched across the de-iced driveway and pathway that spanned the front yard. I walked through Grandma Suze's unlocked front door, shut it loudly to let her know someone was there, and hung my coat and mittens on the antique coat rack set off to one side in the narrow entryway. The house wasn't small. It held enough bedrooms that each of Grandma Suze's three children had grown up with their own room. But it had been built before the bigger is always better ideal truly took over. Throughout the house, the floor was a dark hardwood, and the rooms were smaller, the hallways narrower, and the doors just a little bit shorter than those in a modern home. Making my way down the hallway toward the family room, I could hear the quiet chatter of the TV. Hi, Grandma, I chirped, poking my head around the doorway into the cozy room. Susan Ivanov, otherwise known as Grandma Suze, was lounging in her favorite blue suede armchair with a fuzzy yellow blanket draped over her legs. Her hair was perfectly arranged in a gray halo, and her sparkly red and green sweater screamed, Christmas! Lex? she asked, evidently surprised that I wasn't my mom, who she'd expected to pick her up. Before she could stand, I rushed over to hug her. Tiny bells jingled on her sleeves as she wrapped her arms that were more frail than I remembered around me. Well, this is a surprise. What are you doing here, honey? Not that I mind. Her bright hazel eyes stayed locked on me as I flopped into an oversized brown leather chair a few feet from hers. It had been my late grandpa's chair and was by far my favorite place to lounge in the entire house. I convinced Mom to let me pick you up. She had so much stuff to do, and I haven't seen you in, I don't know, a year. So I thought, you know, I shrugged. Grandma Suze watched me as I spoke, her eyes keen. Oh, and how are you, honey? Your mom said she told you about your dad. Said you've been having a tough time. Sweetheart, is there anything I can do? she asked, radiating grandmotherly warmth. I hesitated, a little surprised at her directness. I don't know, Grandma. I guess... I just wish there was a way for me to know who my real father is. Honey, Joe Larson will always be your real father. Whether or not you share his genes, he's still a part of who you are. Nothing will change that she said, her eyes glittering with moisture. I clenched my jaw as the crushing weight of a handful of emotions momentarily overwhelmed me. In my heart, I knew Grandma Suze was right. My dad really was my dad. He'd always been there to pick me up when I fell, and he'd fostered my love of both history and reading. He'd helped shape me into the person I'd become, in every way that mattered, he was my dad. But I still didn't feel the same assuredness in my own identity. I didn't feel like I was still his little girl. Still me. 
part of me was lost, and I didn't know where or how to find it again. I sighed. You know what I mean. I'm not trying to replace Dad. I just want to know who my biological father is because, you know, what if some freaky disease runs in his family and I don't know to watch out for it? I'd voiced a reason, but not the reason for my curiosity. What I really wanted to know was what kind of a person he was. I wanted to know if I was like him, even the tiniest bit. I wanted to know something, anything. Well, sweetheart, I don't know who he is. The clinic your parents used was very careful about keeping that information confidential. She suddenly looked frustrated. They said it was to protect the donor. An idea formed in my head. What if the information was confidential then, but isn't anymore? I don't suppose you know the name of the clinic, do you? I asked. She paused before answering. Maybe. Will you please tell me, Grandma? Please? Nothing has ever been so important to me, I pleaded, desperate. Grandma Suze held my eyes for a moment, wariness adding new creases to her wrinkled face. It was in Seattle, she finally said, but I don't know if it's still there. If I remember right, which really would be amazing, it was called Emerald City Fertility. I let out the breath I'd been holding. Thank you so, so much, Grandma. Emerald City Fertility, I repeated silently. I quickly made a note in my iPhone. With my history of random acts of forgetfulness, not writing it down somewhere was far too risky. Do your parents know you're looking into this? Grandma Suze asked, her eyes sharp behind her thick, rosy-rimmed glasses. The question took me by surprise. In my haste to dig up answers, I hadn't considered the possibility that Grandma Suze might tell my parents about my sleuthing. I bit my bottom lip as my stomach grumbled. I didn't think so, Grandma Suze said with a frown. Well, maybe it's best if we just keep this between you, me, and the lamppost for now, dear. She rose and shuffled across the several feet separating us to pat my knee, then said, let me go finish getting my things together and we can be on our way. I'll be quick as a bunny. Take your time, Grandma, I said, grateful she would keep my inquisitive secret, at least for a little while. Suddenly exhausted, I rested my head against the back of the cushy leather chair. Years ago, when Grandma Suze's mobility had dwindled to the point that going up and down the stairs was akin to playing Russian roulette, my mom and I had moved her into the single downstairs bedroom. Currently, I could hear my grandma's soft voice as she puttered around in her room, but I couldn't keep my eyes open long enough to register her words. My grandma was sitting on the left arm of the same chair where I'd fallen asleep. She looked younger than I'd ever seen her. A very handsome man sat in the chair, his hand resting on Grandma Suze's lower back. With his dirty blonde hair and strong, chiseled features, he was easily recognizable from photographs. My grandpa. On the couch opposite my grandparents sat my mom and dad, holding hands. Judging by my mom's hairstyle, I figured she was around 25 years old, before she had kids, before she had me. From my position in the doorway between the family room and the hallway to the front door, I observed their conversation, watching, listening. Everything about the room was wrong. Where are all the knickknacks? And the pictures on the walls didn't belong in my grandma's house. They were supposed to be at my parents' house. In fact, the painting hanging on the wall above my grandparents' heads of a dusky sunlit forest was currently in my old bedroom. An unfamiliar male voice 
interrupted my confused examination of the room. Strong and clear, it was faintly accented with Italian. It belonged to my grandpa. I asked around, he said. I think I found a good place for you kids to go. The doctor is very reliable. I know another family he helped. At hearing his voice, my confusion tripled. I'd never heard anything about him being from Italy, and I never would have guessed, based on his appearance, he was so fair. In fact, I was pretty sure my mom had told me his ancestors fought in the American Revolution. We're ready to try anything, Dad, my mom said, and beside her, my dad nodded. So where's this place? It's called Emerald City Fertility in Seattle. It's run by uh, Dr. James Lee. He is one of the best in his field. Do you know if they're accepting new patients? My dad asked. My grandpa glanced down sheepishly before meeting my parents' eyes. Well, uh, yes. In fact, I may have already set up an appointment for you. He rushed his next words. I know you were planning on spending the afternoon here, but I thought you'd want to meet the doctor as soon as possible. They're expecting you in about four hours, so... Oh, um, thanks, <laughs> my mom said, giggling nervously. I guess we should hit the road. My parents quickly said their goodbyes and departed, slamming the front door in their excitement. After they were gone, Grandma Sue's twisted on the arm of the chair to gaze down at my grandpa. Are you sure this is safe, Alex? She asked, more than a hint of anxiety straining her voice. You know what could happen if he... She trailed off, pressing her lips into a thin line. I've seen all of the possibilities, Suze. He won't interfere in this generation. The child will be fine. It will be normal, he assured her. What the hell does any of that mean? This generation? Interfere? He who? Normal? He's right, Susan, a man said from the living room's other doorway, the one leading to the dining room. We've kept the two lines separate for more than 4,000 years. Nothing he's tried has worked so far. And that's not going to change in the next 25 years. The prophecy will be invalidated, and all will be right. My confusion increased with every additional word. What does he mean by prophecy? And there's that he again. I abruptly realized there was something familiar about the hidden man's voice. Slowly, I crossed the room toward it toward him, but something stopped me, someone. Long, golden-brown fingers were gripping my shoulder. I turned my head and started to raise my eyes. I awoke to Grandma Sue's shaking me by the shoulder. With a rush, realization dawned on me. The dream i just had felt the same as the one the previous night, and the one with Dr. Ramirez. It felt too real, too much like a memory. Oh my god, I'm losing it, I thought. I made us a snack before we hit the road, Grandma Sue said, setting a plate of food on the wide chair arm. Eyeing a delicious-looking sandwich piled high with sliced turkey, cheddar, lettuce, and tomatoes, I said, Oh, Grandma, you didn't have to do that. It's only 15 minutes back to Mom and Dad's, and... I would have helped if... Nonsense, dear, you looked so peaceful. I wanted to let you rest for a while longer, she said, as she carried a second plate to her usual chair. Thanks, Grandma. I took a bite and savored the flavors that only she could coax into something as generic as a turkey and cheese sandwich. I was pretty sure it was the combination of toasted bread and real mayonnaise, but my sandwiches never tasted as good, even when I did my best to mimic her methods. Yum, I mumbled as I swallowed. So, Mom told me the painting in my room, the one of the forest, used to be here, I lied. 
Where was it? Chewing, Grandma Suze pointed to the exact location where I'd seen the painting in my dream, on the wall behind the chair I was sitting in. My blood seemed to transform into liquid nitrogen, giving me chills as it circulated throughout my body. How'd I know that? Dream that? It was one hell of an odd coincidence. In archaeology, all claims must be substantiated by hard evidence, usually in the form of artifacts, ruins, or historical texts. The methodology was ingrained in my bones. I needed to dig deeper, to find more evidence so I could know what was going on. Was I losing my mind? I just needed to know. Thinking of another relatively safe piece of information from the dream, the doctor's name, I asked. So, this Dr. Lee, did you ever meet him? I was surprised that my voice didn't tremble as I spoke. Grandma Suze nodded, watching me while she finished her bite. Yes, honey, I went with your mom to a few of her appointments. He was a very competent doctor. He was a little young, but... As she trailed off, her thoughtful smile disappeared, and worry temporarily shadowed her face. But she quickly masked her features with a pleasant, placid expression. I took another bite, feigning obliviousness. How did I know the doctor's name? The painting's location could have been a coincidence, but the doctor's name? It just didn't seem possible. What the hell is going on? My heart was pounding so hard that I feared my grandma would be able to hear it. I finished my sandwich, playing at normalcy, though I'd lost my appetite somewhere between maybe I'm losing it and I'm definitely losing it. After minutes passed with only the low sounds of a tennis match intruding on our silence, I picked up Grandma Suze's empty plate. I'll take care of the dishes. Then we can head over to Mom and Dad's. I know Mom would love some help in the kitchen. Sounds good, sweetheart. Grandma Suze smiled, but it didn't reach her eyes. When I rinsed our plates in the kitchen sink, I thought about my grandma's reaction to my knowing Dr. Lee's name. She'd been worried. Or afraid. Why? Because I'm clearly acting like a crazy person, I told myself. I think the dishes are rinsed, Grandma Suze said from behind me, her voice gentle. Startled, I laughed before turning off the water and gathering my things to leave. I slipped my hands into my mittens as I followed my grandma to the front door, sparing a glance back up the hallway. My mind was filled with questions. Who was the hidden man in my dream? Who grabbed my shoulder? What had my grandparents been talking about after my parents left? And most importantly, why are my dreams becoming so real? A single word kept replaying in my mind. Impossible. Chapter 5 Sisters and Friends It was a short, pleasant drive from Grandma Suze's to my parents' house. In less than 15 minutes, I learned everything that had happened to my aunts, uncles, and cousins over the past year. Grandma Suze had always been a font of knowledge when it came to matters of the family. As I pulled into the slick driveway of my family's firmly middle-class home, I stopped beside my sister's sky-blue hybrid. Evidently, Jenny had arrived while I was out, and had parked directly in front of the garage door I needed. Irritated, I rolled my eyes and inched my mom's car as close to the garage as possible. Sorry, Grandma. Looks like we're going to have to walk on the ice for a few feet, I said, as I pushed the little gray button on the garage door opener. When my frail, elderly grandma opened the passenger side door, I quickly added, Wait a second, and I'll come help you, okay? All right, dear. She agreed, sitting back in her seat. I rushed around the front bumper and gripped her arm to steady her as she emerged from the car. Slowly, 
we traversed the ice to the safety of the garage floor. My mom greeted us from the glowing doorway leading into the house. You didn't slip at all, did you, Mom? She asked, concerned. No, no, Alice. Lex and I skated our way to the garage quite gracefully. She caught my eye, and I spotted hints of a suppressed smile glittering behind her glasses. I grinned. Yeah, Mom. I think we earned a 9.5 for balance and a 10 for expert spins. You too, my mom said, throwing her hands up. You act more like sisters than Lex and Jenny do. We look like sisters too. I only have a few more wrinkles than Lex, Grandma Suze claimed. My mom rolled her eyes expertly. Please, mom, don't kid yourself. Oh, that's my Alice. Such a sweet girl, Grandma Suze responded, reaching up to pat my mom's cheek as she ascended the three wooden stairs to the doorway. With an exasperated smile, my mom held the door open so we could enter the warm laundry room. Grandma Suze was through the doorway leading into the living room before me, issuing cheerful greetings to my dad and sister. From the sound of the television, they were watching A Christmas Story for the 8,000th time. Grandma! Jenny practically screamed as she bounced off the couch and flew toward us. She slowed in time to give Grandma Suze a gentle hug and lead her to the cushy recliner next to the couch. Nice to see you too, Jay, I muttered in the back of my mind. I was thinking about what I'd recently learned regarding my paternity. I couldn't help but wonder if we even shared the same biological father. It was a legitimate question. Considering the many differences between Jenny and me, she was creative where I was logical. She was sincere where I was sarcastic. And she seemed to spend half of her life sick with the flu, strep throat, or chronic allergies, while I couldn't remember having more than a hint of sniffles. Good to see you, Suze, my dad said. Would you like something to drink? He raised his dark brown beer bottle. It appeared to be some sort of winter ale that no doubt resembled motor oil. Grandma Suze smiled. Yes, thank you, Joe. I'd love some tea. Oh, I, um, don't really know, he stuttered. Don't worry, Dad. I'll take care of it, I said, chuckling. He laughed and shook his head. Thanks, Laylee. Laylee. The old nickname nearly brought tears to my eyes, and Grandma Suze's earlier words replayed in my head. Joe Larson will always be your real father. No matter what, I would always be his little girl, his Laylee. Close to tears, the happy variety for once, I joined my mom in the kitchen. Her face was etched with worry when she looked up from the ham she was doctoring. We need to talk, Lex. Freezing in the middle of the kitchen, I eyed her warily. I wasn't ready for any more enormous family revelations. Not yet. Oh, don't worry, sweetie, it's nothing like that, she said, placing the ham in a roasting pan. It's your sister. I just... I don't want you to tell her. Relieved, I continued on my tea-making mission. I know, Mom. You don't think she's strong enough to handle it. You... How did you... Did you talk to your dad? She asked, bristling. He shouldn't be telling you. Oh, crap. I nearly dropped the mug I'd just pulled from the cabinet. Where had I heard that? It came to me all of a sudden. The dream from last night. Um... No, I mean, Dad and I haven't really talked much about this at all. I've just been thinking about it a lot, and I guess I came to the same conclusion. About Jenny, I mean. Can she tell that I'm lying? My mom raised her eyebrows. Really? I'm surprised in you. I sort of thought you'd demand we tell her the truth as soon as possible. She skewered me with her sharpest mom look apparently doubting my sincerity. Nonchalantly, I shrugged. Don't know. I guess it just makes sense to me. I quickly turned away, 
to fill the yellow enamel teapot. I'm just going to make Grandma some tea and then I'll help you with dinner, I said, hoping to divert her thoughts. Oh, well, that's wonderful. I'm a little behind schedule, she confessed, hoisting the roasting pan into the oven. After I delivered the tea and fitted myself with a burgundy apron, proclaiming, I cook with wine. Sometimes I even add it to the food. I was directed toward a multitude of duties. I chopped, mixed, boiled, stirred, and mashed without a moment between each task. Every year, my mom felt the need to try to outdo her previous holiday feasts. At least I know where I get my love of cooking, I thought contentedly. That night, belly stuffed with ham, potatoes, and way too many frosted Christmas cookies, I fell asleep and dreamed. Again, I watched my parents discuss whether or not to tell Jenny and me the truth. Again, I witnessed my grandpa directing my parents to Dr. Lee's practice. Again, the hand jerked me from the dream before I could uncover the identity of the hidden man who'd been speaking to my grandparents. In the early hours of the morning, a new scene played out in my dreams. My family was eating the previous year's Christmas Eve dinner. My mom's failed sweet potato souffle sat deflated on the edge of the table. I inhaled in surprise. Another version of me was entering the room, carrying a full bottle of wine. I just don't know what I want to do yet. I guess I'm not ready to commit, Jenny said, setting the bottle on the table next to my dad. The past version of me said, You still haven't picked your major? She scoffed. You're in the middle of your third year, Jay. You're sort of running out of time. Gee, thanks for the heads up. I hadn't noticed. My sister glared at the other me. Damn it, Lex, I can survive in the world without you reminding me of things I already know. She'd always had a hair-trigger temper, but I remembered how shocked I'd been at the severity of her reaction. Jay, come on, the other me said. I just meant that it's an important decision, and unless you plan to stay in school forever, you... No, Lex, just stop talking for once. God, sometimes I can't even stand to be in the same house with you. She threw her napkin onto her full plate and stormed out of the room, leaving our parents and Grandma Sue's gaping. The other me rushed after her. I followed. Jay, come on, what's wrong? The other me called through Jenny's closed bedroom door. Watching the past, I leaned against the upstairs hallway wall, cringing at what I knew was about to happen. The door flung open, and my sister huffed out, pushing past the other me and dragging her suitcase. It's you, she screamed as she marched down the hallway. It's always you. Lex, this, Lex, that. Lex knew her major before she started college. Lex got a full ride to grad school. Lex is so perfect. Why can't you be more like your self-centered, stuck-up, know-it-all sister? God, I wish we weren't sisters. Then I wouldn't have to pretend to like you. She heaved her suitcase down the stairs and out to her car. The other version of me was crying but I left her in the hallway to follow my sister outside. I found her in our mother's consoling embrace beside her car. Their words became clear as I moved closer. What's best for you, sweetie? You are both special, intelligent young women, just in different ways. My sister pulled out of the hug and wiped her eyes. Sometimes it's just too much, Mom. Sometimes I just want her to accept me as I am. What if I don't want to be just like her? What if I want to drop out of school and become an artist? What if... She'll love you no matter what, sweetie. You just have to give her a little time to understand. You know how stubborn she can be. My sister glared back at the open front door. She's had 21 years to understand me. How much more time could she possibly need? She took a deep breath and sighed. I'm sorry, Mom. I just can't be around her right now. She's just so judgy. Can you tell Dad and Grandma I... I don't know. 
Just tell them that I'm sorry and that I love them. Oh, and tell them Merry Christmas. My mom shook her head. You don't need to leave, sweetie. Yeah, mom, I do. What about your presents? Our mom asked, a thread of desperation twining through her words. I don't know. I'll pick them up after she leaves. She kissed our mom on the cheek, slid into her car, and drove away. When I woke, my cheeks were sticky with partially dried tears. Did Jay really say those things to mom? If she did, is she right about me? I dragged myself out of bed and tiptoed to my sister's room. Her door was cracked open, allowing me to slip into her bedroom without waking her. Jay, I whispered, sitting on the unoccupied side of the bed. Blinking, she stared at me from her pillow. <clears throat> Lex, what are you... Can I sleep in here with you? I asked timidly. Jenny snorted. Did you have a bad dream? Sort of, I admitted. But mostly I just wanted to apologize. For last Christmas. For everything. She sat up abruptly, tugging the multi-hued comforter beneath me. I'm sorry, what? Taking a deep breath, I dove in. I'm really sorry. I did want you to be like me. I wanted to be able to relate to you, which would have been so much easier if we had more in common. And you're right. I'm self-centered. I never considered trying to be more like you. I just wanted you to be like me, which is so stupid of me because you're an amazing, talented person and I never want you to change and I'm proud to call you my sister. Oh, she said, staring at me wide-eyed. Um, thanks. After a moment's pause, she added, Well, are you getting in or not? As I crawled under the covers on the left side of the bed, I felt one of the flailing, broken strands of my life begin to mend. Whoever I was, Whoever my biological father was, I would always be sure of one thing. Jenny was my sister, and she always would be. Chapter 6 Ignorance and Stupidity But really, thanks for the ride, Mike, I said to the man sitting in the driver's seat. Jenny had known I needed a ride back to Seattle, and when she overheard that her best friend's brother, Mike, had plans to return to Seattle before New Year's Eve, she'd asked if I could ride along with him. Mike smiled as we exited the freeway and entered the U District, an area of the city famous for its excellent selection of budget-priced ethnic food, endless rows of apartments, and turn-of-the-century bungalows, and of course, the University of Washington. No problem, he said. I'm still surprised you're living here too. Don't know how I missed that. Suppose it shouldn't be a surprise. Half our high school has migrated over here. I know, it was a mass exodus, I said, laughing, though technically I wasn't part of it since I did my undergrad in Montana. True, Mike said, nodding thoughtfully. As I stared out the window, I found comfort in the familiar surroundings. Nature, lush and green, seemed to be at war with the cold, man-made structures, with nature always on the verge of winning. Yakima had been home for most of my life, but Seattle had supplanted it two and a half years ago, when I started my graduate studies at UW. You said you live on 15th, right? Yep, I said, eager to see Thora and to just be home, Mike adjusted his baseball cap, then glanced at me. So, Lex, we should do something sometime. Oh? Studying him briefly, I took in his warm brown eyes and handsome, if not slightly youthful, face. Mike Hernandez had been one of the guys as a teenager, 
every girl in our grade at Eisenhower High School had fantasized about him at least once, including me. I'd had a short phase of Mike obsession during our sophomore year, but nothing had ever come of it. Until a couple hours ago, I hadn't seen Mike since high school graduation. Smirking, he said, yeah, we should get drinks or something. When he smiled, he had adorably faint dimples. That sounds great. I pointed to a large brick apartment building on the left side of the street. That's me. Mike deftly navigated the busy road and parked by the curb near the main entrance. It's lucky our sisters are still friends, so we could, you know, do this, he said, gesturing to me and around the interior of the car. Yeah, it is, I agreed, and I meant it. Mike was definitely attractive, and he seemed to have grown up a lot over the past six years, leaving his party boy reputation behind. Besides, I hadn't been having much luck in the man department. Every guy I met on campus was either too absorbed in his research or overly enthusiastic about the college social scene. I was looking for a balance. I have this thing I have to go to on New Year's Eve, a work party. It could be fun, but I'd have a much better time if you came with me. He removed his hat and watched me, his eyes glittering. Sure, yeah, I said, trying to hide some of my eagerness. His answering smile was radiant. Great, I'll pick you up at eight. Oh, and it's cocktail attire. It's a date, I said, blushing as I scooted out of the passenger seat and retrieved my bag from the back seat of the silver Audi. See you in two days, Lex, Mike said before I shut the car door. I walked up to the building's main entrance and fit the key in the lock. By the time I looked back, Mike's car was nowhere in sight. I felt giddy with excitement, and I really, really needed to talk to Kara and Annie. Once I was in my apartment, I tossed my bag onto the bed, snuggled on the couch with Thora, and pulled my phone out of my pocket to call Kara. Lex? Is it really you? Are you alive? Was Kara's greeting. Yes, yes, and yes. And I have news. When can you get over here? She paused. If I leave the office early, maybe four-ish? Okay, great, I said excitedly. I'm gonna call Annie. See you late. Lex, wait, Kara blurted out before I could hang up. Is it good news or bad news? I want to be prepared. I considered holding back the info about my parentage and only focusing on the date with Mike, but thought better of it. Both, I told her, unsure if I would go so far as to fill them in on the weird, way too real dreams. Okay, see you later. Bye. I quickly called Annie and had a nearly identical conversation. Both women would be over in three hours and I had some thinking to do. Disturbing Thora from her euphoric cuddling, I rose from the couch and retrieved a yellow notepad and pen from atop the coffee table. I kept both items generously scattered about the apartment as a general rule. I couldn't predict when research inspiration or insight would strike. When I reclaimed my comfortable position on the couch, my cat simply glared at me from the windowsill, stretching and lying down with her feet curled primly under her. Have it your way, Thora, I said, clicking the pen open. I drew a line down the center of the page, dividing it into two columns. At the top of one, I wrote, The dreams aren't real. Atop the other, The dreams are real. Quickly, I began listing items in the aren't real column, like impossible, but I ran out of ideas almost as soon as I started. Switching to the are real column, I marked up the page with furious starts and stops. After five minutes, I compared the lists, shocked. Aren't real. Impossible. Wasn't even alive for the grandma-grandpa scene. Impossible. I might be in shock. Are real. 
the painting. Dr. Lee. Dr. Ramirez? Grandpa's voice? He's Italian? Convo between Mom and Jenny, knowing Mom thinks Jenny isn't strong enough for the truth. Mom's fashion is way too ridiculous for even me to dream up. Feels just like the memory dreams I've had since high school. I can remember the dreams too well when I wake up. Unnatural. I'm fully aware in the dreams. Also, unnatural. Well, shit, I said, copying my mom's signature profane exclamation. It was the one she used when she realized she'd forgotten an essential item at the grocery store, or when she received a notice from school notifying her of Jenny's skipped classes. For her, it meant, huh, I guess I should have seen that coming, but it still sucks. I flipped the page up and over the top of the notepad and started a new list, cataloging all of my recent dreams. As I wrote, I started to notice several common characteristics. First, I had to be asleep, but that one was pretty obvious, seeing as they were dreams. However, I did find it a little odd that I'd fallen asleep at Grandma Suze's, right after I'd had a great night's sleep. Tiredness had crept up on me, then wrestled me into submission. Second, location seemed to be important. Each dream first played out in my mind while I slept in the same place as the scene had actually happened. I'd been at my parents' house when I dreamed of their conversations about telling Jenny and me the truth. And when I dreamed of the blow-up during the previous Christmas Eve dinner, after dozing off at Grandma Suze's, I dreamed of the discussion about the clinic and Dr. Lee, the Dr. Ramirez nightmare, hadn't technically been in the same location. The accident had taken place just outside of Denny Hall, where I'd fallen asleep. But I still wasn't 100% convinced that dream had really been like the others. Third, I'd been experiencing extreme emotion each time I'd fallen asleep. I'd felt overwhelmingly eager for winter break before the nap in Denny Hall. Lost before the first dream at my house, desperate before the one at Grandma Suze's, and regretful before I'd dreamed of Jenny. Eager, lost, desperate, regretful. As I thought about the emotions, I realized that, other than the Dr. Ramirez nightmare, the dreams shared a common thread. They seemed to pop up out of need. I needed to understand where I came from to figure out where I could learn more about my paternity and to make things right with my sister. The dreams of my parents, my grandparents, and my sister had met those needs, respectively. With that realization came another thought. Can I control this? If I could focus on something I needed at the moment, maybe I could force another one of the two real dreams. Maybe I could learn to use them to help me discover other useful bits of information. I ignored the part of my brain screaming about delusions and straitjackets and padded rooms. Checking the clock on the wall, I saw that I still had two hours before Kara and Annie arrived, plenty of time to test my insane theory. I was tired enough to nap, so I stretched out on the couch and covered myself with a blanket. Thora, apparently forgiving me for displacing her, hopped down from her perch to curl up next to me. I thought about what I needed, what was making me feel extreme emotions at the moment, and eventually drifted off to sleep. My apartment door opened, admitting a stumbling, laughing couple. The man was wearing a black suit, his jacket unbuttoned, and metallic blue tie undone around his neck. The woman was wearing a silky black dress that skimmed the bottom of her knees, and her feet were bare. Her gleaming dark hair was falling out of its loose updo. I was watching me. The man, Mike, pressed the other version of me against the wide, polished wood post separating the kitchen from the living room. She giggled, 
he kissed her hungrily, pressing his whole body against hers and running his hands over every reachable part of her. She twined her fingers in his soft black hair and groaned. I moved closer, equally curious and disturbed by the scene playing out in front of me. I couldn't imagine myself ever being as inebriated as the other version of me seemed. Part of my mind whispered that what I was watching wasn't real. Another part wondered if it was, but it just hadn't happened yet. God, I want you, Lex. Can you feel it? Mike groaned, grinding his hips harder against hers. Can you feel how hard you made me? He slipped one hand up her skirt, while the other fumbled with his belt buckle. Wait, wait, the other me whispered, trying to push Mike's groping hand out from under her dress. I'm dizzy, I don't feel... No, it's good. You're beautiful, Mike said hoarsely, unbuttoning his pants and lowering the zipper. Mike, wait, she demanded. She turned her head away and made an effort to push him back. He ignored her using both hands to raise the skirt of her dress and pull down her black lace boy shorts. No, stop, Mike, she repeated, her protests growing shrill as Mike became more forceful. I couldn't stand it anymore. I lurched forward, intending to push him away from her, but I bounced off an invisible barrier. Stop, I shouted. Leave her alone. Mike glanced at the couch then shoved the other version of me into the living room. She screamed, tripping on the underwear tangled around her ankles. As she fell to the floor, her head smashed against the corner of the steamer trunk coffee table. Within seconds, she was still. Mike stared down at her, mouth hanging open in shock, and the front door crashed open. I lurched to a sitting position and immediately felt nauseated, it was just a dream, just a regular, meaningless dream. But I couldn't get over the way it had felt, like a memory, like the others. But how could it be real? Mike wouldn't... Before I could dwell further, there was a knock at the door. Kara and Annie had arrived. Still a little shaken, I quickly finger-combed my hair and stretched before letting my friends in. We brought wine! Kara exclaimed, hugging three beautiful bottles of the nerve-calming libation. And cheese, Annie sang immediately after her. She offered up a canvas shopping bag filled with cheeses and, knowing her penchant for decadence, some other tasty goodies. Amazing, splendid, genius, I said, bowing as I showered them with praises. I wasn't sure how much we'd need. Kara said, using a corkscrew to point at the bottles lined up on the counter. Without hesitation, I replied, probably all of them. After laying a half dozen varieties of cheese, along with strawberries, sliced apples and pears, crackers, and olives out on the coffee table like an offering to the divine, we settled in the living room with glasses full of wine. My friends perched on the couch and I settled on a floor cushion on the opposite side of our little feast. Taking frequent sips of wine, I listened to their soothing, inane chatter. It was nice to be surrounded by silliness for a few moments. So? Spill, Kara demanded, her bright blue eyes focusing on me. Kara, Annie admonished, slapping Kara's leg. She'll tell us when she's ready. No, it's fine, I said. Good news or bad news first? Um, bad, Kara said, doing her best to contain her curiosity and appear supportive. So, it all started with my mom's surprise visit, I began. It was surprisingly easy to tell them the story of my mysterious paternity. However, though I tried, I couldn't bring myself to spill about the two real dreams. I ended my enormously long monologue with the good news, a replay of the ride home with Mike and the resulting planned date. But I'm not really sure about it, I said, 
feeling my eyebrows draw together. Why? Annie asked. Yeah, why? If he's such a stud, why would you possibly consider backing out? Kara asked, clearly confounded. Blushing, I shook my head. Well, it's weird. I, um, took a nap this afternoon, and the dream I had was just, I shivered, unnerving. And why would that change your mind about going out with Studley Martinez? Kara asked, emptying the remaining contents of the first wine bottle into her glass. Hernandez, Annie corrected. Whatever, you know what I mean. I rolled my eyes and took a deep breath before explaining. In the dream, Mike came back here with me after the party and... And he sort of tried to force me to have sex. I mean, I wanted to. I think. Or... At least at first I did, but not like that. Kara held up her hand like a traffic officer. Wait, he dream raped you? No, at least not all the way. I woke up before it was over, I said, and let my friends ponder the information for a few seconds. Kinky, Kara exclaimed. Kara, you are horrible, Annie accused, glaring at the blonde sitting beside her. It's creepy, not kinky. What? It was a dream, as in not real. Come on, Lex, you have to go out with him. You haven't been on a decent date in at least six months. You're just nervous. When was the last time you even had sex? Kara asked, crass as usual. A while, I mumbled, hiding behind my hands. She's probably right. It was just a dream, and... I am nervous. When I lowered my hands, I found Annie and Kara studying me with identical expressions, eyebrows raised and mouths pinched. I immediately burst into giggles, and upon seeing each other, they joined me. As soon as the laughter died down, I expressed one of my several anxieties about the impending date. Anxieties, I told myself, not excuses. I don't have anything to wear, and I can't really afford to splurge on a new dress, I said, moping. Oh my god, shut up! You are so ridiculous. I have the perfect dress, Kara said, bouncing on the couch again. I haven't actually worn it yet, so you cannot get anything on it, but because I love you so much, I'll let you borrow it. Oh, clapped Annie, and I can come over and get you fixed up. You are not going on a date to a fancy New Year's Eve party with a ponytail. She waggled her finger at me sternly. Okay, okay, I said, holding up my hands in submission. Good, they exclaimed, and began plotting and laughing and hiccuping. The night went downhill from there. Okay, you're done, Annie stated finally allowing me access to the full-length mirror hanging on the back of my bedroom door. I examined her handiwork, noting the classiness of the loose, low bun. Annie, you're a genius, she blushed and shrugged, gathering her various salon-grade tools into a bag with seemingly infinite compartments. I had just experienced one of the very amazing perks of having a hairstylist as one of my closest friends. Finished packing up, Annie studied me. Hair, check. Makeup, check. Nails, check, she said, accenting each statement with a flick of her raised finger. You, my dear, are ready to get dressed. I unzipped the garment bag hanging on the closet door. Are you sure it's not too much? What if I'm overdressed? Better overdressed than under she said. I removed a silky black dress from the hanger and unzipped the back. If you say so, I muttered. I stepped into the dress and let Annie zip it up, glad my bruises from the collision with Dr. Ramirez had healed in a matter of days. At least I didn't have to cover the ugly marks with tights. When I turned to face the mirror, my heart nearly stopped. I was wearing the dress the same one I'd been wearing in the nightmare. This can't be happening, I thought, 
terrified by the beautiful dress. It was simplicity at its best, with thin straps crisscrossing my back and flowing black silk draping over my hips and reaching just past my knees. It fit snugly around my chest and waist, emphasizing my slender curves. Against the inky fabric, my skin looked like smooth, flawless alabaster. Oh, wow, Annie said in a hushed tone. Maybe you should just buy it from Kara. It looks amazing on you. When I didn't respond, she studied the reflection of my face. It had blanched from creamy alabaster to bone white. Lex, are you okay? You're shaking. Sit down. She guided me to the edge of the bed. I'm fine, I responded hollowly. It's just a dress. A common black dress. This whole thing is a stupid coincidence. I just haven't eaten much today. I think I'll make some toast. I stood and hurried from the room, shrugging into a light robe to keep the dress clean and to hide it. A few minutes later, Annie emerged from my bedroom carrying her bag and some strappy silver heels. You have to wear these. I found them buried in the back of your closet. She placed the shoes on the table. Those? I don't know if I can even walk in those. Then you'll just have to lean on Mike, she suggested, her face slack with mock innocence. Having been in the same relationship for nearly six years, Annie liked to date vicariously through her friends. Usually, she was limited to Kara, whose love life was both varied and active, but for once, I was included. I snorted and buttered the toast. I should go. Mike will be here any minute, and I don't want to get in the way, Annie said, raising her eyebrows suggestively. Come on, Annie, it's the first date. We'll at least go to the party first. She fixed an unusually stern gaze on me. Fine, but don't be a nun. You need this. Yeah, yeah. I gave her a quick hug and thanked her for all her help, and then she was gone. I finished the toast quickly and was in the process of strapping on one of the silver death traps when there was a knock at the door. Be there in a sec, I called, trying to keep my balance as I strapped on the other shoe. Dropping my robe off in the bedroom, I took a quick peek in the mirror to make sure everything was still in place, frowned at the dress one last time, and hurried to open the door. Hi, I said, a little breathless. For several seconds, Mike just stared, his eyes wide and childlike, before crinkling with a smile. He looked quite handsome in a black suit with a blue tie, and I was relieved it wasn't a metallic blue tie like he'd worn in the dream. It was just a dream, I reminded myself again. You look gorgeous, he said. Thanks, I replied with a slight shrug. You look nice too. Do you want to come in? Well, we should probably go. We're already late. My fault, he said, holding out his arm. Slightly relieved, I smiled. Part of me was convinced that if I let him into my apartment, the horrible nightmare would play out. But if I kept him out, let me grab my coat real quick. I plucked my favorite coat, a nearly knee-length plum-colored pea coat, out of the pint-sized coat closet, grabbed my keys and handbag, and locked the door on my way out. Nearly four hours and way too much champagne later, we broke apart from a very enthusiastic New Year's kiss. Mike had been a charming gentleman all evening, and the wine had settled my unnecessarily jumpy nerves. Caught up in the excitement of the holiday, I was on the verge of pulling Studley Hernandez into the nearest coat closet for a little seven minutes in heaven. Perhaps being on a date with someone from my high school was making me feel a little bit like a teenager again. Luckily, Mike was way ahead of me. He leaned closer, bringing his lips to my ear. So, is that offer to come into your apartment still open? My eyes wandered to the back of his neck, mere inches away. Because he was a few inches taller than me, I could just barely see the edge of a black tattoo peeking above his collar. Absolutely, I said, smiling. 
Though I was 24 and had slept with several different men, I'd yet to have a very enjoyable experience. If that kiss was any indication of Mike's bedroom manner, my luck was about to change. Great, let's get out of here, he said, capturing my hand and leading the way. We gathered my coat, hopped into his Audi, and arrived at my apartment in record time. While I was attempting to unlock my apartment door, Mike was occupying himself by using his lips to do pleasant things to my neck and shoulders. A nagging feeling in the pit of my stomach, a sensation that I was forgetting something important, was washed away by twin torrents of desire and drunkenness. It was so bad that I couldn't focus on the lock long enough to slip the key in. Mike chuckled against my shoulder, making me shiver, and said, Here, allow me. He ran his right hand down my arm until he held the keys. The door was open in seconds, and laughing, we stumbled inside. I giggled as Mike backed me against the wide, polished wooden post that separated the kitchen from the living room. Oddly, I couldn't remember walking the ten steps from the door to the post. Mike kissed me hungrily, pressing his whole body against mine and running his hands up and down my sides. I twined my fingers in his soft black hair to anchor my swaying body. How did we get here? Mike's hands became greedy, grabbing at my breasts and hips and butt a little too roughly. But my wine-muddled mind couldn't hold on to any thought long enough to care. God, I want you, Lex. Can you feel it? He groaned, grinding his hips harder against me. His erection jabbed against my hip bone. Can you feel how hard you made me? After another groan, he breathed. I'll come so hard for you. As I felt one of his hands slip up my dress, the world suddenly became liquid. It seemed to heave and dip randomly, like the swells of a stormy sea. It was nauseating. I heard the clink of metal and looked down to see several identical belt buckles being undone. Wait, wait, I whispered, trying to push his groping hand away. It had made it past my lacy underwear, and his fingers were rubbing some area that wasn't the least bit pleasurable. This is wrong. I'm dizzy. I don't feel... No, it's good. You're so beautiful, Mike interrupted. He continued his misdirected rubbing of my groin while he used his free hand to lower the zipper on his pants. Fumbling with his boxers, he exposed himself. Mike, wait, I said more forcefully. On the verge of vomiting, I turned my head away and made an effort to push him back. He didn't budge. With both hands, he raised my dress and pulled down my underwear. Nausea and panic battled for control inside me. I have to get away. Why won't the world hold still? Why won't he stop? What's happening? No, stop. Mike, please, I yelled, but he only pulled his pants down further. Please, Mike, no, I said, my voice shrill. I squeezed my legs together as he tried to wedge himself between them. Mike, stop. He pressed against me, his erection pushing between my thighs. Easier on the couch, he muttered, his words barely audible. Without warning, he pulled away and shoved me into the living room. I screamed, tripping on the underwear tangled around my ankles. My head hit the corner of the coffee table. The last thing I heard was the apartment door crashing open. This can't be real. Blackness. Chapter 7 Explanations and Omissions I opened my eyes only to be blinded by bright, fluorescent light. I yearned for the glorious golden fire that had been in my dreams. It had been beautiful and soothing, 
Nothing like the awful luminescence currently boring through my eyeballs into my brain. From all directions, beeps and hums and voices pounded against my head like jackhammers. Squeezing my eyes shut, I attempted to cover my ears with my hands, but I couldn't seem to move my arms. I moaned, or possibly grunted. Hey, guys, she's awake, a familiar voice murmured. My inability to move my arms was making me panic, and I started to squirm from side to side. Lex, it's okay. Lex, it's Annie and Kara. You're okay, Annie stated calmly as she pressed her arm across my shoulders to hold me down. It didn't take much effort on her part. I was weak and groggy. I opened my eyes and was instantly caught in her warm, earnest gaze. Rick, can you get a nurse? She asked her longtime boyfriend, not looking away from me. Lex? Kara poked her head around Annie's shoulder. Do you know who we are? We won't hurt you. I... I'm so sorry. She burst into tears, collapsing over my stomach and splaying her unusually limp blonde hair over the bed. I tried to pat her head, but my damn arms were tucked under the blankets. My... arms, I whispered. Kara... Get up, she wants to be able to move, Annie said briskly. Kara sat up and wiped her eyes. Oh, sorry. Gently, Annie withdrew each of my arms from its cotton prison and rested it on top of the thin blue blanket. There, is that better? I smiled at her and nodded. Thanks. And I do know who you are. I paused trying to remember how I'd ended up in the world's brightest hospital. What happened? How long have I been here? And why do I have the mother of all headaches? My two best friends exchanged worried glances and then looked down at the thin hospital blanket. Unease swelled in my chest. Guys? You came in early this morning, Annie said slowly. Glancing at the clock on the opposite wall, she added, It's almost midnight now. I see our patient is awake, a plump nurse chirped from the doorway. Rick entered the room behind her, offering me a little wave. Um, yeah? Alexandra. Lex, Kara interrupted, frowning. We told you her name is Lex. The nurse scowled at Kara for a moment but turned an indulgent look on me. Lex, we need to talk to you about some personal medical matters. Your friends will need to leave when the doctor arrives. She looked at the door as it opened again and admitted a pretty, petite woman wearing a white lab coat. Ah, here she is now. Time to go, friends of Lex, the nurse said my name as if acquiescing to a completely ridiculous whim. Kara, Annie, and Rick vacated the room, but not without scornful looks at the nurse. Apparently, they hadn't formed the best relationship while I'd been unconscious. Before shutting the door, Annie said, We'll be right outside if you need us, okay, Lex? I nodded at her, grateful for her steady support. Thank you, Nurse Rochtenberg, but I can handle it from here, the doctor said, dismissing the nurse. Bristling, Nurse Rochtenberg also left the room. Miss Larson, the police would like to speak with you when we're done for a statement about the assault, the doctor told me. I couldn't get over how attractive she was. Of Mideastern descent, she had chocolate brown almond shaped eyes, smooth, symmetrical features, and perfect bronze skin. She was by far the prettiest doctor I'd ever met. A statement about, about what? Without warning, a montage of images tumbled through my mind, coalescing into a horrid memory. Stumbling through the door with Mike, the wooden post at my back, the world spinning, his hands everywhere, begging him to stop. Mike refusing, Mike shoving me, hitting my head. 
the door crashing open, golden fire. I burst into instantaneous and uncontrollable sobs. Ms. Larson. Lex, I corrected through heaving breaths. Lex, I'm Dr. Isa, she said, grasping my nearest hand. What that man did to you, and what he tried to do, is horrible, unforgivable. But, she continued, it could have been worse. I looked into her sure brown eyes, entranced. He could have succeeded. He could have raped or even killed you, instead of simply assaulting you. A bitter laugh escaped from my lips. Simply? Yes, Lex, simply. Some women haven't been as lucky as you. I wasn't as lucky as you, she explained calmly, releasing my hand. You, you were raped? I asked, suddenly abashed. Yes, it was a long time ago, and it no longer has a hold over my life. But I understand the terror, okay? I wondered if she was the most honest person I'd ever met. I nodded, ignoring the pain in my head. Okay, you were very lucky to have had someone nearby who responded so quickly. For many women, it's the inaction of those around them that enables their rape or murder. Who? The door. I heard the door crash open, but I don't remember anything afterward. What happened? I asked, completely confused. Who saved me? Smiling, Dr. Isa shook her head. It's quite amazing, actually. Almost like a superhero story. The nurses who were on duty when he brought you in said he was the most striking man they'd ever seen. She sighed wistfully. I wish I'd seen him. The police found the alleged assailant, Mike Hernandez, tied up in your apartment. He was in pretty bad shape when they arrived. After only a brief hesitation, she added, You should know, he's on a different floor, but he is in the hospital. I flinched and did my best to huddle into a ball. Please don't worry, Lex. He's under guard. A police officer is watching his room at all times. Slowly, I relaxed, stretching back out. Dr. Isa reached for my hand again, gripping it almost painfully. There is something you must know. She hesitated for the briefest moment. Soon, other doctors in this hospital will begin approaching you with very intense questions about your medical history. You must not under any circumstances, tell them of your unknown paternity. I eyed her, taken aback. How do you... It doesn't matter. What's important is your safety. They will ask you about your parentage. And you must say that Alice and Joe Larson are your parents. Your biological parents. If you stay here too long... They will eventually ask you questions about your genetics and any differences or abnormalities you've noticed about yourself. You must tell them that everything is normal and as it has always been. If you don't, your life and others will be at great risk. Do you understand? I swallowed, shocked and confused by her words. I think so. Yes. How does she know anything about me? About any of the weirdness that's been going on in my life? Dr. Isa let out a relieved breath. Good. There is one more thing. We found a very rare and little-known compound in both you and Mr. Hernandez's systems. It doesn't affect the average person, like Mr. Hernandez, but for a very few unique people... It acts similar to Rohypnol, which you may know as the date rape drug. If you hadn't hit your head, you probably would have passed out within minutes anyway. 
I'm assuming you felt its effects before you lost consciousness. Is she saying that Mike drugged me? Feeling numb, I nodded. Tilting her head to the side, Dr. Isa frowned. This will be difficult, but you must not tell anyone about your reaction to the compound. Nobody else here knows about it, and it's safest to keep it that way. Unfortunately, withholding that information may or may not affect the charges against Mr. Hernandez, since nobody else will be aware that you were drugged, but it will be essential to your well-being. Again, do you understand? I licked my lips before responding. She is saying that Mike drugged me. My mind was whirling with questions. Yes, I think so. How do you know all of this? You know things about me that I don't even know. She looked away. I'm so sorry. I'm not permitted to answer any questions like that. Permitted by whom? I need more information, I persisted. She looked conflicted, but the door opened, cutting her indecision short. Lex, are you okay, sweetie? My mom asked, oozing gallons of concern. When they called me, I'm sorry it took me so long to get here. The pass. I called your friends. I didn't want you to be alone. I just... I sighed. My frustration at being interrupted giving way to immense relief. I love you, Mom. I'm okay. She studied my blanket-covered body for a few seconds before turning to the doctor. Sniffling, she asked, Well, what's wrong? What happened? Based on my mom's tone, Dr. Issa might as well have been my attacker. Mom, I said, answering for the doctor. Dr. Issa was just conferring with me about some of the less family-friendly details. I love you, but there are some things I don't want you to hear, at least not from a doctor. I'll fill you in later, okay? I desperately hoped she would give me a few more minutes alone with the doctor. My mom frowned before she answered. Dad will be here soon. He's just parking the car. I'll be right outside with your friends, okay, Lex? I nodded. Thanks, Mom. While we'd been talking, another doctor had joined Dr. Issa in my room. He politely shut the door as my mom left. Dr. Issa gave me an apologetic smile before he began his questions. Once he began, it was a relentless waterfall. Ms. Larson, are you aware that your body heals at an unheard of rate? Have you noticed anything exceptionally different between you and your peers? Do you have any knowledge of allergies or an allergic history in your family? Are you very similar to your parents? And on and on and on. I listened to each of the questions carefully and answered based on the advice from Dr. Issa, leading the other doctor to believe there was nothing unusual about me and that I'd been unaware of the strange compound in my blood. More than an hour after the barrage began, Dr. Issa proclaimed that her patient needed rest and that I was to be left alone until breakfast. After the other doctor exited the room, Dr. Issa used the pretense of adjusting my blankets to whisper a few enlightening pieces of information. You hit your head very hard. You should be in a coma, and nobody understands why you're not. Your recovery is astounding. You must tell anyone who asks that you've always been a quick healer. She glanced at the clock. Make sure you leave before breakfast. It's served between seven and nine. So you have a few hours. Your release orders are already signed. She reached down to squeeze my hand. I wish you luck, Alexandra Ivanov, she said, using my mother's maiden name. That's not my... The door opened suddenly, cutting me off. As my parents and friends poured into the room, Dr. Issa checked my papers one last time and removed my IV. My head was reeling from her unbelievable revelations, not to mention her cryptic instructions, and a multitude of questions were sprouting in my thoughts. 
I vowed to return to the hospital for one specific reason, to talk to Dr. Issa. Putting on my cheeriest grin, I exclaimed, they said I can go home. Who's driving? Everyone but Dr. Issa looked utterly confused as I hopped out of bed. The doctors had been correct about my body's ability to heal quickly. I felt a hundred times better than I had when I first woke. I'd always been a fast healer, a trait I attributed to having a strong immune system. But this was unbelievable. Did someone bring me some clothes? I asked, holding my peekaboo hospital gown closed as I checked the empty closet. Laylee, I don't know if you should be going home yet, my dad said, concern etching his kindly face. My mom set a half-full duffel bag on the bed. I brought you some clothes, Lex, but we didn't expect you to be released so soon. When the hospital called, they made it sound like... Like, well, like you might not. Her chin quivered, and tears welled in her eyes. Just a little mistake, Mom, I said, reaching out to squeeze her shoulder. I couldn't hug her. If I did, I'd break down. The hospital didn't think I would make it? It explained why they were all staring at me like I'd sprouted an extra head. Rifling through the bag, I found a couple pairs of old sweatpants and a few t-shirts from high school. Not that I minded. Anything was better than the drafty hospital gown. I pulled out a worn gray t-shirt, some cotton boy shorts, and faded blue sweatpants, and disappeared into the bathroom. Again, everyone but Dr. Issa watched me with confused expressions. The good doctor simply smiled. Almost two hours later, and after a lengthy chat with the Seattle police, I arrived home to find a brand new door barring the entrance to my apartment. Man, my apartment manager works fast, I thought. Its pristine, polished wood looked odd next to the nicked doorframe and smudged walls. 100-year-old apartment buildings tended to accumulate more than their share of wear and tear. Using a shiny new key that had been stashed in my mailbox, I unlocked the door and let it swing open. My parents and friends stood behind me, holding their collective breath. Straight ahead was the wooden post Mike had held me against, had shoved me away from. I shuddered at the memory, practically able to feel his greedy, groping hands. But I refused to let my fear of something that happened in the past keep me out of my own home. With a shaky breath, I closed my eyes and stepped through the doorway. When I opened them again, I found that everything in the apartment was perfectly arranged. Too perfectly. Like the whole nightmarish encounter with Mike had never happened. But it did happen. I'd been gone for little more than a day, but it felt like weeks. Time wasn't settling right with me just like the pristine state of my apartment. Needing a distraction, I dropped my keys in an engraved metal bowl on the kitchen table and called out, Thora, where are you, little girl? What if she got out while the door was broken? My breaths started coming faster as I imagined her wandering around outside, scared and alone. Oh God, she has to be here. My small entourage milled around in the kitchen and living room while I frantically searched the apartment, calling out Thora's name. I retrieved a crinkly bag of cat treats and shook it, hoping the sound would draw her out. Finally, after minutes of searching, I heard a faint squeak come from under the bed. Kneeling on the floor, I lifted the bed skirt and peered into the darkness. Two glowing green orbs floated just out of arm's reach. Letting out a sigh, I righted myself and quieted my frantic thoughts. It's okay. Thora's okay. Everything's okay. When I emerged from my bedroom, I felt as though I was standing before a firing squad. Five pairs of eyes were lined up, each watching me attentively. I'm fine, I reassured them, my voice a little too high and their expressions intensified. 
Kara, Annie, Rick, thank you so much for everything you did at the hospital. I really, really mean it. I bit my lip, feeling bad for completely hijacking the past 26 hours with the insanity that had become my life. You guys must be exhausted. Why don't you go home and get some rest? Annie took a step forward, opened her mouth, and closed it again without saying anything. She studied me closely before nodding. Okay, Lex. If you need us, just call anytime, okay? Her eyes seemed to add, but this isn't over. I watched my three friends leave before turning my attention to my parents. My mom cut me off before I had the chance to open my mouth. Don't even think about it, Lex. But no buts. I'm staying here until the quarter starts, she said, steamrolling my unsaid protests. But she interrupted me again, somehow responding to my unspoken thoughts. Dad can't stay, so you don't need to worry about where we'll sleep. It's just me, and I'll make myself at home on the couch. He'll pick me up when he's here on business next week. Though I'd planned to convince them to leave, a huge weight lifted from me at knowing my mom wouldn't be budged. I really didn't want to be alone, even if having her stay with me postponed my intentions to question Dr. Isa further. I wanted my mom around, at least for a little while. I sighed. Okay. With two big steps, my dad wrapped me in a comforting bear hug. Thank you, Laylee, he whispered. It's as much for her as it is for you. I squeezed him in response, then pulled away. With a yawn, I said, I think I'm going to take a nap. My parents both nodded encouragingly. It seemed that after attempted sexual assault and hospitalization, naps were a parent-approved coping mechanism. Marching out of the hospital, on the other hand, was not. Feeling far too exhausted for someone who'd spent most of the past day asleep, I smiled at my parents and trudged into my bedroom. After I shut the door, I collapsed onto the bed. I only had a few seconds to wonder about the man who'd crashed through my apartment door to save me, before sleep whisked me away to the land of dreams. Chapter 8 Recollection and Recuperation My apartment door opened, admitting a familiar couple, stumbling and laughing. I was standing in the middle of the cramped living room, watching, helpless to stop what I knew would happen. Panic made my heart race and my breathing quicken. I closed my eyes, incapable of watching, experiencing the horrible incident again but I could still hear Mike whispering to me, the other me. Desperately, I wished for it to be over. I heard the other me scream, closely followed by the crack of her head striking the steamer trunk and the thud of her body hitting the floor. There was a crash, an explosive splintering and cracking of wood, and my eyes sprang open. A figure stood in the doorway silhouetted into obscurity by the light from the hallway. The man who saved me, I realized. As he stepped out of the light and into my apartment, I noticed that the darkness surrounding him hadn't only been due to backlighting. Shadows darker than the night cloaked him, seeming to emanate from him. To my eyes, he was a man composed of nothing but those impenetrable, pitch-black shadows. What the hell? The shadowed man paused after a few long strides, looking at the other, unconscious version of me, before turning toward the shocked man cowering before him. At least, I thought he looked at the other me. I couldn't actually see his face through the shadows he seemed to be wearing like a disguise. You! Mike howled in terror. Shocked, I realized that Mike knew my rescuer. No, no, no. Mike dropped to his knees, groveling. She fell. I swear I didn't do anything. Confusion and frustration displaced my earlier panic. Who is he? Why can't I see him? 
It was pretty obvious that he didn't walk around like that, all shadows and menace, outside of the dream or memory or whatever it was. Mike had seen him, as had the hospital staff, so why can't I? The shadowed man's steps devoured the distance to Mike in two long strides. His midnight-coated arm backhanded Mike, and the smaller man fell to the floor in a limp heap. Swiftly, the stranger moved to the sprawled form of the other me, hovering over her. His hands flew over her body. Hey! I shouted, forgetting that I was only watching something that had already happened, forgetting that I couldn't change it. Keep your hands off her. His hands gently pulled up her underwear, and from the way the shadows cloaking his face shifted, I thought he must have looked away as he did it. He arranged her black silk dress so she was decently covered before gently rolling her onto her back and touching her wrists. Abruptly, he leaned over her face like he was listening for something. When he sat back on his heels, he brushed a lock of hair out of her face and simply watched her. I moved closer, circling around the man. I searched for a crack in the dense blackness surrounding him, but could find none. From the kitchen floor, Mike groaned, and the shadowed man glanced at him. Gracefully, my rescuer rose. He lurked toward my fallen attacker, spitting vicious, incomprehensible syllables along the way. But something about the words, the language, sounded familiar. I hovered over the other, unconscious me, while the shadowed man attended to Mike with sharp jabs and swift kicks. I despised Mike, thought I'd lost the capacity to feel pity for him completely. But seeing him being beaten so brutally awoke a sliver of sympathy in me. Did he really drug me? Part of me couldn't accept Dr. Issa's claim, and I was pretty sure it was the same part of me that felt bad for Mike as I watched. Eventually, the shadowed man's need for violence was expended. He sat Mike, head lolling forward, with his back against the wood post, and quickly arranged him so his arms extended behind him. I moved closer. At some point, the shadowed man had produced a zip tie and secured it around Mike's wrists, effectively binding him to the post. Both Dr. Issa and the police had mentioned that Mike had been tied up and in pretty bad shape when he'd been found, alone, in my apartment. In fact, I was pretty sure the police wanted to find my rescuer, to arrest him for what he'd done to Mike. The severity of his actions hadn't really sunk in until now. He saved me, but he's definitely dangerous. I returned my attention to the shadowed man, watching as he again approached the wounded version of me. Why had he been so enraged? Why had he beaten Mike into unconsciousness? His reaction seemed personal, like he knew me, cared for me, and couldn't let Mike go unpunished for what he'd done, and for what he'd intended to do. But if that were true, why was he hiding from me? Why hadn't he stayed at the hospital, or at least left contact information so I could thank him for rescuing me? While I wondered about him, the shadowed man picked the other me up easily, like she weighed no more than a child, and carried her through the broken apartment door. Rooted in place, I watched Mike's limp form until the police arrived. According to the wall clock, it took only a matter of minutes. In bed, I felt awareness tug on my consciousness, but I wasn't ready to wake up. I had other plans. A new need was growing. A need to never fall victim to someone like Mike again. A need to never again be drugged into oblivion. I focused on that need as I slid back into the dream. I was standing in the middle of a wide-open, tech-friendly office space, filled with cubicles and decorated in blues and grays. I was at the New Year's Eve party. A few feet to my right, the other version of me was locked in an embarrassingly brazen kiss with Mike. Ugh. Watching them, I grew so disgusted that I wanted to slap the other me. 
I felt the urge to tear her away from Mike and shake her and scream, Open your eyes, you idiot. He's going to hurt you. Run away. But I couldn't do any of that. And it wasn't for a lack of trying. I attempted to pull her away, just as I'd attempted to push Mike off her the first time I'd dreamed of the incident in my apartment. But she was separated by the same impenetrable barrier I'd encountered before. I couldn't touch her. I couldn't touch him. I couldn't touch anything but that damn barrier. I slapped my palm against the barrier separating me from Mike's shoulder. I hate you, I hissed. For some reason, seeing him before the night devolved into violence was more frustrating than anything I'd seen in the other dream. Happy New Year, Mike's colleagues hollered from all around me while they kissed and pawed at each other. Mike was leading the other me away. At most, she was tipsy. While he waited for her to retrieve her coat, Mike took out his phone and tapped his thumbs against the screen. I hurried over to him, nearly gagging at his overly cologned stench. I couldn't understand how I'd ever been attracted to him. Pushing past the nauseating reaction, I peered over his shoulder at the screen. He was reading a text message from someone named Seth. Use the lip balm to make her compliant, then complete the mission. Suddenly awake, I lurched upright in bed, panting. Thora glanced up at me from her cozy position near my hip and meowed quietly. I stroked her soft fur absent-mindedly, thinking about the last dream. Memories of what had happened between leaving the party and stumbling through my apartment door flashed through my mind. Mike kissing my wrist, pulling over to kiss me before resuming the drive, slobbering all over my neck as I tried to open the door to my apartment, obsessively putting on lip balm every few minutes. Use the lip balm to make her compliant, then complete the mission. Based on the text, I realized that Mike's lip balm must have been the source of the substance Dr. Issa had told me about. She'd said it only affected a few unique people. Why am I one of those people? Use the lip balm to make her compliant. How had the sender of the text, Seth, known the substance would work on me? And why had he wanted Mike to use it in the first place? My stomach tied into knots as questions swam around my mind. Had some person I didn't know, someone named Seth, instructed Mike to drug me and do whatever completing the mission entailed? Had Mike been instructed to drug me into unconsciousness and rape me? It was too horrible to consider. It was also too preposterous. I'm losing it, I muttered, laughing at myself from my wild, slightly twisted imagination. I rose from the bed, shuffled to the adjoining bathroom, and examined my reflection in the mirror. Holy crap, I breathed, barely recognizing myself. My brown eyes looked different, like they'd gained a reddish tinge, and my face was washed out and gaunt. Simply based on my appearance, I looked like I was suffering from some ghastly illness, like I was two steps away from death's door and already had my hand raised to knock. But I felt fine, if a little weak, and hungry. I squeezed my eyes shut. It's fine. It's just all the stress, I told myself, thinking not only about Mike and my physical injury, but also about the identity crisis and the strange dreams I'd been dealing with over the past few weeks. Everything is just fine. The words were confident, but my voice was breathy. Turning on the faucet and rinsing my face with cool water, I felt some steadiness return. Eyes still closed, I focused on the delicious smells invading from the kitchen and just breathed. I opened my eyes and stared at my hands. My fingers clutched either side of the rim of the pedestal sink, the tendons standing out sharply on the backs of my hands. I took a deep breath. Again, finally, I turned and left the bathroom, avoiding looking at the stranger in the mirror.
I traded the worn sneakers I'd been too tired to remove for fuzzy purple slippers. I added a gray University of Washington sweatshirt to my scrubby ensemble and opened the bedroom door. My mom stood in front of the stove, humming and swaying from side to side. The little kitchen radio played a generic soft rock song. It was the perfect background music to the pops and sizzles coming from the pans on the stove. A junkie of mothering people, my mom was more in her element than I'd seen her in years. She almost glowed with purpose. Quietly, I slipped out of the bedroom and crossed the living room to the small, rectangular kitchen table. I pulled out my usual chair, the one nearest the bedroom, and sank onto its flattened cushion. Smells yummy, Mom. I'm starving, I said enthusiastically. Startled, my mom spun with her spatula extended in front of her. Lex, you scared me. I didn't know you were up. How are you feeling? An odd combination of accusation, concern, and contentment filled her face. Better, I think, I said, scanning the living room and kitchen. Where's Dad? She sighed. He left about an hour ago. He'll call when he gets home. Oh, I said, disappointment radiating from the single word. Knowing he wasn't my biological father made me second guess all of my dad's actions. Did he really care as much as I thought he did? Did he really love me? Stop that, Lex, my mom chided. I looked up at her, wondering for the thousandth time if she could read my mind. He thought you'd feel more comfortable with just me for the time being, considering, you know. I nodded as her words trailed off, drumming my fingertips on the table. I wondered how much my parents actually knew about the incident with Mike. I had yet to explain to them what happened, so they'd gathered whatever information they had from my friends, the hospital staff, and the police. I took a huge, steadying breath and asked, Aren't you, um, curious about what happened, I mean? My mom studied me closely before turning back to her stovetop ministrations. Sweetie, you take your time. Wait until you're ready and not a minute sooner. She resumed her faint humming. Sighing, I felt both relief and stress. The story had to come out of me eventually, and I dreaded telling it. The longer I waited, the larger the heaping, stinking pile of dread would grow. Is there coffee? I asked as I watched my mom's movements. Judging by her arm motions, there were pancakes in one of the skillets on the stove. If there was one thing I truly loved, it was my mom's pancakes with syrup and butter and bacon. I made tea, she said over her shoulder. I thought it'd be better for you, more relaxing. Carefully, she removed crispy strips of bacon and perfectly browned sausage links from two pans, leaving only popping grease behind, and set them on a stack of paper towels on the counter. My stomach growled audibly. I didn't think I had ever been so hungry. Almost ready, sweetie, my mom said, as she transferred the mouth-watering meats to a plate. She brought it to the table along with another plate piled high with golden brown pancakes and went back to the kitchen for round two. When she returned, she carried two more dishes, one loaded with a mountain of scrambled eggs with onions, peppers, and cheese, and the other with oven-fried potatoes. After one final trip, she settled in the chair perpendicular to mine, and placed a steaming mug of tea at both of our play settings. What are you waiting for, Lex? She gestured to the feast before us. Dig in. I ogled the mountains of deliciousness. Um, Mom, there's absolutely no way that you and I are going to be able to eat all of this. After scooping some of the scramble onto her plate, my mom looked me square in the eye and said, Have you seen yourself? Your skin and bones. If I didn't know any better, I'd think you've lost at least 20 pounds since I saw you four days ago. And your face. It's nearly colorless. She shook her head. Now eat. And eat I did. 
By the time I sat back in my chair, my stomach was painfully full, and my mom wore a smug expression. All of the eggs were gone, as were the sausage links and strips of bacon. Several pancakes remained, and the potato dish was barely half full. Without realizing it, I'd eaten enough for several burly lumberjacks after a hard day's work. My mom smiled, looking as content as a sunbathing kitten. See, Lex, your coloring looks better already. A good home-cooked meal can fix almost anything. She gave me a pointed look. A little sun wouldn't hurt you either. Rolling my eyes, I laughed. Right, Mom, because there are so many chances to get some sun in Seattle in January. You could go to a tanning salon. I scoffed. I will not go to a cancer factory. I'd rather keep my skin smooth and healthy and nicely pasty until I'm grandma's age. With a long, suffering sigh, my mom raised her hands in front of her in defeat. Your dad ran some errands for me before he headed back home. He supplied us with quite a few movies to keep us occupied while you recuperate. Why don't you pick one out? They're over there, she said, pointing to the coffee table behind her. Really? I asked, perking up from my food-induced lethargy. If there was one thing I loved as much as pancakes, it was movies. For the most part, I really was a simple soul to please. So with all the excitement of a child on Christmas morning, I settled on the couch and rifled through a stack of DVD cases. Silently, I thanked my dad for picking movies from nearly every genre. Romantic comedy to action, science fiction to period drama. There was a flick for every mood. At the moment, I was in the mood for some rigid chivalry and modest ball gowns. The latest Jane Austen adaptation shimmered in my hand as I placed it in the tray of the DVD player. I lost myself in the music and language of another time. My mom curled up beside me. I slid down, resting my head on a pillow in her lap, and sighed as she started combing through my hair with her fingers. Breathing in her familiar scent of floral perfume and hand lotion, I felt some of the tension seep out of my body. I was so incredibly glad she'd stayed. Chapter 9 Details and Arrangements As I strolled along a wet, concrete path, I thought back on the last three days, savoring the chance to finally get out of my apartment, alone. My wonderful, caring mom had spent every waking moment stuffing me with her culinary creations and enticing me into watching movies or playing board games. I'd barely had time to grade my students' final essays. I loved my mom dearly and appreciated all of the effort she was channeling into my recovery, but I was getting a little stir-crazy. As I passed well-trimmed expanses of grass and many forests of large evergreens, overgrown blackberry bushes and abundant ferns, I felt a piece of me, one I hadn't even realized was missing, return. It felt like an eternity since we'd set up the meeting, but I was finally on my way to meet Professor Bahur, mysterious archaeologist and user of archaic speech patterns at the Burke Cafe. I almost couldn't contain my anticipation. I wanted to know everything about the dig and what my exact role would be. I still didn't even know the location of the excavation site. I'd left my apartment early, taking the opportunity to turn the half-mile straight shot into a three-mile zigzag across the university's familiar grounds in hopes that the fresh air might help settle my nerves. Entering the quad from the southeast, I ascended gradual brick stairs, thanking my luck that the morning's frost had worn off by midday. I paused on the top step, taking deep breaths of chilly, humid air. I was still weak, recovering from the unforeseen after-effects of the incident with Mike. While my brain had fully healed during the hours spent in the hospital, the rest of my body still looked as if it had been starved for weeks. All of my clothes were noticeably loose, and as I hadn't had much spare bulk to begin with, 
the weight loss definitely wasn't an improvement to my appearance. At least my mom's dietary plan of continual force-feeding seemed to be helping. Breath caught, I resumed my stately pace down one of the brick walkways, crisscrossing the quad's lawn. If I were a soaring bird, looking down at the rectangular open space with its border of brick buildings, I imagined the sight would resemble an enormous stained glass window with emerald panes cut into symmetrical, geometric shapes. The usually crowded area was devoid of people, leaving barren cherry blossom trees and the towering brick and stone buildings as my only companions. Their beautiful, classic architecture appeased the part of me that yearned to replace modern, impersonal structures with those rich in character from earlier centuries. Lost as I'd been in my wandering thoughts, I had a sudden moment of panic, fearing that I would be late for my meeting with Professor Bahur, or that I already was. I checked my phone. It was a quarter past three. Thankfully, I wasn't late. Yet, if I hurried, I might have time to order a vanilla latte before meeting up with him. Ten minutes later, I reached the Burke Museum, heading for the entrance to the cafe in the basement. I sighed appreciatively as I opened the narrow glass door. If I ignored the electric bulbs and the scatter of laptop-focused patrons, I could almost imagine that I'd stepped back in time. The carved wood wall panels and the small, dark-stained tables with their sturdy matching chairs belonged in a world gone a hundred years. I scanned the cafe, and upon finding that all three patrons were women, and therefore not Marcus Bahur, stepped up to the counter. What would you like? The petite, young barista asked. A tall vanilla latte, please, I said, without thinking. Actually, can you make it a grande? And I'll have a blueberry scone. That'll be five sixty-three, she told me. I handed her the money. Do you know if there's a Professor Marcus Bahur here right now? Her eyes went wide, and her cheeks flushed. Oh, um, no, I haven't seen him. I lowered my eyebrows, confused by her reaction. But you know him? Oh, yes, he's been a regular since summer, she explained. Suddenly, her eyes narrowed, and she asked, Why? Are you looking for him? What for? She glanced at the door, then back at me. I put on a friendly smile. I'm meeting him for an academic project. Would you mind describing him to me? I'm not sure who I'm looking for. Her mouth transformed from pouty to pretty, and she giggled. She didn't speak for a few moments while she retrieved my scone and started making my drink. Finally, she said, He's, um, sort of hard to describe. She blushed again while she steamed milk. Okay, well, is he tall? Yes, she replied with a nod. Does he have gray hair? She giggled again. Definitely not. I was growing impatient with her witless inability to simply describe a person. Well, what color is his hair then? Or is he bald? Her eyes squinted in thought. Nope. He's got hair. As she handed me my coffee, I grabbed the scone off the counter and muttered, thanks. I started to turn away from her, but paused. How old do you think he is? As I'd been speaking, her face had grown redder, and her barely contained giggling seemed ready to explode out of her. Oh, you'll have to ask him, she said. And how am I supposed to do that if I can't find it because all I know is that he's tall and has hair? I asked, irritation clipping my words. Is she even old enough to work? She managed to squeak. Because he's right behind you. Before doubling over in laughter, squeezing my eyes shut, I took a deep, calming breath before turning around. He was standing several feet away, wearing gray trousers and a heavy black wool coat, and was, in fact, tall with black hair. My breath caught in my throat as I realized just how minimal 
that description had been. I'd been expecting an older gentleman, but this was a man in his prime, in his early thirties at most, and strikingly handsome. His face was composed of strong lines and sharp angles, his full lower lip the only hint of softness. He'd been looking at his phone when I faced him, leaving my embarrassing reaction, blushing and staring, mercifully unnoticed. When his eyes raised and latched on to mine, I nearly dropped my coffee. His irises were an amber so rich they practically glowed. It was an eye color I'd seen before, only once. Professor Marcus Bahur was the guy I'd spilled vodka and cranberry juice on at the bar. You've got to be kidding me. As recognition registered on my face, the faintest smirk pulled up one corner of his mouth. I groaned and closed my eyes momentarily. I am so sorry about the drinks and your shirt. I mean, God, this is embarrassing. His mouth widened into a tight-lipped smile. This isn't awkward or anything, I thought. Time for some damage control. I closed the distance between us in two short steps and held out my hand, very businesslike. I'm Alexandra Larson. Reaching out, he grasped my hand and shook it firmly. A pleasure, Miss Larson. His accent was rich and beautiful as I remembered from a brief encounter at the bar. Yes, it is, Professor Bahur. I forced myself not to stare at him like a moon-eyed teenager, which was exactly how I'd acted at the bar. As he released my hand, he flicked his eyes to the barista and said, The usual, please. Thank you, Cassandra. To me, he said, Well then, Miss Larson, why don't you pick a table and get settled? I'll join you shortly. Sure. Pleasantly disturbed and highly confused, I wound through the haphazard clusters of tables and chairs to an unoccupied corner. I sat on a bench against the wall, hoping to catch a glimpse of the intriguing professor's interaction with the barista. Cassandra bubbled and chirped nonstop while Professor Bahur waited for his order. He rarely spoke, only providing one-word answers when required but she was unperturbed. At every shift of his body, she giggled or simpered or sighed. Such a little girl, I thought, blandly. I ignored the fact that my body had wanted to respond in an unfortunately similar fashion during both of our brief encounters. Get a grip, I muttered. The director of the greatest excavation opportunity I'd ever been offered was a no-flirt zone. I needed to get my ridiculous, unprofessional reactions to him under control. But, damn, even though he was still wearing his heavy wool coat, I could tell he was well-built. When he moved, every inch of him seemed utterly sure of its placement, like a dancer or a master of the martial arts. I couldn't help but imagine what his body would look like without clothing. Unintentionally, leading me to think about it pressed against mine, covering mine, moving against mine. Unbidden, Mike's body replaced the professor's in my lewd thoughts. My heart rate increased dramatically and my breaths grew short. Ms. Larson, are you all right? Professor Bahur asked from across the table. He sat, placing a cappuccino cup and saucer on the wooden surface. Hmm? I snapped my mind back to the here and now, shoving away all lust or panic-inducing thoughts. Under the professor's steady gaze, I said, Yes, yes, I'm fine, thank you. I was just thinking. Like a falcon, he cocked his head to the side and scrutinized me. Sometimes I find that stray thoughts can be quite troublesome. A curse of the intelligence, I suppose. He included me in his undefined, intelligent group with a flick of his hand on the table. I suppose, I said, or a curse of the cursed. Are you cursed, Ms. Larson? His amber eyes were penetrating. I shook my head and laughed softly, 
thinking of all that had happened during the last month. Maybe. Professor Bahur's expression turned serious. Well, that can be quite an inconvenience when bounding around on excavations and such, don't you think? One might accumulate more curses than one can bear. I've been on several excavations over the past five years, and the curses have yet to interfere with my life. What about you, Professor? He lowered his eyes and studied his cappuccino. Some people are more cursed than others. I coughed, choking on the sip of coffee I'd just taken. I... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to... He waved away my concern with his hand. Please, don't worry about me. I've had a long time to learn how to live with my curses. Unsure of how to respond, I took another sip of frothy latte, this time cough-free. I'm very eager to work with you, Ms. Larson. I've been reading up on your work. Your piece in the Journal of Mediterranean Archaeology was exceptionally enlightening. I brightened, happy to veer toward a less personal topic of conversation. The article he spoke of focused on my unconventional method for deciphering unknown or unclear symbols across dozens of ancient languages, using similar but technically unrelated texts. It formed the basis for my dissertation as well. Thank you, Professor. Honestly, I'm hoping your excavation will provide an opportunity for me to test some of my theories. I think it'll really increase the methodology's validity. I'm certain it will, he agreed, taking a sip of his coffee, which also appeared to be a latte. Now, I'm sure you'd like the specifics of the excavation. Yes, I really would, he nodded absentmindedly. Several years ago, I discovered a couple of stone tablets referring to a temple in the Yir el Bari, a temple that, as far as we know, doesn't exist. Or just hasn't been discovered yet, I added. The Yir el Bari, located in the west bank of the Nile in southern Egypt, was world famous, mostly because the mortuary temple of one of the most famous female pharaohs, Hatshepsut was located there. The idea that there might be an undiscovered temple somewhere among Deir el Bari's steep limestone cliffs was astounding and so incredibly intriguing. Precisely, he agreed. Professor, if you've discovered an entirely unknown temple there, you've made the find of a lifetime. I was in complete and utter awe of the beautiful creature sharing a cafe table with me, not for his looks, but for his unquestionable intellect. Eyes sparkling, he continued, It gets better, Ms. Larson. The temple has remained hidden for so long because of its unique construction. Unlike the three main temples at the Yer el Bari, ours was designed without majestic colonnades and ramps. The entire structure is supposedly carved into the cliffs. I nodded, trying to comprehend the enormity of the potential find. So, it's supposed to be more like the tombs in the Valley of the Kings? I asked, referring to the cluster of tombs located on the other side of Deir el Bahri's cliffs. He nodded. Based on recent geologic studies, we are fairly certain of the location of the temple's buried main entrance. Main entrance? As in, not the only entrance? The professor's mouth quirked into a mysterious smile, an expression I was quickly growing fond of. You're quick, Ms. Larson. Dr. Ramirez warned me about that aspect of your character. Warned you? Last I checked, being quick wasn't a bad thing. Damn, my tongue was going to get me into trouble with him. He acquiesced with a dignified nod. You're correct, of course. I must remember not to underestimate you, though your youth and other attributes may lead me in that direction. I kept my face blank, pretty sure my new boss had just insulted and complimented me at the same time. 
His lips quirked again. Back to the issue of multiple entrances. You see, the tables indicate that our undiscovered temple connects to Jesser Jesseru. My mouth fell open, and I held up a hand. Jesser Jesseru, roughly meaning holiest of holies, was the ancient name of Queen Hatshepsut's mortuary temple. I couldn't believe that the most famous, visited, and explored temple in Deir el-Bahri contained an as-yet-undiscovered secret passage that led to an as-yet-undiscovered secret temple. You're kidding, right? That's impossible. Professor Bahur stared into my wide, stunned eyes with a complete lack of humor. You're not kidding? Oh my god. You're serious? He raised one eyebrow at my shocked redundancy. Placing both of my hands flat on the tabletop, I said, Let me get this straight. You think you can find a previously unknown temple that connects to Hatshepsut's mortuary temple? He gave a single, minute nod. But that would mean there's an undiscovered, secret passageway in Hattie's temple. That site's been scoured by, I don't know, everyone over the past century. It must draw more than a million visitors every year. How's that even possible? It would appear, Ms. Larson, that Hattie, the corner of his mouth twitched in amusement at my nickname for the famous female pharaoh, was a woman of many secrets. Her stepson and her architect did a very good job of covering them up. Your main role in this excavation, is to uncover those secrets, particularly the exact location of the entrance in her temple, as I've yet to have much luck. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god, I thought, and my nerves hummed with excitement. Professor Bahur had just handed me a task that pretty much every archaeologist would kill for, he made a low, knowing sound. It was annoyingly attractive. Yes. I thought you might enjoy that bit of information. This is unbelievable. Thank you so much. I practically laughed. You are quite welcome. It just so happens that your skill set is precisely what might crack the final riddle. You specialize in deciphering difficult ancient texts. We have difficult ancient to decipher, he said cheerily. Do keep in mind that you will need to do a fair amount of research in preparation for our departure. I nodded, brimming with anticipation. I would do almost anything to participate in his excavation. Professor Bahur continued, The university has been kind enough to set aside a classroom on the top floor of Denny Hall for the excavation team to plan and prep. I expect you'll spend most of the winter term there. I'd like you to come by on Monday morning so I can give you a key and introduce you to the rest of the team. Sure, what time? Half past eight should work nicely. Additionally, I've made arrangements with Dr. Ramirez for your graduate duties to be pushed aside. You won't need to teach students or complete any unrelated research projects. This excavation will function as your entire course of study for the next year. I need your focus uninterrupted. Is that acceptable? I was stunned. This enigmatic, visiting professor had spoken with my advisor and completely altered the next year of my life before he'd even met me at least officially. I felt a twinge of irritation that he hadn't consulted with me before rearranging the next year of my life, but the results were amazing enough that I ignored it. Yes, I think so. Thank you. Again, Professor Bahur. You're welcome. Again, Ms. Larson. I expect your participation will invigorate the excavation. Invigorate the excavation. What the hell does that mean? 
Along with uncovering the secrets of a long-dead queen, I anticipated uncovering the mysteries behind the confounding man sitting across from me. We discussed some of the more technical details of the excavation over the next several hours. During a lull in our conversation, Professor Bahur glanced around and then said, I'm afraid our meeting lasted longer than I'd anticipated, and night has fallen. I'd hate for you to have to walk home alone in the dark. Might I walk with you? Gazing through the narrow, floor-to-ceiling windows on the opposite wall, I found that the sun had indeed set, and twilight had come and gone. Oh, I hadn't noticed. Although the idea of a companion on my trip home was tempting, I didn't want to impinge on Professor Bahur's undoubtedly valuable time. You really don't need to walk me home, I told him, but for a reason I didn't understand at all. I wanted him to. I should have been running for the hills after what happened with Mike, but I felt an overwhelming amount of trust for the professor. I shook my head the barest amount. Yep, I've officially lost it. Professor Bahur lifted his coat from the back of his chair and shrugged into it. Really, Miss Larson, there is a great deal of difference between want and need. I'd expect someone of your advanced academic experience to be familiar with the disparity. Standing, I blushed at the idea of him wanting anything non-academic from me and used arranging my coat and scarf as a shield. All right, but only if you want to, I said, attempting to keep the teasing tone on the friendly range. I assume, then, that a combination of want and need are acceptable, he said with a severely polite air, the sharp sparkle in his eyes the only hint of playfulness. One must always keep a watchful eye on those he needs in matters of business, and I couldn't possibly turn down the chance to spend more time in the company of such a lovely, knowledgeable colleague. He indicated the crooked path toward the door with a negligent gesture. After you, Miss Larson. Baffled again by his strange behavior, I slipped between the tables and headed for the door. I made sure to smile at Cassandra as I passed the counter. She glared back, her sour expression turning to honey as she looked at the man following me. Good night, Professor Bauer, she chirped. Cassandra, came his emotionless response. And though I wasn't looking at him, I pictured him giving her the slightest nod of acknowledgement. Once the door closed behind us, I smiled and glanced at the professor. You know, I think you might have just broken her heart with a single word. Yes, well, he said as he looked up into the cloudy night sky, a tired smile playing across his lips. I can't waste time and effort on every woman who desires my attention, Miss Larson. A curse of the beautiful, I suppose. As soon as the words left my mouth, I wished for them back. I was sure I'd just crossed a line in our newly established, mostly professional relationship. Professor Bahur chuckled and casually placed his hands in his coat pockets. A curse whose effects you must suffer from every day, he said, before turning to walk toward the nearest concrete path. I stood in place, dumbfounded. Does that man really think I'm beautiful? I was more of a shrug and a, yeah, she's pretty, kind of woman, and I was perfectly comfortable with the fact that I would never turn many heads or stand out in a room full of people. And then I remembered my current appearance, that I looked like I was suffering from some ghastly wasting sickness. He's just being nice, I realized. Miss Larson, are you coming? It is most difficult to walk you home when... I neither know the way, nor have you beside me, he called over his shoulder. I caught up quickly, noticing he'd been heading in the correct direction without my assistance. You seem to be doing just fine on your own. I live in the Malloy. Do you know it? Ah, uh, yes. 
How nice that you are able to reside in such a lovely building. I snorted. I don't know about that. I think it lost most of its loveliness half a century ago. After a moment, I said, Professor Bahur, how... Please, call me Marcus, he interrupted. It seems inappropriate for such an accomplished scholar to address me as a student would a teacher. But that's what we are, I countered. Ms. Larson, your status as a graduate student is a flaw that I'm certain will be corrected by the end of our excavation. Bristling, I recalled how neatly he'd rearranged the next year of my graduate career and stopped in my tracks. You know, I can earn my PhD, just like everyone else. With hard work and years of research, I don't need you to do me any favors, and I'd never accept a degree I haven't earned. When he turned to face me, his lips were parted in surprise. He retraced his steps until he stood so close that the condensation in his breath nearly touched me. You misunderstand me, he said evenly. I merely meant that I have great belief in your ability to use the excavation to finalize your degree. After the discoveries we'll make over the next twelve months, I can't imagine the university could hold back on granting your doctorate of philosophy. His nearness and height were slightly intimidating when paired with a chill in his voice. Oh, might we continue on? He asked, embarrassed and worried that I damaged any possibility of friendship. I blurted, I'm so sorry. I overreacted. I shouldn't have professed Marcus, he corrected, and it's already forgotten. Marcus. I agreed with a shy smile. You'll have to call me Lex, then. Very well, Lex. Now, I believe you were going to ask me something, he reminded me as we continued along the path. Oh, yeah. I'm sure you already have a plan for this, but how are you going to clear Hatshepsut's mortuary temple of visitors for months? The SCA will lose a ton of money. The SCA short for the Supreme Council of Antiquities, was the organization in charge of pretty much everything relating to ancient Egypt. I can't imagine them agreeing to give us exclusive access for the sake of scholarly discoveries. For the first time, Marcus smiled fully, and the beauty of his joy nearly made me stumble. Well, Lex, let's just say that I have friends in high places. Of course you do. Across the street from my building, we stopped, waiting for the crosswalk light to change. You don't need to cross with me. I'll be safe inside in less than a minute. Marcus turned to me, searching my face for something only he would recognize. Need and want, Miss Larson. Need and want. No hint of humor pervaded his words. He's certainly an odd one. I thought, but the sense of safety, of trust, had only increased during our walk. Seconds later, as we crossed the street, I grew increasingly curious about the man beside me. Who is he, besides an archaeologist? How did he make friends in such high places? How have I never heard of him? It was as though he'd simply appeared on the archaeology scene last month. That just doesn't happen. We stopped in front of my building's glass door, and Marcus waited while I fished through my bag for my keys. I felt a flash of anxiety as I remembered the last time I'd been standing in front of the same door. Seeming to sense my unease, Marcus took a few steps away. Miraculously, with the breathing space, calm returned. I unlocked the door and held it open with my body, half in and half out of the building. Thanks for keeping me company. Any time, he replied with a quick bow of his head. I'll see you bright and early on Monday. I smiled and nodded, retreating into the warmth of the building. For the briefest moment, I wondered what Marcus would have done if I'd invited him inside. My mom was still there, so the thought was purely hypothetical. Unfortunately, 
it triggered more memories of Mike, of being helpless to him, and I shuddered. Silently, I vowed never to date again. Chapter 10 Asleep and Awake Marcus lurked in my thoughts throughout my mom's delicious dinner of roast beef and mashed potatoes, as well as our evening screening of a covert ops action flick. Though I'd only been out of the apartment for a few hours, the exercise and excitement had exhausted me. From the looks my mom kept flashing me, my weariness was poorly hidden. Why don't you go to bed, sweetie? She suggested after she turned off the TV. You look like you're about to fall asleep, and you'll be more comfy in your room. Stretching on the couch, I yawned. Good idea. It didn't really matter that it was only nine o'clock. I gave her a hug, stood, and headed to my room. Good night, Mom, I said before closing the door. I had just enough energy to wash off the light makeup I donned for the meeting with Marcus, brush my teeth, and change into flannel pajama pants and a lavender t-shirt, displaying a cuddly cartoon version of the UW Husky. I slipped under the covers and fell asleep almost instantly. I was standing in a dark study filled with mahogany tables, built-in bookshelves, and rich leather furniture. I was surrounded by the spicy scent of cigars and cognac mixed with the musk of aged books. In the soft glow of a Tiffany lamp, a dark-haired man was leaning over a desk, his back to me. I moved closer, suspicion growing with each step. As I rounded the desk, my instinct proved true. Marcus Bahur. His face was taut with concentration as he studied photographs of hieroglyphs. I recognized most of them, but one specific set stood out beyond the others. The lion's head above a half circle, paired with a full circle, and two vertical parallel lines, one with a flag-like protrusion. It was the same set of symbols that had been evading my deciphering abilities for months. Makes sense, I mumbled, dismissing the pictures. My brain was just mashing together a bunch of the things that had been occupying my mind lately. Marcus leaned closer to one of the images, his expression changing. Two fine lines creased the space between his eyebrows, and his lips puckered minutely. For a moment, all I could think about was how much I wanted to truly know the mesmerizing man sitting before me. The same man who was handing me the career opportunity of a lifetime. Without preamble, the scene shifted in a dizzying swirl of colors. Marcus was the only constant in the chaos. Remaining seated, as the frenzied colors surrounded us, I became nauseated, and I had to close my eyes as I waited, hoping the endless swirling would stop. When I opened them again, I gasped. Marcus was still sitting in front of me, but on a short, gilded stool instead of an oversized desk chair. And he was shirtless. His golden brown skin glowed in soft firelight. Smooth lines of muscle led from his shoulders down to an intricately woven belt, which was holding up some sort of white linen garment. He stood suddenly, displaying his odd attire, a calf-length skirt. After seconds of confusion, I realized it was the Middle Kingdom royal kilt. I laughed out loud, accepting that my imagination was getting the best of me, combining my new fascination with the professor and all of the recent excitement about the excavation. I took one last lingering look at the immaculate physique my mind assigned to Marcus, then closed my eyes for a long moment, willing my consciousness to move on to another dream. Again, when I opened my eyes, the scene around me had transformed. I was in a long, arched stone corridor. Narrow, glassless windows lined the left side, letting in silvery moonlight. I almost screamed when I looked down at the floor. In the square of light coming through the nearest window lay a man, 
eyes open and sightless. There was a very deep gash cutting across his throat, and blood soaked to the front of what could only be called a once pale doublé. I looked up, away, anywhere but at the dead man. My eyes landed on a second body, further down the corridor, then another, and another. Shadows and moonlight had tricked my eyes at first, but once I started seeing them, the dead, I couldn't look away. There were so many. A dozen? More? Behind me, there was a masculine shout, closely followed by a grunt and a loud thump. It sounded like a fight. Is it whoever killed these people? I took several hasty steps in the opposite direction and promptly tripped, sprawling on the uneven stone floor. At first, I thought I'd caught my toe on one of the stones, but when I looked back, I realized it had been the dead man, the one with the cut throat. Ugh! I exclaimed, skin crawling. Carefully, I stood and started picking my way down the hallway, away from the sounds of men fighting. I just stepped over the sixth body, a beautiful, dark-haired woman in a burgundy and gold gown whose neck was bent at a very unnatural angle when I heard a guttural gasp and the sounds of fighting stopped. I froze. The sound of rusty hinges preceded footsteps and two low, whispering voices. They were behind me and getting louder. I found the alcove of a door a little further down on the right side of the corridor and hid in its shadows, pressing myself into the rough planks of wood. As the voices drew closer, I realized that one of the whisperers was male, the other female. I held my breath as they neared my hiding place. Too quick. I don't know how he keeps finding me, the woman whispered. She let out a harsh sob. Oh, God, Jane. I could just see the top half of her cloaked and hooded body as she dropped to her knees and bent over the woman with a broken neck. Her shoulders shook and she rocked back and forth, murmuring something to the dead woman. No, it's his fault, not yours, the man said fiercely, and I suddenly recognized his voice. Marcus. He gripped the woman's shoulders and raised her back up to her feet, then wrapped his arms around her middle, drawing my attention to her swollen belly. She was incredibly pregnant, which was pretty much the only thing I could tell about her under the cloak. She placed her hands over his on her belly and whispered, I don't know where to go. I thought this would be my last stop, but... Again, her body shook with the strength of her sorrow. I don't want to leave you again. Shh. Marcus's voice was soft, soothing. You must trust that you will find me. The woman turned in his arms and reached up a pale hand to cup the side of his face. I will always find you, my falcon, but for now, you must forget. As she said, forget, the look of adoration slipped off Marcus's face, and the woman withdrew her hand. A door banged open further down the corridor, and I turned my head to look. When I glanced back at Marcus and the cloaked woman, she was gone. There was only Marcus and a hallway filled with dead bodies. It was barely seven in the morning when I woke, well rested from a long night's sleep. I spent a few minutes lazily thinking back on my dreams, unsurprised that nearly all had featured Marcus. He was such a beautiful conundrum. My mind had been bound to latch on to him. Moving on to more practical matters, I stretched dislodging Thora from her cozy position by my thigh. I had tired too quickly the previous day, and I needed to get back into active scholar mode by Monday, only two days away. My worthiness as a team member on Marcus's excavation was at stake. As I rose from bed and readied myself for the day, I set out a plan, fully aware that the first part would be the hardest. Morning, sweetheart, my mom said when I emerged from my room, 
She didn't turn away from the stove as she spoke. Breakfast's just about ready. Is there coffee? I asked, giving her a hug from behind. She patted my forearm. Yep, in the pot. I kissed her cheek and pulled away, saying, Thanks, Mom. You're the best ever. Oh, stop it, Lex. You'll make me blush. Smiling, I fixed myself a cup of coffee with milk and sugar and shuffled to the table. Hold on, sweetie, come carry these plates over. Acquiescing, I helped my mom load the table with our fourth breakfast of way too much food. I'd pretty much accepted that my ability to gauge my own appetite had gone wonky, and I was content to let my mom fatten me up like a Thanksgiving turkey. The current layout included blueberry muffins and a small mountain of breakfast burritos, most of which I would probably end up consuming. Are you going somewhere? My mom asked, setting her coffee on the table and sitting in her usual spot. What? How'd you know? Your clothes, Lex. You're already dressed. Usually that doesn't happen until at least noon, if ever. Laughing, I shook my head. Yeah, I have some errands I need to run on campus. Some books to renew at the library, a little research to do. You know, the usual. I lied. I thought the quarter hadn't started yet. My heartbeat sped up, and I felt guilty for the coming lies. Necessary lies. No, you're right, but that's the life of a grad student, working on research projects even though the rest of the school's on break. Plus, with the excavation. She sighed, clearly preferring that I stay on the couch for another day of mom-monitored relaxation and recuperation. Do you want me to come with you? While I'd love your company, Mom, you'd be bored to death. Plus, I'll be able to do everything faster on my own. You'll just be on campus. Yeah, I said, cringing on the inside. Damn, I hate lying to her. Well, I know I can't tell you no. You're an adult. But promise me you'll come home right away if you feel yourself getting worn out. I smiled feeling like a worthless piece of donkey crap. Of course, Mom. After breakfast, I gathered a few necessary items into my messenger bag, including my wallet and bus pass, a black spiral-bound journal, and my hospital release papers, and then left the apartment. I crossed the street to the Burke-Gilman Trail, which circumscribes the southeast edges of the university and followed it straight to the hospital at the south end of campus. Dr. Issa owed me some answers. Unfortunately, when I reached the hospital's info desk and asked the stick-thin nurse manning it where I could find Dr. Issa, the results were anticlimactic. Dr. Issa, do you know the doctor's first name? She asked. Um, no, but she was my doctor in ICU last week. The receptionist narrowed her eyes, scrutinizing me. Are you sure you were in ICU last week? Glad I'd come prepared, I pulled the release papers out of my bag and set them on the counter. I was, see? I pointed to the release date, just in case she missed it. Hmm. She turned to her computer screen, her skeletal fingers clacking the keys rhythmically, as she searched the database for my records. Ah, yes. I see your Dr. Issa. What do you need? Barely suppressing my excitement, I said, I need to ask her some questions about some personal medical diagnosis she made. The nurse tapped her keyboard a few more times before responding. Well, she's not here. Your records show you had another doctor assigned to you. He's in the hospital right now. Do you want me to page him? I frowned. Uh, no. I really just need to talk to Dr. Issa. Do you know when she'll be working again? The nurse's smile was condescending. I'm sorry, but she's not here anymore. I mean, at the hospital. She no longer works here. Instantly, the hope-filled balloon that had been expanding inside my chest started to deflate as frustration and despair poked little holes in its surface. What about my answers? Trying not to sound too defeated, I thanked the nurse, 
and left through the automatic sliding doors, hurrying to the bus stop. I had one more lead, and I wasn't ready to give up all my hope. Miraculously, one of the many buses heading to Capitol Hill, my current destination, was just opening its doors as I reached the stop. I waited in line behind a bearded man who desperately needed a shower. A tired-looking woman in blue scrubs and a young punk rocker with spiked electric blue hair, multiple facial piercings, and heavy black eyeliner. The last smiled at me while nodding to the beat of whatever music blared through his earbuds. I assessed my reflection in one of the bus's windows, wondering what exactly had endeared the young man to me, and found a surprisingly flushed version of myself staring back. The rosiness in my cheeks and lips, paired with my dark mahogany hair and alabaster skin, made me resemble a modern-day Snow White. I hadn't really looked at my reflection in days, and this was a vast improvement from the skeletal stranger I'd seen the last time. Smiling slightly, I stepped onto the bus, showed the driver my pass, and found a solitary seat in the middle. Astonishing me further, my eye-catching admirer sat beside me and removed his black and purple earbuds. Hey, he said, his voice unexpectedly deep. Hi? Your eyes are really cool. Are they, like, contacts or something? Uh, no, they're just my eyes, I said, confused. He laughed, his smile wide, and his pale eyes earnest. He was really quite adorable. If I looked past the many holes and markings modifying his appearance, they're practically red, and they're like that naturally? That's way more awesome than contacts. Natural's cool. I nearly snorted, thinking my new friend and natural didn't belong in the same room, or even the same country. I thought back to the reddish tint to my brown eyes I'd noticed several days earlier, and wondered if the red had become even more prominent. Can a person's eye color even change like that? Why hasn't mom said anything? Yours aren't too bad. I said, wanting to take the attention off myself. They're so pale. He leaned in conspiratorially and whispered, They're fake. Oh, I said, laughing. What's their natural color? Hazel. Boring. I nudged his shoulder with my own. Hazel's not boring. It's multicolored. Besides, I read that it makes people seem more approachable because Hazel's a warm eye color. He barked a laugh. Oh, you're funny. I doubt changing my eye color would do much to improve my approachability. He stood and flashed another brilliant smile as the bus slowed to a halt. This is me. See you around, red-eyed girl. Sure. I watched him disembark, his demeanor reverting to the expected sullen and angry. But I knew better. After three more stops, we reached mine at Broadway and Thomas. I pulled the cord and waited for the bus to stop, then exited through the rear door. Emerald City Fertility sat tucked inconspicuously between Harold's body art and an adorable Irish pub aptly named The End of the Rainbow. Depending on my luck in the clinic, I thought I might end up sitting on a stool in the rainbow in an hour or two. Taking a deep breath, I approached a glass door stenciled with Emerald City Fertility in clean white lettering and pulled it open. I had to climb a narrow set of stairs to reach the fertility clinic's nearly empty second floor waiting room. Only a young couple occupied two of the cushioned chairs, holding hands as they nervously examined their surroundings. Can I help you? A young, blonde receptionist asked. I wondered if she ever had issues with her hair sticking to the pink lip gloss smothered on her lips. I hope so, I said, approaching the desk. I'd like to talk to Dr. Lee. I don't have an appointment, but I can wait if he can squeeze me in between patients. She smiled indulgently, looking like an all-American cheerleader, and explained, Dr. Lee doesn't usually see anyone without an appointment. 
If you'd like to make an appointment for a later date, we can schedule that now. We usually start with a two-hour consultation that includes both partners. Partners? Consultation? Oh, I am not here as a patient, I clarified. My mom was. I guess you could say I wouldn't be alive without Dr. Lee. I've been meaning to stop by for years, and I was in the neighborhood, so I guess I thought I'd just come in and thank him. Lying was becoming as natural to me as breathing. It disgusted me. The receptionist's expression transformed as I spoke, turning from fake warmth to genuine excitement. Really? We barely get to see the children as adults. I'm sure he'd be delighted. Can you wait here while I check with him? Sure. She hurried down the hallway and disappeared around a corner, returning less than a minute later. If you'll follow me, Ms. Larson, Alexandra Larson. Ms. Larson, I'm going to put you in the consultation room. Dr. Lee will join you in a few minutes. Thank you. I sat on a comfortable couch, set against the wall on the left side of the room, and took out my journal. I started writing down questions that might give me some hints about my biological father. I had nearly a dozen listed when the door opened, admitting a dignified, middle-aged man with gray-winged hair and a kind face. His slacks and dress shirt made him appear more like a lawyer than a doctor. Alexandra Larson. I'm Dr. Lee. His tone was friendly, his voice deep. Standing, I accepted his outstretched hand, noting its dry warmth, and smiled. Hello, Dr. Lee. It's so nice to meet you. Well, we've actually met, but it was a long time ago, and you were about this tall, he said, holding his hand less than two feet above the blue carpet. I laughed and sat back down. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know. Of course not. I remember your parents well. Lovely people. He sat down in a leather chair across from me, a medical file resting on his lap. So, what can I do for you, Alexandra? Well, I wanted to thank you for helping my parents and, I guess, helping me. He smiled modestly. You're more than welcome. Helping young families is my passion. I hesitated, holding my breath, and then expelled it in one long question. Dr. Lee, is it possible for you to tell me anything about my biological father, even though, you know, there are privacy agreements and whatnot? His smile widened a little. I have yet to meet a child created through artificial methods who didn't wonder that very thing. Unfortunately, as you've already pointed out, there are privacy and confidentiality issues. I slumped against the back of the couch. The doctor held up a hand with his index finger extended. However, I can tell you a little bit about him, just not his identifying information. He opened the file and began reading. Twenty-five at the time his sample was collected. He had light brown hair, hazel eyes, and a pale complexion. He was six feet tall and had a lean body type. My eyes were wide with surprise at the sudden flow of information, but I still felt unfulfilled. He sounds just like my dad, who I don't resemble at all. Yes, that's the point. We try to match the surrogate with the legal father. I can also tell you, I could hear the doctor's voice continuing on as he further described my supposed biological father's attributes, but I was distracted by a sudden blurring of my vision. The man in that folder is not my father, I thought. I knew it with absolute certainty, like I knew the sound of my mom's voice before she started crying, or the smell in the air before it snowed. For several nauseating seconds, the world disappeared into a swirl of colors before resettling. I was standing in the center of the fertility clinic's dark waiting room. It must have been the middle of the night, as the only illumination came from the glitter of city lights through the windows. 
I was pretty sure I was having another one of the weird dreams, but I was also fairly certain that I hadn't fallen asleep. Did I faint? I had no idea what the hell was going on. A click sounded, and the door from the stairs to the clinic creaked open. A tall, sleek man with pale skin and black hair entered the room. I rushed to the receptionist's desk, searching for anything with a date. A calendar taped to a lower cupboard caught my eye. The office staff, bless their little administrative hearts, crossed off the days as they passed. It was almost exactly nine months before I was born. The intruder headed down the hall to the furthest door. Its polished wooden surface bore a golden placard with Dr. James Lee etched in black. The man entered the office and headed straight for the doctor's desk. Remaining standing, he looked through a short stack of files, pulled one out, opened it, and ran his finger down the top page. Joining him at the desk, I was baffled by his ability to see well enough to read in the darkness. I took out my phone and flashed its light on the file. It was labeled Larson, Alice, my mom's name. I frowned. Having evidently found what he was searching for, the man replaced the folder and snuck out of the room. Following him, I couldn't help but wonder how common alarm systems had been two and a half decades ago. Obviously, the clinic hadn't been equipped with one. The man approached another door, this one designated Laboratory. After he entered, he turned on the lights and headed for two glass-doored freezers on the opposite side of the lab. I peeked over his shoulder as he opened one and searched its contents. He removed a small, round glass container and replaced it with an exact replica. On the side, there was a white sticker with FCM0812 for Alice Larson, written on it in black permanent marker. I was getting the uncomfortable feeling that the sample-swapping man was my actual biological father. I was really trying not to acknowledge that I was staring at his semen in the replacement container. Gross. Abruptly, the man turned and nearly black eyes stared out from strikingly familiar features. My eyes, aside from the color, high cheekbones, and square jaw were reflected on the stranger's face. Oh my God. I was absolutely certain that the breaking and entering semen replacer was my father. Within seconds, he was trotting out the lab door. He hurried back to the waiting room, out through the clinic door, and was down the stairs and vanishing into the night before I could fully process what had just happened. And I can tell you with certainty that he's successful in what he does now. You most definitely received the best genes available. You're a lucky woman, Alexandra, the doctor stated, finishing his description of a man I wasn't remotely related to. I blinked, clearing the remnants of the vision and steadying my shock. Dr. Lee, thank you so much, I said, hoping my gratitude was appropriate for the words I hadn't heard. I really didn't expect you to be so generous with your information. You're a very kind man. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, and you're welcome, he said, sounding a little flustered. I smiled, hoping he couldn't tell my heart wasn't in it. I should go. You have a sweet young couple waiting for your help, and I don't want to keep you from them any longer. Did I really just see my biological father in a dream while I was awake? I need to get the hell out of here. Well, you're right. His smile was genuine as he stood. I'm glad you stopped by. It's nice to know one's work is appreciated. Oh, believe me, doctor. Your work is appreciated as much as any can be. You're too kind. He escorted me out of the clinic, shaking my hand again at the top of the stairs. My heart rate was nearing Olympic sprinter levels by the time I stepped out into the damp midday air. Adrenaline was coursing through my bloodstream, 
fueled by the excitement and insanity of what I'd just seen. My biological father. Breaking into a fertility clinic, replacing sperm samples. In a goddamn vision. It can't be real, I thought. But the dreams, visions, had proven true multiple times before. It can't be real, but it has to be real. People believed contradictory, even hypocritical things every day. But this was really pushing the boundaries. I wish I could talk to Dr. Issa. She knows something. I know she does. Feeling like a crazy person, I headed for the bus stop across the street. A painted shop sign behind the stop caught my attention. The Goddess's Blessing. Based on the items displayed in the wide front window, it specialized in the unexplainable, from the mysterious to the magical, and of course, fortunes. Well, it just so happened that I was dealing with something pretty unexplainable at the moment. Maybe someone in there can explain it, I thought, as I veered around the bus stop, determination lengthening my strides. It was either that or accept that I'd flown so far over the cuckoo's nest that I'd mistaken it for a rainbow. After all, the dreams that I dared to dream really were coming true. Chapter 11 Discovery and Acquisition A crystalline chiming punctuated my entrance into the cluttered shop. I'd been expecting a dark and mysterious space, with shadowed nooks overflowing with eerie objects and ancient leather tomes, but I was surprised by its warm, welcoming atmosphere. Bookshelves lined the walls, many filled with shiny new paperbacks. A rainbow of crystals and tiny glass bottles decorated several bookcases from floor to ceiling each item with its own sign proclaiming this or that mystical property. Tables were arranged close together throughout the shop, displaying spicy incense, aromatic candles, and a variety of odd items I would have been hard-pressed to identify. The cheerful atmosphere was somewhat of a letdown for my first venture into an occult shop. Is it too much to ask for a few shrunken heads and some eye of newt? Can I help you, miss? A woman asked, her voice husky. I nearly dropped the statuette I'd picked up. A beautiful carved representation of Thora's namesake, the powerful Egyptian goddess Hathor. Um, yes, I said, gently placing the pale, beautiful woman back on her pedestal. Are you a practitioner? The shopkeeper asked as I turned to face her. She fit the shop perfectly, with her flowy, ankle-length skirt, layers of clattering gold bracelets and wavy black hair that nearly reached her waist. She wasn't overtly attractive, but her curves in all the right places, paired with her rich voice and graceful movements, gave her an air of sensuality and mystery. Am I a practitioner? Of what? Witchcraft? Not exactly. I'm here on research for a graduate project. I'm a PhD student in the archaeology department over at the U. She studied me with eyes so dark they were nearly black before saying, Mostly true, but I don't think you're here for a project. I frowned, wondering how she had guessed that. Many people come here under the guise of some other purpose, she said, seeming to answer my thoughts. I'll answer your questions to the best of my ability, if you tell me why you're really in my shop. I weighed my options and decided that it wouldn't hurt me to divulge my story, or at least some of my story. After all, it was the reason I'd entered in the first place. With a heavy sigh, I nodded. All right, she purred. Follow me. Swaying, she led me through a curtain of multi-hued glass beads and into a cramped back room 
that had clearly been decorated with fortune-telling in mind. There was a small square table of polished oak, several dim antique lamps, and a short bookshelf filled with tarot cards, leather-bound books, and other tools of the trade. A teenage version of the shop owner was sitting at the table, rapt attention on her phone. She cocked her head inquisitively at our arrival, but didn't look up. Cat, go watch the counter. I have some business with this customer. The teenager, Cat, rolled her eyes before standing and exiting the room with a huff. Your daughter? I asked, amused. Do you have children? I shook my head, surprised by her question. I'd advise that you spend some time remembering your teenage self before reproducing. If you can't stand the idea of being around that version of yourself for more than a few hours, you're not ready, the shopkeeper replied. I heard that, Mom, Cat called from the front of the store. My hostess pointedly raised one artful eyebrow. Please have a seat. She took her daughter's place while I sat in the wooden chair opposite her. Thanks for agreeing to speak with me, I said after a long silent moment. It wasn't much of a conversation starter, but it was the best I could come up with under pressure. With a knowing smile, she said, I'm sure it will be enlightening for us both. Now, what brought you here? I pursed my lips, considering the best way to start. I guess you could say I'm looking for answers, or an explanation. You see, I've been experiencing something sort of odd. Odd how? she asked, resting her clasped hands on the table. Well, it's these dreams I've been having, except... I just had one, and I was awake, which doesn't really make sense, does it? And they're not dreams exactly, but more like visions. I mean, some are things I've witnessed in my life, but some happened before I was born, and this is going to sound totally nuts. Some haven't even happened yet, but they're all real. As I spoke, my companion sat up straighter, evidently intrigued. What makes you think it's anything beyond an active imagination? What makes it real? I leaned forward, intent on making the woman, a stranger, believe me. If she believed me without thinking I was crazy, maybe I could too. Because I know things, I said. Things I shouldn't know. Things I couldn't know. I dreamed something bad would happen to me, and it happened exactly as I saw it. If you knew it would happen, why didn't you try to change it? I laughed bitterly. I thought I was just anxious. It didn't seem possible that I could see the future in my dreams. You said it's not always a dream, that you've been awake for these visions? Yeah, just once, about fifteen minutes ago. She leaned back in her chair, studying me, her generous lips pressed together in a flat line. After a protracted silence, she asked, You want to know what's happening to you, correct? Yes. Eager, I licked my lips. She knows something. She has to. I've heard of people with abilities like this. Usually, it's genetic. She paused, have you spoken with your parents about it? Frustrated, I shook my head. My mom doesn't know about any of it. She'd tell me if she did, and I don't know who my father is. Mom! Cat called from the front of the shop. Just a minute! The woman across the table from me yelled back. To me, she said, Your situation is odd, like you said, but there are others like you out there. It's standard for your kind to learn about such things from their families. I'm amazed you've slipped through the cracks for so long. My kind? What are you talking about? My hands gripped the edge of the table so firmly that my nail beds were turning white. The muffled sound of Cat's voice, along with a deeper male voice, grew louder from beyond the beaded curtain. 
yes, you're kind. The woman seemed to be struggling with something as she stared into my eyes. Her head turned toward the doorway, and almost inaudibly, she whispered, I'm truly sorry, but I can't tell you more. Just know there are others like you, and they will find you. But you... Cat's pleading whine sounded from just outside the back room. But she's busy right now. My dear girl, your mother is never too busy for me. You know that. I must see her immediately. A familiar, faintly accented voice said, Oh, you have got to be kidding me. Hey! Kat's outraged admonition came just before a well-dressed man walked through the beaded curtain, making the pieces of glass clack excitedly. His eyes widened when they met mine, then narrowed slightly as he turned to my hostess. Marcus? I asked, stunned. He was the last person I would have expected to run into at a quirky magic shop, and seeing him triggered a deluge of the images from the previous night's dreams. Oh, God. Those were just dreams, right? I shook my head, suddenly afraid I would start to suspect all of my dreams were visions. I cleared my throat. What are you doing here? Kat and her mother wore identical expressions of surprise. I could ask you the same thing. The corner of Marcus's mouth quirked slightly. Is Genevieve reading your cards? Or perhaps your poem? She's earned quite the reputation as a reader of fortunes. She specializes in past lives, you know. Irked that he'd avoided my question, I responded in kind. Is that why you're here? Want to peek into a crystal ball? Marcus laughed out loud, finding unexpected humor in the question. No, definitely not. Genevieve here is quite skilled at acquiring certain rare, moderately illicit antiquities. Slowly, I stood and backed into a corner, looking from Marcus to Genevieve and back. You deal in black market artifacts? Both of you? That's... That's... I couldn't finish the statement, my mind reeling at the implications. Over the past two millennia, innumerable pieces of archaeological evidence had been destroyed or stolen as a result of the antiquity's black market. So much of the ancient world had been lost because of it, because of people like Marcus and Genevieve. I don't think I can... can do... Marcus strode around the table, stopped at arm's length away from me, and placed his hands on my upper arms. I didn't know when we'd become touching friends, and I wasn't sure how I felt about the new development. In his present, looming state, I was leaning toward not so great. The memories of Mike attempting to force himself on me were still too fresh. Marcus leaned down, so his eyes were closer to my level, and his expression changed from haughtiness to concern. Lex, the black market is a necessary evil. You have to understand that if you want to make it in our field, it already exists, and the only way to save bits and pieces of the artifacts floating around in its torrents is to join in. I promise you... I only rescue artifacts from greedy hands. I never give them any. The intensity of his words chipped away at my anger and fear. And her? I whispered, flicking my eyes to the woman, still sitting at the small table. What does she do? He smiled wolfishly, but his tone matched mine in softness. She's like me rescuing the most important pieces. Shaking his head, he added, The disparity between value and importance has always amused me. What do you... Later, he interrupted and dropped his hands, turning to face Genevieve and Kat. 
I need to take care of some quick business with Jen. Then I'll explain everything. Genevieve raised her delicate eyebrows. Well, maybe not everything, Marcus corrected, smirking. Unintentionally, I wondered if Marcus and Genevieve were more than business acquaintances, if he felt comfortable enough to barge in on one of her private meetings with a customer, and she could ask him a question by simply raising her eyebrows. Surely there was something else between them. The thought caused an unexpected vice to squeeze my heart, making it throb with an emotion I wasn't used to. Jealousy. Where did that come from? Looking at the floor, I said, I'll wait out front, and rushed out of the room. Cat followed me, retreating to a stool behind the checkout counter. As I perused the shop, I could practically feel her laser-like glare piercing my skin. Something wrong? I asked, pointedly. I found the small, grayish-white Hathor carving again, and held it up, examining its exquisite detail. I would have guessed it really was over 4,000 years old, if any old kingdom Egyptian alabaster pieces had ever been carved with so much detail. The goddess's lithe, feminine body, carved so she was eternally standing with one foot stepping forward, fit perfectly in the palm of my hand. Her exquisite face stared back at me with such determination, I almost expected her to open her mouth and make some godly demand. Still glaring, Kat grumbled, Are you, like, going out with him or something? It took me a few seconds to shift all of my attention to her. Am I dating Marcus? I asked, incredulous. Yeah, Kat said, rolling her eyes and sighing dramatically. I snorted. Definitely not. We work together. Oh, she brightened noticeably, straightening from her slouched position. I hesitated, worried I wouldn't be able to conceal my unreasonable jealousy if I asked the question I wanted to ask, but I couldn't resist. Your mom seems to have a a uh, connection with him. Is there something between them? Giggling, Kat hopped off her stool and skipped around the counter to join me. She was built like her mom, curves everywhere they should be, just not quite so filled out. If it weren't for her outfit, she easily could have passed as an undergrad. As it was, her white, neon-splashed t-shirt, black skinny jeans, and bright green chucks placed her in high school maybe as a junior or senior. Her long, nearly black hair was twisted up into a high, messy bun, and the multiple piercings in her ears were filled with a variety of gemstone studs. No, she whispered, but Mom totally wishes there was. I mean, damn, who wouldn't? He's totally, like, the hottest guy I've ever seen. Ever. It doesn't even matter that he's so old. I laughed. I couldn't help it. There was no way Marcus was beyond his mid-thirties, but to a teen, I knew that could seem ancient. How much is this? I asked, holding up the carving. I'd come to the highly improbable conclusion that the little goddess wasn't a reproduction, but was actually the real deal. What she was doing in the shop, on a table of artful junk, was beyond me. Cat bit her glossed lip. Um, that's one of the special items. I have to ask my mom. So it really is authentic. I knew it. Ask me what? Genevieve asked, her rich voice startling us both as she walked through the beaded curtain and joined us in front of the shop. I was surprised Marcus hadn't followed her out. Maybe he's busy buttoning his pants, I thought snidely, and then I mentally slapped myself. Not mine. Off limits. Get a goddamn grip. The cost of the statuette, I explained, holding up the small carving for her to see. Genevieve pursed her lips and squinted before coming to a decision. Take it. No cost. Kat's mouth fell open. But, Mom! A firm hand gesture from her mother quieted the teenager. Consider it an apology gift, since I can't give you the information you seek. 
it seems to want to be with you anyway. It's fitting. By the time Marcus emerged from the back room, my newly acquired artifact was wrapped in a soft, pale green cloth, fitted into a gift box, and tucked into a small, dark purple bag. Thank you, I said to Kat and Genevieve, briefly raising the little paper sack. Of course, the mother replied, while her daughter ogled Marcus. He approached me, amusement tugging at the corners of his mouth. Did you purchase something? Perhaps a good luck charm? Or a love potion? Not exactly, I replied coyly. I'll show you later. Maybe. My nonchalance was all a bluff. There was no way I could withstand bragging about my little Hathor carving, but I could drag it out for a little while, make him wait. What had only been a hint of a smile turned into a full-blown grin. Ah, Lex, I am so looking forward to the coming year. I blinked. That most certainly had not been the reaction I'd expected. Before I could respond, Marcus turned to Genevieve and her daughter. A pleasure, as always, Genevieve, Katarina. He gave each a slight nod and placed his hand against the small of my back, ushering me toward the door. Even through my peacoat and sweater, the contact felt extremely intimate. Goodbye. It was nice to meet you both, I called over my shoulder. And you, Genevieve said. Oddly, she sounded relieved. Once outside, Marcus and I had to huddle together in the entrance's alcove to avoid the rain. It had been drizzling earlier, but that had turned into a rare winter tempest. You said you'd tell me more about your forays into the illegal artifact trade, I said loudly snuggling deeper into my scarf. Marcus leaned in, negating the need to shout. Yes, of course, Lex, but not here, unless you prefer huddling together in this godforsaken portion of the city. I wouldn't say I dislike it, exactly. You'd better not say, I'll tell you later, I said, deepening my voice and attempting poorly to mimic his accent. You seem like an I'll-tell-you-later kind of guy. He scowled slightly, confirming my suspicion. Leaning in a little closer, Marcus said, Might I suggest we take refuge in my car? Who the hell talks like that? I wondered, but nodded with enthusiasm anyway. I was equally as excited about the prospect of dryness as the promise of answers. Where'd you park? He pointed to an unbelievably suave, gunmetal gray coupe parked three cars away on our side of the street. Staring at it, I tried, with all of my mental power, to make the thing turn into something more realistic, like a Toyota or a Ford. Who the hell are you? James Bond? Marcus held his arm out toward the car, pressing a button on a tiny remote. Not quite. Shall we? The car's lights blinked once, and Marcus strolled into the rain. Based solely on his walk, I would have assumed it was a sunny summer day. I waited until he had almost reached the car, then burst out of hiding and hustled toward its promised dryness. Much to my surprise, Marcus headed straight for the passenger door and held it open for me. What are you doing? It's pouring! You're getting soaked. Go get in, I shouted, making a shooing motion as I neared the car. Against my commands, he waited until my soggy self was safely nestled in the dark gray interior. It was the most monochromatic car I'd ever seen. From the paint to the leather to the dash, everything was the darkest of grays. Sliding into the driver's side a moment later, Marcus shrugged and smiled knowingly. It's only a little rain. Nothing to get so worked up over. Now show me what you procured from our mistress witch. Hugging the damp bag against my stomach, I bargained. Only after you tell me about this black market stuff, 
I don't want to get involved in anything that'll ruin my career before it even starts. Marcus studied me for a moment, then sighed and settled in his seat, resting the back of his head against the headrest. With closed eyes, he explained, It's really more of a gray market than black. Many of the participants are trying to help save artifacts that would otherwise be lost to know-nothings or thieves, or that would be destroyed by a lack of proper care. All successful archaeologists have some dealings with the antiquities black market, so you'll need to get over this little moral dilemma of yours. Millions of priceless artifacts are already out there, in the hands of people who can only harm them. Part of our job is to protect any evidence left from the past, and sometimes that includes searching through illicit streams. He sounded like he was lecturing a dim-witted pupil. And you've never sold any of your findings to the highest illegal bidder? I asked. He scowled, keeping his eyes closed, and I used the moment to study the clean lines of his profile. To my eyes, it was proportioned to masculine perfection, with a strong nose, full lower lip and broad chin. The contours of his stubbled jaw and prominent cheekbone were emphasized by the slight hollowing of his cheek. There was nothing pretty about him, but rugged or handsome weren't the right words to describe him either. He was striking and sexy as all hell and off limits, I reminded myself. Without warning, he opened his eyes and turned his face to me, catching me staring. I blushed, hoping the storm's darkness masked my embarrassment. Marcus's eyes, black-rimmed amber, seemed to blaze in the car's dim interior. I couldn't look away. No, he said. No? No what? I asked, confused, smiling faintly. He held my eyes. No, I've never sold any pieces to the highest bidder. I don't deal legs. I buy. Oh, that's good. Looking into his eyes for too long was like staring at a solar eclipse, sure to cause blindness. Or at least it felt that way. I blinked slowly seeking a respite from their natural intensity. When I fixed my gaze on him again, the corners of his mouth were turned down in the faintest of frowns. For some reason, he was frustrated. I cleared my throat. You said something earlier in the store that I didn't quite understand. What did I say? He asked, the tension in his face easing. You said the difference between value and importance amuses you. What did you mean? I really was curious, but the true motive behind my question was to distract him from whatever I'd done to trigger such frustration. Ah, uh, yes. You see, many of the wealthy love to collect antiquities because they want to impress their friends, for the most part, as you know. They haven't the faintest clue as to how to preserve what they acquire. Fortunately for you and I, most of them don't really know anything about their illegally gained pieces, other than that they came from some famous excavation or they're made of precious materials. But people like us, we desire the items of importance, those that tell us some vital piece of information about the past. The artifacts we usually hunt on the black market are rarely the most valuable in the eyes of collectors. I listened closely and nodded when he finished. That makes sense. Kind of like people who buy a really expensive bottle of wine for the brand, not realizing that the actual wine might not be as good as the wine in a much cheaper bottle, I said using some of the knowledge my winemaker dad had instilled in me growing up. Precisely, Marcus agreed. Okay. The rain had decreased to the usual soft drizzle, and I reached for the door handle. Lex, 
Marcus said before I opened the door. Where are you going? To the bus stop? I thought I'd head home. When I saw the confusion wrinkling his brow, I added, I'm kind of tired. It's been a long morning. Ah, uh, I am on my way back to campus. I'll give you a ride. Oh, thanks. I'd appreciate that, I said, truly grateful. I really hadn't been looking forward to heading back out into the rain. Marcus's responding smile was mischievous as he started the car. Besides, we have to finish our game of show and tell. I told you about the black market. He said the last two words like they were the name of a scary monster. Now, it's your turn to show me what's in the bag. I laughed. I almost forgot. The look he gave me as he pulled away from the curb seemed to say, I'm sure, with heavy sarcasm. As he drove, I pulled the little box out of the bag and lifted its lid. The carving was swaddled like a mummy in layer after layer of soft cloth, but I managed to unwrap it eventually. I studied the miniature goddess in the dim midday light. She was unusual for a Hathor depiction, though the traditional Ankh was dangling from her fingers at her side, and her head was crowned with the usual graceful cow horns, cradling a sun disc, she was also holding a wedjat, an eye of Horus, in front of her stomach. I'd been examining the statuette so intently that I hadn't noticed the car stop. Looking up, I saw the bright red light of a stoplight and could feel Marcus's eyes on me. See? I said, holding Hathor up for his inspection. He breathed in sharply. Lex, where did you get that? His voice held a chill I didn't understand. Uh, you're kidding, right? From Genevieve's shop? He waved my obvious explanation away. I know that. I meant, where in her store was she keeping it? This is the type of thing she usually reserves for me. I puffed up, excited that I'd found something Marcus wanted, and I'd found it first. It was on one of the tables. Isn't she beautiful? Yes, quite, he said softly. We were moving again, the road drawing his attention away from the carving in my hand. Can you tell what the stone is? I asked, testing him. Alabaster. True Egyptian alabaster. Damn. And what's unusual about it, aside from the amazing detail, I mean? Her accessories. Double damn. What period is it from? Old Kingdom. Sixth Dynasty. You got all of that from a ten-second glance? I asked, dumbfounded. Again, if those were the observation skills of a truly talented archaeologist, then I had no business in the discipline. No. I scoffed. So, what? You've seen it before? Yes. Which, much to my annoyance, meant I hadn't found it first. Where? When? That's not fair. He rolled over my indignation as if it were non-existent. She belonged to my sister. Again, I was stunned. Your sister? Where'd she get it? And why the heck did she give it away? She acquired the statuette a long time ago, though I don't know from where. And she didn't give it away. He paused, frowning. She... Ah, uh, many of her things were shuffled around, and many were lost after she died. Oh... Marcus, I... I swallowed several times, unsure of what to say. I wanted to know where Marcus's sister had obtained the statuette, but it really wasn't the time to ask. I'm sorry, I didn't know. Bringing the car to a stop, Marcus said, I never expected he would. He looked at me, a small, sad smile on his face. It was a very long time ago. Don't waste your sympathy on me. But enough, Lex. I'm not fond of talking about her. He shifted his eyes to stare out the windshield. We're here. Surprised, 
I looked around and found my brick apartment building just beyond the passenger side window. I'd been so focused on Marcus and the carving that I probably wouldn't have noticed if we'd run over someone during the drive. I turned back to him, holding up the statuette. You should take this. It was your sister's, and he reached over, plucked Hathor out of my grasp, and began re-wrapping her in the pale green cloth. He tucked the bundle in the gift box, and that in the bag, then set it on my lap. No, she belongs to you now. Finally, he met my eyes again. Just take good care of her. I nodded, my mouth dry. I... Um, I cleared my throat. Okay, thank you. And thanks for the ride. You're quite welcome. As I exited his car, I thought back on the eventful day. Lex, Marcus called out before I could shut the door. I poked my head back into the car. Yeah? See you on Monday. I smiled. Bye, Marcus. Chapter 12 Aha! And Ah! After a tearful goodbye hug, I left my mom in my apartment, knowing she would be gone by the time I returned. The farewell was bittersweet. My eagerness to begin working with the excavation team, mixed with a longing for the days when my mom was always waiting for me when I got home. She'd always been a safe place, a comforting embrace, and having her stay with me after the Mike incident had been exceptionally therapeutic. Unfortunately, it also seemed to have reverted my emotional state to that of a 12-year-old. In my morning prep, I had been surprised by my reflection. My face had abandoned the gauntness of several days past, but retained the almost feverish coloring. My cheeks were still noticeably rosy, and my lips were so pink that they contrasted starkly with my pale, blemish-free skin. And my eyes. They still teetered on the precipice between brown and red, a far more conspicuous color than they'd been a week earlier. For the most part, I credited the changes to excitement. However, my eyes still troubled me. On the walk to Denny Hall, I did nothing to suppress the cheerful bounce in my step. Before I bounded up the three flights of stairs to the top floor, I considered stopping by Dr. Ramirez's office for a quick hello, but I opted not to. I needed to start working on the excavation like I needed air. When I reached the rarely used fourth floor, I peeked into each consecutive darkened classroom and a few of the smaller offices. The narrow, windowless hallway zigzagged around the floor like a well-planned maze, giving the odd impression that the building was larger on the inside than it had seemed from the outside. When I approached the second-to-last classroom door, I noticed a laminated sign taped to the front with The Pit, written in very bold over a wet junk. Since the well-known symbol of Horace's eye was second only to an ankh and representing all things ancient Egyptian to the masses, I was pretty sure I'd found Excavation Central. Opening the door and stepping inside, I nearly collided with Marcus. Oh, I exclaimed. Lex, he said, seeming to hold back a laugh. I thought you might have become lost. I chuckled nervously, very aware of the three other sets of eyes examining me from further in the classroom. Not exactly. I didn't know the room number. Had to guess and check. You probably heard me banging around. His lips curved into a faint smile. Perhaps a little. My apologies for the oversight. He stepped aside. Please, come in. Without his sleek, towering form blocking my view, I could see the layout of the room. It was larger than I'd expected, and much wider than it was long. Mismatched wooden bookshelves lined every available space along the walls, only absent in those spots already occupied by one of a half dozen desks. Each shelf had a small bronze placard attached to its front, 
Tables of various sizes and materials were arranged around the room, and nearly every surface was covered with cardboard boxes or antique chests. I'd never been in the room before and was excited by the prospect of discovering all the goodies it contained. Are the tablets Marcus mentioned here? What's in the chests? Which texts are lining the shelves? I had no doubt the collection would prove to be filled with rare items. And who were the people staring at me? As I walked through the doorway, Marcus, again, placed his hand on the small of my back and guided me away from the prying eyes to a very familiar, battered desk. Its presence was enough to shake my focus from the pressure of his hand. That's my desk from downstairs, I exclaimed happily. Just seeing it made me feel oddly at home. Yes, well, I thought it might help you settle in. I'm afraid I've shaken up your world a bit. Thank you, Marcus, I said earnestly, grinning at him. For a moment, I forgot my new surroundings and lost myself in his amber eyes. At the other end of the room, someone cleared a throat, and Marcus's mouth thinned, transforming him from friendly colleague to annoyed businessman. Come, Lex, I'll introduce you to the team, he said, leading me across the room. Three notably attractive people watched our approach with differing expressions. I briefly wondered if, along with antiques, Marcus made it a habit of collecting beautiful people. This is Dominique La Arang, the excavations project manager, Marcus said, indicating the man on the left. He was pale and trim, and he studied me with exceptionally dark eyes. His features were sharp, almost pointy, an effect made more severe by the way his dark brown jaw-length hair was swept back. Hello, Miss Larson, Dominic said, a thick French accent making the simple greeting sound remarkably elegant. Hi, I said, smiling shyly and his severe expression softened a little. If you need anything, just let Dom know, and he'll make the arrangements. And this young lad is Josh Claymore, my research assistant, Marcus told me, introducing the man on the right. He was blonde and slightly burly, but he had an open, youthful face. His short hair stuck out haphazardly, making him appear slightly unkempt. Nearly bouncing with excitement, Josh extended his hand. It's nice to finally meet you. We've heard a lot about you. His enthusiasm surprised me. Um, it's nice to meet you too, I said, shaking his hand. The last of the three people, quite possibly the most breathtakingly gorgeous woman I'd ever seen, was glaring at Marcus. Indicating her with a sweep of his hand, Marcus said, And this is Nephi my second in command. Miss Larson, she said, meeting my eyes and pursing her full lips. The perfect, sultry features on her heart-shaped face hardened. Hello, I said, more than a little intimidated. Josh leaned forward and, loud enough for everyone to hear, whispered, Don't mind her. She's always like that. Must have been how she was raised or something. To my complete shock, Dominic barked a raucous laugh. Nephi transferred her glare from me to Josh and Dominic, and I took the opportunity to send a questioning glance to Marcus. He shrugged. His eyes opened wide in the most ridiculous imitation of innocence. Backing away from the potentially insane group of people, I mumbled, I think I'll just get situated at my desk. My retreat was complete within seconds. Sitting down, I was grateful that my torturous wooden chair hadn't been relocated along with my desk. Instead, I had a cushy new leather office chair. Better to encourage long nights of intense concentration and research, I supposed. I was surprised to find that everything on and in my desk was exactly as it had been in the graduate office, which meant it was a mess. A slight pang of sadness twanged in my chest, at the realization that, with the abrupt change, 
I'd rarely see the few graduate students I'd befriended over the past two and a half years. I thought you might like to see this, Marcus said softly, as he set a flat, wooden box on top of the papers scattered on my desk. Through the glass top, I could see an impeccable, hieroglyph-covered stone tablet. Marcus, I said, without taking my eyes from the object in front of me. Is this? Yes. But where's the other one? You said there were two. I was leaning closer to the glass, trying to get a better look at the box's contents. It's unrelated to our present work. I barely heard his words. Entranced as I was by the slab of smooth, gray-green schist, Lex, can I open it? I interrupted, eagerness evident in my voice. I looked up at him, pleading with my eyes. Marcus grinned and nodded. Oh, wow. With the glass lid removed, the artifact was even more amazing. Shaped like a closed parabola, the dark stone tablet looked like it could have been carved only a few days earlier. Every inch was untouched by the usual rigors of time. Where do you say you found this? I whispered. I didn't, Marcus said, avoiding the question. I gently closed the glass lid and faced him. Okay, he who can't answer an implied question, then where did you find it, and when? Across the room, one of the other men coughed in a way that sounded suspiciously like an attempt to cover up a laugh. The corner of Marcus's mouth quirked, but I couldn't tell if he was hiding a smile or a frown. I can't remember the exact date, but it was years ago. It was hidden in a secret compartment at the foot of Hatnofer's coffin. Hatnofer, as in Senenmut's mother, I clarified. Ever since I'd first learned about the many mysteries surrounding Hatshepsut and her relationship with her chief advisor and architect, Senenmut, years ago, I'd been enamored with the subject. Had they been lovers? Had Senenmut betrayed the female pharaoh? And had she banished him as a result? His body wasn't in either of the tombs he'd carefully prepared for himself. So where was it? And... What happened to Neferure, Hatshepsut's daughter and Senemut's one-time pupil? As far as history was concerned, she simply disappeared as a young woman. My mind whirled with the possible implications of the tablet having been hidden with Senemut's mother's mummy, especially because Senemut had been the architect of Hatshepsut's mortuary temple. Jesser Jesseru which apparently contained the hidden entrance to a secret underground temple. It was just... Wow. Marcus, I said, my voice low and trembling. If this was concealed in Hatton Affair's coffin, isn't it logical to deduce that Senenmut put it there? It is. And if he put it there... Then he probably made it? One would think. My heart started beating faster. Then, wouldn't the next logical deduction be that this hidden temple, linked to Jesser Jesseru, might actually be Senenmut's elusive final resting place? People, treasure hunters and archaeologists alike, had been searching for his body for centuries. Quite possible, Marcus said in his infuriatingly calm way. How are you not exploding with excitement over this? This is unreal. We may end up solving one of the greatest historical mysteries ever. My chest heaved with each breath as I tried to calm myself down. Finally showing some emotion, Marcus smiled devilishly. I assure you, Lex, I'm quite excited. I'm just practiced at keeping my excitement hidden. From his deep, velvety tone, I had the distinct impression that we were talking about two 
entirely different things. Would you like the translation? He asked smoothly. Translation? Of his innuendo? I was pretty sure I could guess what he meant by his excitement. Briefly, my eyes flicked down to the front of his pants. Uh, what? I asked, totally befuddled. Eyes sparkling like singed topaz, Marcus widened his smile. Sinanmut's tablet. Shall I tell you what it says? Embarrassed at my reaction, I felt the need to prove my academic worth. Marcus had told me my youth and other attributes might distract him from remembering my quick wit. It was time for a not-so-gentle reminder. Thank you, no. I prefer to translate it myself. Besides, you might have missed something, I proclaimed. I smirked, wondering which of my other attributes distracted him the most. The thought that anything about me distracted him was exciting, causing a warm flutter low inside me, which I quickly quelled. He was probably just being charming. He probably makes a habit of flirting with every remotely attractive woman he crosses paths with. He probably had a dozen girlfriends, all models and geniuses and humanitarians and... I wouldn't be so sure, Marcus said. For a moment, I thought I'd accidentally voiced my inappropriate analysis of him, but then I recalled what I'd said about him missing something in the translation. A challenge. Before leaving me to my work, Marcus pointed to one of the nearby bookcases, which was filled with the various reference texts commonly used for translating Egyptian hieroglyphs. I politely informed him they wouldn't be necessary. The first thing I noticed in my examination of the tablet was that the infuriating combination of hieroglyphs I'd been struggling with was present in several places. I wondered if the tablet was the subject of the photo Marcus had been studying in my first dream of him, the one that had been a vision because the symbols had been there as well. I also wondered if I finally had the last puzzle piece I would need to decipher those infernal hieroglyphs. As I stared through the glass for several hours, Senenmut's tablet came to life. It revealed elements of his final years that, though previously unknown, didn't shed much light on the historical mysteries surrounding him. I learned he'd spent nearly a decade on a secret building project at Deir el-Bari, the location of Jesser Jesaru, under the direction of Hatshepsut, and of all the ridiculous claims, Set, the Egyptian god of the desert and chaos. The previously undecipherable combination of a lion's head, a half circle, a whole circle, and two vertical parallel lines was included near both Set's and Senenmut's names, and I had a sudden epiphany. It had been speculated that the combination of symbols was adverbial, meaning God's time, or eternal, as in eternal Senenmut, or eternal Set. But I started playing with the part of speech, finally settling on reading them as a title, God of Time. Thinking back on the other texts I'd been analyzing that contained the hieroglyphs, including papyri, tablets and reliefs, I realized that God of Time was a viable alternative translation to infinite or eternal. After recording my findings in a spiral notebook and giving myself a very enthusiastic mental high five, I continued translating the tablet. Indeed, as Marcus had claimed, one set of symbols suggested that the mysterious temple or tomb was physically connected to Jesser Jesseru. According to the scribe, there was an even more secret portion of the hidden temple, containing the power of Nun, which was really odd. Nun was generally known as the god ancient Egyptians attributed with creation, specifically the creation of mankind. The ancient people had believed him to be the primordial waters, the chaos, from which everything had begun. Never had I heard of the ancients referencing any way 
to access his power, or even wanting to do so. The tablet closed with two equally befuddling statements before the usual, so it ends, from start to finish, as found in writing. I translated the preceding statements as, the power and domain of Hathor is life. The power and domain of Anubis is the afterlife. Under Hathor, we are created. Above Anubis, we are changed by the power of creation. I retranslated the symbols three times, looking for alternate meanings, then read through the translation again and again and again. Abruptly, it clicked. No, I whispered. It can't be that simple. From across the room, Josh called out jovially. She's talking to herself. She's really one of us now. Quiet, Josh, Dominique told his colleague. Let her do her work and pay more attention to your own. Right, because reading through undergrad field school applications requires so much. Quiet, Josh, Marcus said softly repeating Dominic's words, and Josh fell silent. Smiling like a fool, I stood and hurried over to Marcus. He sat comfortably at a desk set flush against the wall opposite mine. Without looking away from his laptop, Marcus said, Can I help you with something, Lex? Yes, I mimicked his infuriatingly secretive tone. And what exactly would that be? Oh, I just need a pen and a piece of paper. Really, Lex, you have plenty of paper and writing instruments at your own desk, he chided, finally turning his attention on me. His eyes widened at my barely contained exhilaration. I held out my hand, and he supplied me with a ballpoint pen and a blank sheet of printer paper. I promptly set it on his desk and began sketching the floor plan of Jesser Jesseru. It was a complex temple, with multiple levels, courtyards, chapels, columnades, and shrines. Why would Zeninmut include that weird bit near the end about Hathor and Anubis, and two stages of creation? There's no reason, it's complete nonsense, I said as I worked. I'm aware, Marcus replied dryly. Which means, it's not actually nonsense, it's there for a reason. Earlier, Senenmut mentions that the power of Nun is in the secret temple. For whatever reason, he's saying that Nun's power, creation, is hidden away, correct? Yes. He's probably just using this reference as a key to guide us toward the correct location of the hidden entrance. Obviously, Nun's power isn't really there. Obviously, Marcus mused, his eyes lighting with interest. If we think about creation being locked away in the temple, then Senenmut's statements about Hathor and Anubis become relevant. Marcus leaned over the sketch I was just completing, labeling Hathor's chapel on the left side of the rough floor plan and the two Anubis chapels on the right. It makes no sense for there to be two Anubis chapels. We all know that. But they're there anyway. The upper chapel fell into disrepair because of its redundancy. It was purposeless. Or so we thought. But on Senenmut's tablet, he tells us that above Anubis, we will be changed by creation. The part about Hathor is junk, just meant to disguise the trail. But the bit about above Anubis tells us to look in Anubis's upper chapel. Upper. Above. I pointed to the upper chapel on my map. You see, in order to be changed by creation or by Noon's power, we first must find it. And to do that, we have to enter the secret temple. So, the hidden entrance should be in the upper chapel to Anubis, Marcus said, finishing my statement. Dear gods, I can't believe I missed this. He tore his eyes from my drawing and gazed up at me wondrously. I squirmed under his intensity. It's not that big of a deal. I only figured out the general area. Don't belittle yourself, Lex. If you knew how long. This is unbelievable. He glanced down at the sketch of the temple again, 
and then back up at me. You. Unbelievable, he whispered. His expression had altered minutely to one of reverence. Overwhelmed, I took two steps back and ran into a warm, firm body. I would have fallen to the side if strong hands hadn't grasped my arms, keeping me upright. Careful, ma fille, Dominic cautioned, stabilizing me. Thank you, I whispered. I was surprised to discover that Dominic, Josh, and Nephi were standing shoulder to shoulder behind me. How long have they been standing there? I wondered. I'm sure you all heard. You're so very talented at listening when you choose. The Jesser Jesaru entrance would appear to be in the upper Anubis chapel. Marcus shook his head slowly. This, my friends, is a much needed breakthrough. Congratulations, Lex. As he finished, my three new colleagues huddled around me, each murmuring a different exclamation or form of praise at the discovery. Thank you, I said, my neck and cheeks flaming. Needing a break from the Lex worship, I excused myself and spent the afternoon examining various other texts and artifacts strewn about the room. Each item was fascinating in its own right, from pressed scrolls, I'd believed to have been lost, to heavy manuscripts, darkened with age. The afternoon passed quickly, and soon I was bidding the team goodbye and heading home, alone. I strolled along familiar paths, taking the long way home. I used the solitary time to think, to process, everything that had happened in that elongated top floor room. Beyond that, I considered everything that had happened lately and realized the past month had unquestionably been the most eventful of my 24-year life, with a big, fat exclamation point. As I neared my apartment building in the falling darkness, I checked my phone. One new voicemail. I quickly accessed my mailbox and was greeted by my grandma's age-roughened voice. Hi, sweetheart, it's grandma. I'm sorry to do this on such short notice, but there's someone who needs to meet you. We'll be stopping by this evening between six and seven. Traffic, you know. Anyway, you might consider making a little dinner. I think you'll want to make a good first impression. See you tonight, honey. Wait, so does Grandma have a boyfriend? Utterly confused, I picked up the pace. It was five o'clock, and I had absolutely no idea what I was going to cook for dinner. By the time I'd made it home and whipped up something presentable, if not memorable, from the ingredients my mom had left behind, I was bouncing with excitement. I'd convinced myself that Grandma Suze had been swept up into an adorable old-person love affair, and wanted me to meet her new sweetie. My heart skipped an excited beat when I heard the knock at the door. It skipped a few more beats after I opened the door and saw the couple standing in the hallway. My elderly grandma had her arm linked with that of a very handsome, familiar man. He was taller than me by a handful of inches, wore his dusty blonde hair long enough to show its loose curl, and looked to be in the prime of his life. And he was smiling. Impossible. Grandpa? I asked before my vision spotted over with blackness. Chapter 13 The Beginning and the End Suze, my darling, do you think perhaps... We should have done this another way. I've startled the poor girl half to death. The deep voice was barely accented with Italian. Oh, hush, Alex, my sweet grandma admonished. I know Lex a little better than you, if you'll recall. I've been around, and I am not your darling. I'd never heard Grandma Suze sound so spiteful. If you'll Recall, Suze, you're the one who told me to get the hell out or risk everyone discovering the truth. I was fully prepared to risk it. 
opening my eyes, I sat up on the couch and stared at the unbelievable couple sitting at my kitchen table. Um, hi. If you guys could stop word-stabbing each other for a minute and explain why my 30-year-old grandfather just walked into my apartment, it'd be peachy, I declared with an unpleasant smile. Grandma Suze gasped. Alexandra Marie Larson, you wipe that look off your face right this instant. I grimaced and sat up straighter. Sorry, Grandma. That's better. She reverted back to my kindly grandma. Now, honey, your grandpa's going to explain some important things to you. Things he should have explained weeks ago. But he was conveniently out of town. I was in Antarctica. How could I have known? There are zero reasons why she should have manifested. Alice never showed any signs of being a carrier, and I even peeked into the future, which, you know, is all but forbidden. And I saw nothing of this. Not everything shows up, you know, he said, a little sulkily. Besides, I had Heru watching over her, just in case. He owed me. Some guy named Heru had been watching over me? Remotely, I wondered if it had been the same man who had broken down my apartment door, pummeled Mike, and whisked me to the hospital. If so, I owed him, and was a little afraid of him. Well, he obviously wasn't trying hard enough. My suddenly furious grandma spat. Her body was visibly trembling. I assume he told you what happened. Yes, but he said, Enough, I yelled, slapping my palm on the steamer trunk coffee table. Will someone please explain why I feel like I'm losing my mind? Ignoring my outburst, Grandma Suze stood and said to her not-so-late husband, I'm feeling a bit tired. I think I'll just go lie down in Lexa's room while you two chat. As she hobbled toward my bedroom, she gave me a pointed look that seemed to say, behave yourself and give him hell at the same time. So, Grandpa, I said after the bedroom door shut, thinking I'd never had a more surrealistic, awkward experience. Sorry about the whole fainting thing, he shrugged. I've had worse reactions. A few people even tried to stab me and dozens have run away, shrieking about ghosts. Smiling roguishly, he added, You should call me Alexander. Or Alex. Grandpa doesn't really fit with my appearance. People will talk. Okay, Alexander. Saying his name hammered the final rusty nail in the this-feels-so-wrong coffin. Don't worry. You'll get used to it, and to me. He patted the kitchen table in front of my grandma's abandoned chair. Come, join me, Alexandra. We have some catching up to do. I'll say. I was feeling a bit irked, a lot crazy, and insanely curious. If I hadn't been experiencing all of the weird dream visions lately, I would have totally freaked out. As it was... I was moderately freaked out, but I shoved the feeling away. Answers were finally throwing themselves at me. I couldn't turn them away just because I didn't understand them. I joined my grandpa, Alexander, at the table. He stared at me with midnight blue eyes. You look so much like my little Alice. I almost feel like I'm sitting here with her instead of her grown daughter. We gods of time suffer far worse from its passing than those who age and die. We have to go on. We gods of time. Is that from a poem? I was utterly baffled. What? A crease formed between my grandpa's eyebrows, and he grabbed my nearest hand. My dear child. Suze always says I have a way of circumventing the truth. 
An occupational hazard, I suppose. Shall I just dive right in? I nodded, hoping his words would somehow translate into something coherent. My mind was too numb for anything cryptic to get through, and I was usually really good with cryptic. Very well. You and I, and the others like us, are not human. Not exactly. My mouth fell open. Not human? You're kidding, right? He has to be kidding. Of course I'm human. Alexander shook his head. Many thousands of years ago, a human woman bore a son who became the most talented spiritual leader his clan ever had. He was able to guide his people away from the dangers of the desert and other clans until they settled near a fertile river. He was a very powerful seer of the past, present, and future. Some said he could alter the fairy fabric of time. He shrugged, as if he were saying, I'm not so sure about that. Through recent developments in the understanding of evolution and genetics, we now know he was the first to be born with a unique and beneficial genetic mutation, which he then passed on to some of his descendants. In his time, power came with many consequences, one being that he had many wives and consorts, which led to many children. Those children had children, and so on. Over time, as the bloodlines intermixed, his mutation was passed on. He is, in essence, the father of our species. Alexander held up a hand, cutting off the words threatening to explode from my open mouth. Wait, all will become clear. This man's name was Nguyen, and his people became the rulers and aristocracy of Upper Egypt, while he... The most powerful of his people became known as the creator of mankind. You know him as the god Nun. Like him, many of his descendants became deified by the people of their times, such as Heru, Set, and Aset. He said, listing the ancient names of the Egyptian gods, more commonly known as Horus, Seth, and Isis, to the modern world. I'm sure you see the big picture. Nguyen's descendants became known as the Netgerat, which means... I cleared my throat, unprepared to participate in the conversation. Roughly, gods of time. It was the exact translation I'd settled on earlier that day for the hieroglyphs that had been driving me mad for months. It could have been a coincidence but I doubted it was. Alexander nodded, clearly pleased. His eyes crinkled faintly at the outer corners when he smiled, making him appear endearingly kind. Over the past millennium, with the rise of lingua franca, the name simplified into Nejeret or Nejere for women or men, respectively. I'm Nejere, and you, Alexandra, are Nejeret. As a whole, our people are Nejerets. Our kind, the descendants of Nguyen, are able to step out of time to see its various threads. As you hone your skills, you'll be able to view the past and the present, and maybe even the future possibilities to some degree. It's different for each of us. His words were pure impossibility, but it also sort of made sense, what with the two real dreams I'd all but accepted as real. So, you're saying we're time travelers? I asked, skepticism coding my words. Alexander laughed. Everyone asks that, but no, we don't travel through time. We're only able to see time, to see what has happened and some of what may be. We cannot actually interact with any time other than the present. He paused, frowning thoughtfully. Think of time as a vast cavern, 
and of our visions as the echoes of every sound that has been, is being, or might ever be made, many Nezherets have actually started calling what we see echoes. How is this real? I whispered to one of the empty spots at the table. Alexander squeezed my hand. The how is irrelevant. That it is matters. As he spoke his final words, the world melted into a swirl of colors, writhing all around us like a psychedelic hallucination. Whatever you do, don't let go of my hand until it stops. We could easily get separated, and I don't have the talent to track you if that happens. Um, okay. When the world finally righted itself, I muttered, You've got to be kidding me. I spun around in a circle, taking in my surroundings. What is this? Ancient Rome? Hand in hand, Alexander and I stood off to the side of a high-ceilinged room. The walls were painted in a rich red and black, and several dining couches, each draped in lustrous fabrics, were arranged artfully around a small wooden table. Not exactly. Alexander said, We're in Herculaneum. He released my hand and held both of his arms out wide. Welcome to my childhood home. No, I breathed, stunned. I gaped at everything around me. It all looked new, not like it had been buried under volcanic ash for thousands of years, which meant it hadn't been buried yet. Suddenly fearful, I exclaimed, Herculaneum? But Mount Vesuvius? That's not for another seventy years, and even if Vesuvius were erupting right now, we would be safe enough. No need to worry. Remember, we're not really here. We're only witnessing an echo of the past. My unusually sluggish mind finally caught up screaming about what was important, and it wasn't the impending volcanic eruption. Your childhood home? You grew up in Herculaneum before Mount Vesuvius erupted? That's, that's impossible. You'd have to be over 2,000 years old. This can't be real. It's not real. It's not real. It's not real. Scrunching my eyes closed, I repeated the mantra for a long moment. When I reopened them, I hoped to find myself standing in my apartment, my impossibly ancient grandpa gone, and sanity and reality firmly reestablished around me. I was sorely disappointed. Alexandra, calm down. My grandpa's fingers regained their strong grasp on my hand, acting like an anchor to something tangible, to something real. But touching him was almost as disconcerting as considering the possibility that everything he told me was true. He wasn't the steadiest of anchors. Wide-eyed, I stared at Alexander, taking dozens of deep, slow breaths. I know your Nezheret traits have been manifesting. You must feel like you're losing your mind, noticing physical changes with your body possibly heightened senses and seeing things that happened in the past. You're having dreams that feel like memories, but they couldn't be your memories because you were never there. Correct. Incapable of forming words, I nodded. This is all real, Alexandra. You aren't human. You're Nezheret. As much as my mind wanted to disagree, the logical part of me assessed every piece of evidence. The dreams and visions, the healing, my eyes, and drew the only possible conclusion. Alexander Ivanov, my thirty-looking two-thousand-year-old grandfather, was telling the truth. Nguyen, the Nezherets, the Echoes, it was all real. Decisively, I nodded. I still felt queasy and a bit crazy, yet at the same time, I felt more stable than I had in weeks. 
I had the explanation I'd been seeking, and I had people. I belonged. Alexander let out a relieved breath. Wonderful. You wouldn't believe how long it takes some people to accept the truth. I cleared my throat. So, um, what now? He smiled. Now, we watch and eventually you learn. Look. He spun me around, leading me to a wide doorway. Beyond, the geometric pattern on the tiled marbled floor changed as it led out to a manicured garden filled with shrubs, brightly colored flowers, and waving palm trees. Past a carved stone banister at least thirty yards away, the tiled ground dropped off, revealing an undulating, rich, blue mass. The Bay of Naples. I took a deep breath, inhaling the tangy sea air. It seemed so pure compared to the polluted air of my time. So, we can smell, too? Not just see and hear things in these, these echoes? Alexander looked at me with surprise. Not everyone can. Many talents that used to be common have faded from our gene pool. Being able to smell in the uh, art is almost non-existent among those born during the last several centuries. From the way he said, ought, I wondered if it was the official term for the echoes. In Middle Egyptian, it meant time, so it made sense. Well, I can. I felt pride at excelling, but it was tinged with sadness. Even among my own people, I was doomed to be a little different. I glanced away uncomfortable with Alexander's measuring look. Before I could point out that it wasn't polite to stare, the sound of sandaled feet slapping against marble tiles drew my attention. Two small boys, one with brown hair and one with blonde, squealed and clattered onto the patio. They tried not to giggle as they struck at each other with wooden swords. After a particularly deadly fake stab from the blonde boy, the brown-haired boy staggered to the ground with melodramatic gasps. The victor, is that? My grandpa responded wistfully. Me? Yes. My brother and I were playing our equivalent of cops and robbers. It was more like Alexander the Great and the Persian heathens. They terrified us more than modern human scholars understand. Ah, uh, but looking back... I think we could have focused less on the Persian threat and more on the religious strife within our own society. But I suppose no civilization, no matter how grand, is meant to last forever. It was my turn to stare at him. You miss it. Gently, he squeezed my hand. It was home. It's part of who I am. I'll always miss it. Someday you'll understand. I can accept the visions or echoes or whatever. I get it. I've seen enough to know this isn't just a hallucination. But what's with the really great aging perks? I asked, unable to hold in my curiosity any longer. Alexander looked amazing for a guy who'd lived through two millennia. Alexander tightened one side of his mouth as he thought. I'm much more a uh, philosopher than scientist, but as far as I understand it, some other genetic traits are linked to the Netgerat chromosome. First and inconsequentially, our dentition patterns are 2122. I recalled from my undergraduate anthropology classes that the standard pattern for humans was Two one two three, two incisors, a canine, a couple of premolars, and three molars. So, no wisdom teeth? I asked. Correct. It generally holds true among carriers as well, though for you to be Nejeret, Alice must have been a carrier, and she had wisdom teeth on the bottom. Poor girl had to have them removed when she was a teenager. He shook his head at the memory. Nah, but more importantly, we exhibit exceptionally enhanced cellular regeneration. 
This suspends the aging process and dramatically increases both our senses, seeing, hearing, etc., and our ability to heal. I believe you've recently experienced this. I nodded, recalling that Dr. Issa had been aware of my remarkable healing ability and hadn't been surprised. Is she Nezheret too? I wondered. You must have been starved afterward, lost weight, possibly looked ill or older for a number of days. At my responding nod and frown, he continued, Have you noticed any other physical changes? Yeah, my skin is lighter, if that's even possible, and pretty much perfect. I mean, I have no blemishes, no moles, no scars, nothing. And my eyes have become, I guess, brighter would be the right word. Now they look reddish brown instead of just brown. Yes, he said. That's all normal. Your appearance may change as the years pass, and your body continues to renew and heal. Though, for the most part, you should stay the same. You might get a little taller, or stronger, or a number of other things. Also, he hesitated before adding, Alexandra, the women of our kind, Nezherets, can't bear children. My stomach dropped, like a plane abruptly losing altitude. The reaction was unexpected. I'd pretty much written off having kids when I'd committed to a life of gallivanting around the globe from excavation to excavation. But hearing it was a definite impossibility, saddened me. Why not? I asked. The regenerative abilities interfere with the growth of the fetus, inevitably leading to spontaneous abortion. Usually the fertilized egg never even attaches to the Nezheret's uterine wall, he explained, equally scientific and sympathetic. I shook my head. Something wasn't adding up. Well, then how do we reproduce? Through the men. It's always been through the men. Usually our children are normal humans, either carriers or non-carriers. But if a Nezhere mates with a female carrier, the child has a small chance of manifesting, of becoming Nezhere or Nezheret, between a male carrier and a female carrier. Producing a child capable of manifestation is very rare, but possible. The last must have been the case with you. I really didn't expect you to manifest. I frowned. Couldn't you, you know, test people's DNA for the Nezheret chromosome? Then you'd know for sure, and could prepare people so the change would be less... I paused, searching for the right word. Traumatic. Alexander's eyes filled with sorrow. Your situation is unusual, Alexandra. It's unfair, I know. For certain political reasons, I was allowed to search the future ought, to see if there was any chance of Alice's children manifesting. There was absolutely no sign that either you or Jennifer would become Nezheret. He shook his head, clearly frustrated. I'm sorry. I'm not answering your question very well. You see, the mutation isn't genetically traceable, until an individual comes of age, until they manifest, so it's impossible to predict, even with modern technology. There was no way to know this would happen, and no clear explanation for why it did. Hmm, I said, thinking about the man, my biological father, I'd watched break into the fertility clinic, is it possible that he's Nezhere? Is that why he swapped the sperm samples? Did he know mom was a carrier? I considered telling Alexander about what I'd seen, but it didn't seem like the right time. Not that I thought any time would seem like the right time to relay such weird information, but still, this wasn't it. Come, I'll show you something you'll enjoy.
Alexander said, misinterpreting my thoughtful silence as sadness. The swirling colors surrounded us again, and after a short time, we were standing in a very familiar backyard. Grandma Suze's. Seven flowering apple trees were scattered near the edge of an expansive lawn. A young girl, maybe eight or nine years old, giggled gleefully in the middle of the vibrant green grass. Barefoot, she danced around with a slender branch, pretending to fence with an alternate version of the man holding my hand. Her long brown hair flew around her as she twirled and lunged, and her cheeks were flushed from exertion. I'll get you, Persian beast, she howled. Mom? I asked in disbelief. I was watching my mom, one of the girliest women I'd ever known, sword fight with her father. Are you playing Alexander and the Persians with my mom? My grandpa smiled proudly. She loved being Alexander and destroying the evil heathens. You do realize your ancient prejudice could have turned her into an anti-Persian fanatic, right? He shrugged, unconcerned. People are people. She knew it was a game. Luckily, I grumbled, then grinned. She looks so happy, so carefree. I've never seen her laugh like that. He nodded solemnly. When she and Joe learned they couldn't have children together, it killed something inside her. The heavy emotion in Alexander's voice made me want to hug him. He loved my mom so much, but had abandoned his life as her father because of what he was. And one day, she would grow old and die. My mom, but also his daughter. Morosely, I wondered how many children he'd fathered over his two millennia, watching their births, lives, and inevitable deaths. Did he have any Nejere children? Any aunts and uncles with whom I could explore the aught? With a reluctant sigh, Alexander turned to me. There is one last thing I must show you. I apologize, Alexandra. It won't be uh, pleasant. Okay, what is it? Should I be afraid? I uh, can't tell you what it is. That's against the rules, and, well, nobody really knows exactly what it is. And, yes, you uh, should be very, very afraid. With those final ominous words, the swirling colors surrounded us again, fading to utter blackness before the sensation of steadiness returned. But it took longer than usual. Even without the rainbow of light flowing in cascading tangles, the inky world heaved and lurched. I heaved and lurched. And eventually, I squeezed my eyes shut, wishing the uncomfortable motion would stop. An eternity seemed to pass before it finally did. Open your eyes, Alexander said, releasing my hand. When I did, I was surprised to find that I was again sitting at the kitchen table in my cozy apartment. I think I'm going to be sick, I proclaimed, rising and lunging toward the garbage can. Sure enough, as soon as I reached the plastic receptacle, I vomited, repeatedly. Alexander handed me a wad of paper towels once I no longer seemed in danger of a heaving relapse. Grateful, I took the offering with shaking hands and wiped my mouth. I tied off the garbage and tossed it down the trash chute across the hall from my apartment door. Care to explain? I asked, stomping back into the apartment. Or is that against the rules, too? And whose rules? I briefly disappeared into my bedroom to retrieve my toothbrush, waving at Grandma Sue's as I passed through. She was propped up on the bed, reading. Well, I asked when I returned to the living room seconds later. I shoved my toothbrush into my mouth and started vigorously scrubbing away the taste of sickness. My grandpa watched me gravely. At least you're, uh, still conscious. I passed out the first time I saw it. The nothingness. It seemed jerkier this time, though that may have been my imagination. He sighed. 
It's the future, Alexandra. And not far off. Come the 21st of June, the uh, nothingness takes over the yacht. I stared at him for several long seconds, then spat into the kitchen sink and rinsed my mouth with a handful of water. What are you saying? I croaked. Time stops or something? Is the world going to end on the summer solstice? In six months? Deus, I uh, hope not. We've been working to avert whatever disaster might happen. It could be as simple as us being uh, cut off from the aught after the solstice. There is, of course, a uh, prophecy and a potential savior or destroyer. But it's all very convoluted and likely will end up circumvented and proven irrelevant. Beyond that, I don't think we'll be able to do anything until the 21st June. We're not used to operating blind, but this time we have to. He shook his head, obviously frustrated by the situation. So, the world might be ending, but probably isn't. There might be someone who can save us all, but we don't know. And that person might destroy us all instead. Great. I love being dependent on such reliable people, I said, dryly. In reality, I didn't like being dependent on anyone, reliable or not. That's my girl, Grandma Suze exclaimed softly as she emerged from my bedroom. I told you she's feisty, Alex. She gets it from my side. She'll be a good addition to your little group of world savers, she said, sounding like she was talking about something no more serious than a baseball card collecting club. My grandpa acquiesced grudgingly. Perhaps, but only after she's trained. Uh, do you guys mind not talking about me like I'm not here? I asked. Grandma Suze patted my cheek as she shuffled to the table. Certainly, sweetie, as soon as you serve us dinner. Snorting, I wondered if Alexander brought out the best or worst in my grandma. I settled on both. Chapter 14, Dates and Plans I'm sorry, Lex, but I must have misheard you. What did you just say? Marcus asked. From the sound of his voice, I knew he'd taken the remarkable effort to swing his desk chair a full 180 degrees. Pulling him away from the handwritten journal he'd been examining had been an impossibility all morning. At least, it had been, until Dominic asked me why I was so distracted. For the past four hours, I'd been helping the severe, slightly sullen project manager select the excavation field school's final candidates. He and I were crammed together at my desk, shuffling folders around. Much to his chagrin, I'd been touting a view of, if they can manage a trowel and brush without scratching a relief or shattering an artifact, let them in. Which would have left us with about 400 participants. We needed to narrow it down to 20. I swung my comfy leather chair around to face Marcus. I said... I met my grandpa for the first time last night. What do you think I said? In true Marcus Bahur style, he ignored the question. Isn't that a bit odd, meeting one's grandparents in one's... He paused, examining my face. Mid-twenties? You have no idea how odd meeting Alexander really was, I thought. Marcus wasn't the only one intrigued by my extended family. Dominic had been frozen with shock since I'd first mentioned meeting my grandpa. Suddenly returning to life, he blurted, I just realized, Niffy, I forgot to tell her, as he rushed out of the room. Frowning, I watched him leave before returning my attention to Marcus. Yes, it's odd, which is why I'm distracted by it. Almost imperceptibly, Marcus's eyes narrowed and his mouth puckered. I see. Would you like to accompany me to lunch, Lex? I thought I might stop by the Burke Cafe 
for a bite and coffee. Uh, sure, I said, non-committally. I had no clue how he'd gone from, what do you mean you just met your grandpa, to, let's grab lunch. Wonderful, he said, gently closing the leather-bound book on his desk and rising to don his coat. Shall we? Still sitting, I watched him, confused. Oh, you mean right now? But it's only... I peeked at my phone. A quarter after eleven. And yet, I'm famished. He lifted my purple peacoat off the back of my chair and held it out like I was a child getting ready to go play in the snow. As entertaining as it was to see Marcus standing there like a glorified coat rack, I hardly had a choice. Besides, I was pretty damn hungry, too. I stood and allowed him to settle the coat around my shoulders. I did, however, slap his hands away when he spun me around and tried to button me up, earning a small, secretive smile for the effort. Our ten-minute stroll to the cafe was amicable, filled with remarks on the unusually pleasant weather. It wasn't raining for once, and on how different the campus was now that the undergrads had returned from winter break. We were the epitome of friendly colleagues, which is why I was stunned when, just outside the cafe's door, Marcus reached for my hand and twined his long fingers with mine. The warmth of his hand burned into my palm, climbing up my arm toward my erratically beating heart. I stopped mid-step. What are... I would be most appreciative if you would play along, Lex. I'm sure it won't be too painful, he said, his black-rimmed amber eyes shimmering in the winter sunlight. Without waiting for a response, he pulled the glass door open and pushed me through, ahead of him. When we reached the end of the short line to order, Marcus released my hand, and I was momentarily filled with an unexpected feeling of loss. The arm he draped over my shoulders to pull me snug against his side drove the feeling away, replacing it with astonishment and a pleasant tingly flutter in my abdomen. What is going on with me? I hadn't been so intensely aware of a man in... ever. I felt bespelled, like there was some irresistible force drawing me to Marcus, which would have been thrilling if it weren't for the fact that he was my boss. Off limits, I reminded myself again. Marcus leaned down, bringing his lips a hair's breadth from my ear. Really, Lex, I think you can do better. You could at least pretend to be enjoying yourself. As he pulled his taunting mouth away, I snapped my own mouth shut and turned my face to him. Though I wasn't short, just over five foot eight, I still had to tilt my chin up, accounting for our notable height difference. Narrowing my eyes, I glared, his chiseled jaw clenched, making his bone structure more contoured than usual. From inches away, the effect was breathtaking, and my glare faded. So did the mischief lighting his eyes, replaced by something more serious. Since I'd met Marcus, I'd been embarrassingly unsuccessful at hiding my attraction, but I was starting to wonder if we were walking down a two-way street. Maybe I wasn't alone on the road. My turn, I thought vindictively. We moved forward in the line. Holding his eyes, I slowly licked my lips, wondering if he could smell the vanilla of my lip balm. As I'd hoped, Marcus took notice. His eyes left mine, lingering on my mouth. When they lifted again, they were on fire with desire. I rose onto my tiptoes, bringing my face slowly closer to his. I was aching to follow through with a movement, to press my lips against his, but I altered my trajectory at the last minute, aiming for his ear instead. You'd better have a good explanation for this charade, Marcus. I can't wait to hear it, I purred. As I dropped my heels back down to the ground, my understanding of Marcus Bahur was confused even further. He was grinning in sheer delight, displaying teeth so straight and white they could have been featured in a toothpaste ad. I'd seen him smile before, but not like that. For once, 
It reached his eyes. Oh, Lex, you do surprise me often, and in the most pleasant ways. Of course, I'll give you exactly what you want. In private, he said, louder and rougher than necessary. If I hadn't known exactly what I'd said, I would have guessed we'd just agreed on some especially naughty, potentially illegal sexual act. I could only stare at him. We moved forward again, approaching the counter and its confounded little barista. Cassandra stood opposite us, pressing her lips together so hard they drained of color. She looked like she was either about to throw up or scream. Hello again, Cassandra. I hope you're well, Marcus said to the girl woman. While he spoke, his arm dropped from my shoulders to wrap possessively around my waist. I smiled up at him, pretending to be enamored. Well, pretending to pretend. Hi, Professor, Cassandra chirped. She refused to look at me, let alone acknowledge my presence. What would you like, my darling? Marcus asked me, tightening his arm around my waist. To really be your darling? Oh, just a latte and a turkey and cheddar sandwich. As an afterthought, I added, and a raspberry scone. A well-fed neigerette is a happy neigerette, I justified to myself. And I'll have my usual lunch to go, please, Marcus said, handing Cassandra his card. His usual lunch turned out to be twice as large as mine, but I figured it took a lot of fuel to maintain such a tall, well-honed physique. Once we had our food and coffees and were out of sight of the cafe, Marcus let me go. He continued walking for several steps before noticing I'd stopped. Pausing, he tossed over his shoulder. Is there a problem, Lex? He resumed his slow jaunt. I caught up to him, careful not to spill my latte, and fell in step beside him. Yes, Marcus, there's a problem. What the hell was that? Up until the moment he released my hand, I'd thought, just maybe, he and I could overcome the professor-student, boss-underling dilemma. I thought he might want to, but then he let go, and I realized it had all been wishful thinking. I felt used and embarrassed and far angrier than I probably should have. I suppose I could ask you the same thing. Oh, please. You told me to pretend, to play along. I was having a hard time keeping my voice at a normal volume. You owe me an explanation. He slowed his step and shot me a sidelong glance. I'm a creature of habit. I dislike having to change my behavior patterns. What's that have to do with us pretending to be? I raised my eyebrows and waved my hand in front of me unable to come up with an appropriate label for our pretense. Lovers, Marcus provided. I groaned. God, it sounds so much worse out loud than it did in my head. Would it be so unpleasant? Marcus asked, a chill in his voice. A laugh of sheer disbelief escaped from my mouth. Um, getting kicked out of my program would be unpleasant. The university has rules against professors and students being together. Rules with consequences. Do you always follow the rules? He asked, but the chill was gone. Yes, as a matter of fact, I do, I said. And it was the truth. I'd never snuck out of my parents' house in high school. I hadn't drunk alcohol until I was 21, and I followed traffic laws as best I could. Marcus sighed and, to my shock, told me the reason for the scene back at the cafe. I'm accustomed to getting my lunch at the Burke Cafe. Cassandra was becoming a little... obsessive. I could no longer sit alone for a quiet break. She'd fill every possible second with mindless chatter. It was getting tiring. I needed to dissuade her, he explained. You couldn't just go somewhere else? Like I said, I am a creature of habit. I laughed, despite my waning exasperation. 
You know, Marcus, sometimes change can be a good thing. Sometimes. Rarely. Tell me about meeting your grandfather, he said conversationally, like we hadn't just been teetering on a thin, not okay to cross professional boundary. Carefully, I strung words together into relatively normal sentences. I could hardly say, he looked like he was 30, but he's really a little over 2,000 years old, and we visited the echo of his childhood home in Herculaneum before the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Instead, I said, it was interesting. I'd thought he was dead, so I was more than a little surprised to see him. But after I got over the shock, it was nice. I learned a lot about my family history. Like, that we're not all human? And did you get along well? You and your newfound grandfather? Marcus asked, sounding genuinely curious. I smiled to myself. Yeah, we really did. We'd arrived back at Denny Hall and were about to enter through the inconspicuous west door when Marcus stepped ahead of me, blocking the entrance. Have dinner with me tonight. Has anyone ever told you that your transitions are a bit rough? I asked after overcoming my surprise. He shrugged. Have dinner with me tonight. Marcus, we already talked about this, remember? The rules? Inconsequential. His eyes burned with such intensity that I had to look away. Marcus, I... If I pass this up, I'm the biggest idiot ever born. I can't. With a heavy sigh, he turned toward the door. I grabbed his arm. Wait, I meant... I can't tonight. I already have plans. I explained. I'm meeting up with Alex... My grandpa again. Marcus's arm tensed under my hand, and he said, Tomorrow night, then. Say yes, Lex. Why, Marcus, I gasped dramatically. If I didn't know any better, I'd think you were begging. He smiled roguishly, sensing victory. Trust me, it won't happen again. We'll see, I bantered and his smile widened. But fine, yes, I'll have dinner with you tomorrow night. How am I going to wait until then? With success secured, Marcus finally allowed me into the building. The afternoon passed quickly, filled with numerous flirtatious glances between Marcus and me. By the time I left, I'd helped Dominic narrow the list of field school applicants down to the 40 we would contact and interview, in the coming weeks, I spent the short, lonely walk back to my apartment, reading my neglected text messages. While in the pit, my phone had buzzed at least a half dozen times, and I hadn't been surprised when I'd seen the name on the call log, Kara. And after each unanswered call, she'd sent a text message. Hey, lady. Haven't heard from you for a while. Just checking in. Everything okay? Can you text me back, please? Annie and I wanted to do dinner with you soon. Tomorrow night? Let me know. Are you mad at me or something? You know, it's really not that hard to text someone back. Okay, I'm officially freaking out. Text me, or call me, or stop by. Are you dead or something? This is getting really old. Call me. Unwilling to face the hour-long interrogation that would undoubtedly result from a phone call, I sent my relentless friend a text. Sorry, Kara, I'm fine. Just been busy with my mom and the excavation prep. Let's definitely do dinner soon. It wasn't what she wanted to hear, but the words would at least decrease her calling frequency for the night. When I reached my apartment, Alexander was already waiting in the hallway outside the door. We'd planned to meet up at six o'clock, and I was a few minutes late. Sorry, I got held up on campus. Have you been waiting long? I asked, letting him into my little home. He smiled kindly. Not a problem. I brought dinner, he announced, setting a huge bag of Chinese takeout on the kitchen table. Alexander, you're a genius. You just might be the best grandpa ever, I exclaimed as I retrieved plates and silverware. What would you like to drink?
Beer? Wine? Water is fine. It's unwise to venture into the art while inebriated. When we do, our subconscious starts to take over and it becomes too easy to end up seeing something uh, unintentionally. There are some things you can't unsee, no matter how hard you try, he explained, giving me my first important lesson. Okie dokie, water it is, I said, setting two full glasses on the table. Dinner passed pleasantly, both of us downing generous portions of fried rice, sweet and sour prawns, beef with broccoli and egg rolls. We swapped stories, me telling Alexander about how I came to love archaeology, and Alexander telling me about his childhood in Herculaneum and his modern life as an explorer of sorts. He'd been traveling around the world, never stopping in one place for more than a year since he'd left Grandma Sue's almost 25 years ago. It was nice to learn more about him. So, what's on the agenda for tonight? More shocking family revelations? History lessons? I asked, finally dropping my fork onto my plate with a clink. I was blissfully stuffed. Hmm, I thought I might answer some of your uh, questions, Alexander said. If you're anything like me, which I suspect you are, you have hundreds buzzing around in your head. I straightened, excited by the prospect. Where to start? Is there a limit on how far we can see into the future or past? Alexander tensed one side of his mouth. Well, uh, other than the pesky solstice issue, which prevents anyone from seeing into the aught beyond the 21st of June, it completely depends on the individual's strength. Only a few years after I manifested, I could see thousands of years behind and several years ahead. The weakest Nejere I've ever known could only see a few hundred years into the past. Seeing the future has always been the more difficult and rare talent. That's what we call our unique gifts, and those with that talent are called seers. I can do it, I said. I mean, I did it once, but it was only a few days in the future, and it definitely wasn't on purpose. He nodded, apparently expecting no less from a granddaughter of his. How many of us are there? I asked. Alexander frowned. I uh, don't know exactly. Our governing body, the Council of Seven, isn't as well organized as it once was. The Council used to keep records on all our people, but they haven't been very successful in tracking the births or deaths in a few of the familial lines for at least 500 years. There could be any number of thousands, maybe even tens of thousands. What changed? I asked, thinking that a people who could literally take a peek into the past shouldn't have too hard of a time with a species-wide census. There was a disagreement, Alexander explained. Half the members of the council believed we should force the prophecy and bring the savior, the Mezwet, into existence. He said prophecy like it was a particularly foul obscenity. The other half believed we should avoid the cursed thing at all costs. After a while, reconciliation was impossible, and the council split. Were you on the council? I asked, suddenly curious about my grandpa's standing among our people, and through him, my standing. Shaking his head, Alexander said, The seven seats on the council are reserved for the patriarchs of the seven strongest familial lines. There's Heru and Set, though Set disappeared more than a thousand years before I was born. So, there are really only six members. Did Set die? At the edge of my mind, I realized that Heru, the man Alexander had set up as my watchdog, was on the Council of Seven, which was crazy, it was like learning the President of the United States had been my bodyguard for 
Who knew how long? My grandpa shook his head again. There's also Moshi, Sid, Deadwin, and Shang Di. I whistled. Assuming Moshi and Sid are who I think they are, Moses and Siddhartha, central figures in two of the world's largest modern religions, that's quite a list of mythical people. Not so good at keeping a low profile, are we? I asked sardonically. Alexander laughed. A fault of our species. That was only six, by the way, I informed him. Ivan, my father, is the leader of the council, though they haven't officially met for some time. I was momentarily stunned. My great-grandpa was the leader of our people. With a dry chuckle, I said, so I really wasn't far off with the whole more shocking family revelations thing. You uh, seem to be adjusting well to the phenomenon. I shrugged. Adapt or die? I wondered if I was exhibiting some other hard-to-pinpoint characteristic of our kind. Extreme adaptability. It would make sense considering that our regenerative abilities allowed us to live for thousands of years while the world went through endless changes. Live for thousands of years. Me. Unbelievable. I plucked another question out of the miasma. So, besides some of us being stronger than others, some of us being able to see into the future, and some of us being able to smell in the echoes, are there any other differences between Nezirets? Yes, many. Alexander took a deep breath before diving in. Some of us are tied down, meaning we have to be physically in the place of the echo we are reviewing, and some aren't. For example, if you were tied down and you wanted to see something that happened last year here in this apartment, you'd have to enter the art from this apartment. He paused for a moment. Some Nezirets can follow an object through the art, viewing all that has or might happen in its presence. Some can do the same in relation to a specific individual. That is called finding. Some can track another Nezirets' projected self, their Ba, through the art, following them from echo to echo. Again, he paused. Some can manipulate the art itself, forever changing what other Nezirets see when viewing a particular echo, or creating false echoes, things that never actually happened. Manipulating is a very dangerous talent. Permanently altering the art is forbidden, though on rare occasions we are allowed to create temporary false echoes, for training purposes. Related, but not completely forbidden. Some can cloak their art selves, or even entire portions of the art containing their past and potential futures. That is how Set disappeared. He's created a series of blank spots in the art. I considered Set and the idea of cloaking in the art. I was fairly certain I'd seen a cloaked person in the art before. The man who'd saved me from Mike. With sudden excitement, I wondered if the long-lost set was my mysterious savior. But my excitement soured almost instantly. The ancient Egyptian god, Set, was often called Seth by modern people, and Seth had been the name attached to the sender of a pretty damning text message on Mike's phone use the lip balm to make her compliant, then complete the mission. Was Mike's Seth the vanished member of the Council of Seven? Did Mike know about Nezirets? About me? It seemed like too much of a coincidence. That's all I can think of right now, Alexander said, interrupting my wild conjecturing. I suppose we should write this down in a handbook, it would make training quite a bit easier. It's okay, I replied, my head spinning both from the influx of information and my improbable deductions. I didn't know if I could handle anything else at the moment. 
but I was a staunch believer in the whole knowledge is power bit. So I asked another question. Hmm. So if someone alters the yacht, does it change what actually happened? Like, will the history book suddenly say something different? No. Since we don't actually travel through time, we only view what has been or what could be. Only the moment's reflection in the art, its echo, is changed, he said decisively. Besides, humans would be unaware of the change in the art. Only Nezirets would be able to see it. So history would remain the same. I frowned. Then why is it such a big deal? If it doesn't actually change anything. A bitter laugh escaped from Alexander. Nezirets depend on the echoes, and we tend to hold pretty high positions, even in the human world. If we base some decision on what we saw in the art, and what we saw was false, then the consequences could be devastating for Nezirets and humans alike. After a moment of thought, he said, Someone... We have guesses, but we don't know who for sure manipulated the future art, completely removing all traces of echoes surrounding a certain ambitious member of the Nazi party. Nezirets in power throughout the world made political decisions based on what they saw in the art, unaware that an entire life had been erased from view. It just so happened that that life would prove extremely influential. But because it had been eradicated from the art, Nezure seers couldn't see the potential horrors it might cause. Alexander was shaking his head in disbelief. Was he one of those seers? I wondered, as I took in his state of dejection. By the time we noticed the anomaly in the art, it was too late. He continued, events had already been set in motion. We did what we could, but... Alexander suddenly looked at me, into me. You must understand that we did what we could. You must, he pleaded. But the horrors, the death, those poor humans. Reaching across the corner of the table, I squeezed his hand. I had no words but at least I could comfort him with that. Whoever manipulated the art, he turned over his hand to grip mine almost painfully. You study history, Alexandra. You know about power and corruption. Our kind walks a very thin, unsteady line. We may feel like them sometimes. We may even be named for them, but we're not gods. Remember that, granddaughter. We are not gods. Alexander's tone was vehement. Gravely, I said, I understand. After Alexander nodded, I waited, taking a few contemplative breaths. So, which, um, talents do you have? His grip on my hand relented, and I retracted my arm, setting both of my hands in my lap. Let's see, he said. I can see very far into the past, Ott, and a short way into the future, Ott. And I can smell in echoes, like you. I'm not tied down. I can view any echo within the past several thousand years from anywhere. Though looking further back tens or hundreds of thousands of years does require proximity to the Echo's place of uh, origin. He leaned toward me, as if confessing a secret. That's why I was in Antarctica for the past few months. I've always wondered what was under all of that ice. Also, I am a finder. I can search the art, focusing on a specific object or individual. I bit the inside of my lip, digesting his response. So... On a scale of one to ten, one being the weakest weakling, 
and ten being. Nuin, Alexander supplied. I shrugged. Sure. So on that scale, where would you rank in strength? Hmm. Perhaps a seven. My father would be a nine, certainly, as would the rest of the council. They are all very powerful, just not to the level of the great father. Too many questions bounced around in my skull, like my head had turned into a pinball game comprised of flesh, bone, and synapses. Can you teach me how to be a finder? There were a few people I wanted to follow through the aught, but one stood out from the rest in my mind. The mental image of that person glared deadly daggers at the others, commanding them to wait their turn. I uh, can try. But it's a rare talent, so I wouldn't get your hopes up, he cautioned. Great, let's do it, I said, with a small bounce in my chair. Hang on, one step at a time. First you need to learn how to enter the art at will. How have you done it so far? I explained the basics behind my first few unintentional dives into the art then described how I'd gained some control using my emotions and focusing on what I needed at the moment. I didn't, however, tell him the subjects of the echoes, especially not the one about my criminal father. I needed to know more about that particular element of my nefarious parentage before I shared it with anyone. If I ever shared it with anyone, it was creepy and weird. As I spoke, Alexander nodded, sometimes looking surprised and sometimes proud. You've uh, made a good start of it, he told me after I finished. If you can gain control over your ability to enter the art while awake this evening, then I'll test you for the finding talent before I leave. Okay, so what do I do? I asked eagerly. Aim for when you opened the door yesterday evening and first met your magnificent grandfather, he said, puffing up jovially as he spoke, which earned a wry laugh from me. He grasped my hand again. Now, holding that moment in your mind, close your eyes and uh, clear out all other thoughts. It seemed to be an impossible task, but... I needed it to work. I needed to track a very specific person. Needed. Open your eyes, Alexandra. When I did, I thought I'd succeeded. But then the door burst open. Two unsteady people stumbled into the apartment. Oh no. No, no, no. I needed to get away. In a flash of colors, the scene shifted to the night with Kara and Annie and the three bottles of wine. The other me was explaining her hesitations about going on the date with Mike, to which Kara and Annie responded with protestations and confusion. Damn it, I hissed. I felt a hand squeeze mine and remembered that Alexander was with me. Concentrate, Lex, he encouraged gently. You're doing fine. Focus on the night you met me. I remembered opening the door. The stunned moment when incomprehension faded to impossible recognition. The scene flickered. The other me hurried to the door, obviously excited. She opened it and seconds later was lying on the hardwood floor. I'd fainted from the shock of finding my grandpa, alive and young, standing in the hallway. There must have been a better way for you and Grandma Suze to have done that, I told Alexander. I was watching the other version of him carry my limp form to the couch. He shrugged. At least you didn't hit me. After a pause, he said, Now, do you remember what you did to get here? I nodded, recalling how concentration had surpassed need. I'd felt much more in control. Good. Pick out another moment in this apartment. Something that happened further back. And... Take us there. It was hard to think of anything memorable that hadn't happened in the last month. Part of me felt like my life hadn't really started 
until that devastating conversation with my mom. Finally, I settled on a moment and concentrated. The flicker of colors lasted a tiny bit longer than it had the previous time, but it was nothing like the protracted swirl that had surrounded us when we'd viewed Alexander's home in Herculaneum. Another version of me was sitting on the couch with a cardboard animal carrier on her lap. The creature inside the carrier emitted a rhythmic string of tiny, frantic meows. The other me opened the box and out popped a softball-sized ball of gray and brown fur. Thora, I murmured as I watched the awkward kitten thoroughly sniff first me and then the couch. The day you brought your cats home. Good choice. The echoes revolving around our loved ones are both the easiest and hardest to view, he said briskly, shaking me out of my kitten reverie. Baby Thora was stalking a pen that had fallen on the floor, wiggling her little behind clumsily. Now I think you're ready for your finder test. Really? I asked, suddenly giddy with excitement. Alexander nodded. Pick someone you know of, but you don't know. Like a celebrity. I frowned, squinting my eyes. Do you have someone in mind? Alexander asked. I nodded, picturing John Jacob, the lead singer of my favorite band, Johnny Stopwatch. Good. Now this time you're going to aim for the when instead of the where. The when? I repeated. Yes, the when. If we don't know the where, we must start with the when, he explained. Open yourself up to the art, thinking only about the world thirty minutes ago. Don't think about a place. Instead, imagine being everywhere in the world at once, at half past nine this evening. It took nearly twenty minutes to enter the placeless art. The when. For someone used to living in the where and watching the when go by, readjusting perspectives was unbelievably difficult. My very understanding of time and space had to be melted down and remolded into a more malleable thing. All of a sudden, I was enmeshed in the targeted when, watching the where spin around me like a deranged carousel. It was odd to see the colors of the ought moving unilaterally instead of their usual chaotic swirl. Very good, Alexandra, my grandpa commended. Now you must find your uh, focal point, your celebrity. He or she is somewhere in this time, but you don't know where, correct? No idea, I said, nodding. Perfect. This part will be easy if you're a finder. Just think about the person, and the art will automatically shift itself around you. I did as he directed, and gasped. The endless spinning shifted, no longer circling, but instead moving past me like a headwind. When the movement ceased, Alexander and I were standing in a dim, packed bar. In a booth in a dark corner, sat John Jacob with the other members of Johnny's stopwatch, a half-empty pint glass in hand. Is that your uh, focal point? Alexander asked eagerly, pointing to the musician. At my amazed nod, he said, Wonderful, you're a finder, and to some degree, a seer. His voice was filled to the brim with grandfatherly pride. Well, you know, I get it from my grandpa. I said, bumping his shoulder with my own. I was blushing profusely at his unabashed flattery. So, should we call it a night? I'm kind of tired after all of this art surfing. Art surfing. I like that. Like channel surfing. But uh, yes, we can be done for today. Would you like to return us? Or shall I? He asked politely. Done, I said as the world flickered briefly and we returned to our physical forms. It really wasn't too difficult once I understood the basics. Stretching in my kitchen chair, I asked, what happens to our bodies while we, or 
um, our ba is in the ot. According to the ancient Egyptians, the ba was one of the three essential pieces comprising a person's soul, and I found it immensely interesting that it was what Nezheretz called the part of ourselves that could venture into the ot to view what has been and what may be. Alexander smiled. I've been waiting for you to ask that. It really is a remarkable thing. When your ba leaves your body, your physical form enters a state of stasis, called atked. I recognized the word ked as one of the ancient Egyptian words for sleep, where to observers, we appear to zone out, or become lost in thought. More or less, the body's functions slow down, and it retains whatever position and expression it held when the Ba departed. And as far as we know, we can remain in Atked indefinitely. So, someone could just come in here and do whatever they wanted to our bodies, and we wouldn't even notice? I asked, horrified. Pressing his lips together, Alexander took a deep breath. Yes, it's the major downfall to uh, using our gift. We are absolutely vulnerable when our ba enters the art, far more so than when we're simply asleep. That is the very reason you should only enter the art in a safe, private place, and not spend too much time viewing echoes. Either that, or have someone you trust to protect your body while your ba is away. Oh, that's interesting, I said, and I meant it, but it came out sounding more like bored disinterest. My head was too full of new information and convoluted concepts. Ba, ot ked, the when, the where, manipulating. I needed time to process. Seeming to read my thoughts, Alexander said, I should go. You've had a long evening. Same time tomorrow? I can't tomorrow. I have a date with the most enigmatic and enticing archaeologist on the planet. How about Thursday? Very well, my dear. I'll see you then, he said, giving me a brief hug before leaving. After cleaning up the remnants of our Chinese food feast, I considered turning in for the night. It was nearly midnight. And I really was tired, but I wasn't done yet. I wasn't even close. Chapter 15 Catch and Trap He has to be Nejere, I thought as, once again, I studied the shadowed man in the echo of the incident with Mike. It was the only way he could have disguised himself in the echo. But who is he? Something about him, about that night, had been tugging at my subconscious ever since I woke up in the hospital. I needed to know his identity, desperately, even if I didn't understand the reason behind my desperation. As I glanced at Mike and registered the absolute terror in his eyes, my need to know the Nejere's identity became crushing. I was certain there was a way to unmask him, I just had to figure it out. I need more time. The cloaked Nejere lurked toward my fallen attacker, spitting vicious, incomprehensible syllables along the way. He beat Mike until his need for violence was expended, and then he returned to the unconscious version of me. He picked her up and carried her out of the apartment. Again, I thought, and the echo started over. I lost track of how many times I viewed the echo, but eventually I realized I didn't need to keep watching the attack over and over again just to see the shadowed man. Stop, I thought, and it was as though I'd hit a pause button. The shadowed man was frozen, crouching on his heels, with his hand outstretched toward the other version of me. He was in the middle of brushing a stray lock of hair from her face. I circled the figure studying every shadowed inch of him. I could see that the darkness cloaking him was different, set apart from the echo itself. 
It was like some foreign aught had been layered over the original echo, like a palimpsest. I touched the out-of-place aught, and it vibrated. Determined, I grasped the shadowy cloak with both hands and tugged. Nothing happened. I tugged harder, and again, nothing happened. Apparently, I couldn't strip it off. But I thought it was possible I could slip between the two layers of aught. I was fairly certain that no two particles could occupy the same space at the same time. I only hoped the same rule of matter applied in the aught. Gently, as I'd done the first time, I touched the superimposed aught. It vibrated, but I was pretty sure the man underneath remained still. I carefully searched with my fingers, following the increasingly strong vibrations, until I found what felt like an edge. It wasn't an edge in the conventional sense, like the edge of a piece of paper or the hem of a dress. It was more like a sense of something met by a sense of nothing. I slipped the tips of my fingers under the edge and then followed with my whole hand. My teeth chattered with the increasingly intense vibrations, but I reached further. When I could finally slip my head between the two layers of aught, the vibrations stopped. The cloak, I realized, was gone. Unfortunately, in my aught splitting, I'd maneuvered myself so that I was crouched in front of the man, with my face mere millimeters from his black sweater. I stumbled backward, tripped over the other version of me, and fell on my butt. When I'd finally composed myself enough to stand and look at the man's face, I gasped and dropped back down to the floor. Oh my God. Marcus? I exclaimed aloud. Marcus is Nejere. Marcus is Nejere? What does this... Damn it, Lex. The growling admonishment filled every open space in the frozen echo. It was Marcus's voice, but the Marcus in the echo, the one i just uncloaked and was watching, was still frozen. My stomach dropped as I realized what was going on. Marcus is Nejere. Marcus, the real Marcus, is here. Gripping my upper arms, he hauled me up off the ground and spun me around. I was staring straight into the very real, very pissed-off face of Marcus Bahur, professor, archaeologist, and undercover Nejere. I was going to explain everything tomorrow night, he said, articulating each word with exceptional care. Instinctively, I punched him in the gut. It was the first time I'd ever really hit another person, and on the whole, it was rather ineffective. He barely flinched. How long have you known? I shouted. I've barely been able to keep my head above water and you've been sitting by, watching? I thought I was losing my mind. I punched him again, hoping for a better reaction. I was let down. So, naturally, I began slapping and hitting every inch of his bare torso. It didn't take me long to tire. I dropped my arms limply to my sides. Are you finished? He asked, more than a hint of frost in his tone, like a blizzard's worth. I nodded weakly, studying his blue and gray tennis shoes. Marcus never wears tennis shoes. His bare torso finally registered in the coherent part of my mind. Misbehaving, my eyes raised to the golden brown skin less than a foot away. Hard ridges rippled the perfect flesh, defining muscles I hadn't even known existed. I'd seen him shirtless once before, in a dream that had been set in ancient Egypt, or what I had thought was a dream, considering it could have been an echo. I shivered. Marcus would have to be at least 3,000 years old. Where's your shirt? I asked, picking the least terrifying question I could think of. What? He asked, surprised. His tone warmed considerably when he continued. I was in the middle of a workout when I felt you fumbling with my cloak in this echo. If you wanted to strip off my clothes, all you needed to do was say so. There was a short pause. 
I must say, Lex, when you blush, it's very becoming. His tone could have melted the polar ice caps. I realized my eyes were closed when I felt the feather-light touch of his fingertips on the sides of my face. They traced my cheekbones, jawline, and chin, tilting my face up with the faintest pressure. You want me, he said. Admit it. I shook my head and squeezed my eyes shut more tightly. I was angry, no, pissed at him. I needed to hold on to that emotion. Admit it he whispered, so close I could feel his breath on my face. My eyes popped open, and my heart skipped a beat, or three. Not amber, but golden, blazing eyes trapped me. I'd never seen his eyes so light, and I suddenly realized that was what I'd remembered when I first awoke in the hospital. The memory of glorious, golden fire. I must have come too briefly, while he'd been transporting me to the hospital, and looked into his eyes, and felt safe. Staring into those eyes now, I involuntarily wet my lips. Marcus's fingers slid down my neck to trace my collarbones, then traveled back up to tangle in my hair. A tingling trail burned along my skin, invisibly marking every place he touched. He tightened his grasp preventing me from turning away. It was unnecessary. I was completely lost, a captive held in the prison of his eyes. I inhaled softly, my breath catching. One moment he was staring at me, into me. The next, his lips were parting mine. I gasped at the bruising intensity of the kiss. His tongue delved into my mouth, teasing mine out expertly. His arm dropped to my waist, pulling me against him so ardently that I had to stand on my tiptoes to remain tethered to the ground. Something about the jarring movement shook my brain awake, and I pushed against his bare chest. Until that gesture, I hadn't noticed that my traitorous hands were fondling his muscles. I'm angry, remember? I reminded myself. Marcus, I whispered more than a trace of warning contained in that one word. As he released his death grip on my hair, I maneuvered myself away from him, retreating through my open bedroom door. I didn't know why or how, but being too close to him tended to cloud my judgment until I could only make decisions based on the overwhelming desire I felt around him. It was like he unnaturally emitted an aphrodisiac designed specifically for me, and... I craved it when we were apart, but it went beyond lust, beyond desire. I felt good around him, safe and whole and at peace. I shook my head, trying to dispel my clearly delusional emotions. How I'd ever thought he was a plain old human was beyond me. I guess we only see what we want to see, what we expect to see. Lex, I can't trust you, I interrupted. I have no idea who you really are. I spun around. Marcus was standing in the doorway, just a few steps away. You're Nejere, and you've been watching me since before we met at the cafe, obviously. How long, Marcus? How long have you been spying on me? Anger and frustration flashed across Marcus's face so briefly that I almost missed it. And then, abruptly, his clothes changed. No longer in sneakers and basketball shorts, he wore tailored black trousers and a silver-gray button-down shirt, with the sleeves rolled up to reveal toned forearms. Hey, how'd you— I narrowed my eyes. You're not distracting me that easily. How long have you been watching me? He sighed melodramatically, like I was the one being difficult, when in reality— Everything was so obviously his fault. Since August, he finally said. He's been watching me for five whole months? Why? I spat. Because Alex requested it of me, he responded in kind. Believe me, Lex, I had much better things to do 
than watch over a woman who was unlikely to even manifest. Well, I did manifest, didn't I? I briefly wondered if sticking out my tongue would help get my point across. Then, I remembered where my tongue had just been, and blushed. Damn him. Yes, he purred and stalked toward me, his eyes devouring my every inch. You are manifesting quite nicely. Stop right there, I screeched, holding my hand up as I backed away from him. Marcus stopped, but he didn't look happy about it. Alex? As in Alexander? My grandpa asked you to keep an eye on me? I clarified, my voice too high. I'd only known that Alexander had asked Heru, a member of the Council of Seven, to watch over me. Not Marcus. Yes, Marcus said. A sudden, nauseating thought occurred to me. And the excavation. You didn't really need me to figure out the riddle on the tablet to find the entrance to the temple, did you? You could just look in the yacht. I took a deep breath, ignoring Marcus's slowly shaking head. Did you just offer me a position on the excavation because of Alexander too? No, he hissed. We couldn't find the entrance because the art has been manipulated. We can't find any of the echoes relating to it. Damn it, Lex. I wanted you on my team because you're good at what you do. Unbelievably good for someone so young. But also because... He shook his head, like he couldn't quite find the words to say what he meant. You started manifesting. You started manifesting and you know nothing of our people of our customs. Nobody expected you to manifest, so you were never trained in our ways. Other Nezirets will be participating in the excavation. I wanted to give you the chance to interact with others of our kind, to learn all that it means to be Nezire. If you wanted me to learn what it means to be Nezire, why didn't you just explain what was going on with me? I sounded so bitchy, I nearly cringed. Instead, I barreled on. Were you toying with me? Was it fun for you to- Marcus turned away abruptly, clenching his hands into fists at his sides. No, Lex, it wasn't fun for me. Just like it wasn't fun finding that piece of shit forcing himself on you. He spared a moment to glare at Mike's frozen body. I'd grown somewhat fond of you over the months, I disliked seeing you struggle so much, seeing you in such pain. But it was against the rules for me to tell you of our people, of your heritage, in rare cases like yours, where the Nejere knows absolutely nothing about his or her heritage. Only the nearest Nejere in your direct line is allowed to explain. I had to wait for Alex. Rules? Why are we running around following the rules of some council that doesn't even meet anymore? Suddenly, so exasperated that I had to move, I slipped around Marcus and out of the room. I paced from the bedroom door to the kitchen and back again, over and over. Not the council's rules, my grandfather's, Marcus said when he finally emerged from my bedroom. I waved my hand dismissively. And we should follow your grandfather's rules because... That time I did cringe at my snotty, juvenile tone. Because, little Ivanov, he's the great father. Marcus said quietly from right behind me. The great father, Nguyen, from whom we all descend, is Marcus's grandfather? I halted mid-stride only a few steps from the fridge. I could hear Marcus's footsteps as he approached behind me. Who are you? I whispered to the fridge. I just, I couldn't face him. I'm the grandson of Nguyen, he said, his voice hard. I'm a member of the Council of Seven, and I'm older than you can imagine. He was silent for a few moments, the sound of his breathing the only thing I could hear over my pounding heart. 
Finally, softly, he said, I'm also the man who didn't let you die. Hanging my head in shame, I started to apologize. Marcus, I'm... My words halted in mid-sentence as his second statement registered. I whirled to face him. There's no Marcus on the council. He took a step closer, and I stepped back. True, but I have many names, he explained, his eyes willing me to comprehend. You know who I am, Lex. Think about it. Set, Heru, Moses, Sid, Deadwin, Shang Di, Ivan. He definitely wasn't Ivan, my great grandpa. Not after the kiss. Set, Heru, Moses, Sid, Deadwin, Shang Di. He definitely wasn't Deadwin or Shang Di. Based on their mythological descriptions, one was a Nubian god, the other a Chinese deity. Set, Heru, Moses, Sid, Marcus Bahur, Marcus Bahur, Marcus Bahur, Bahur. I suddenly felt like the world's biggest idiot. Marcus took another step toward me, and I backed into the refrigerator. I halted his forward progress with a smile. Bahur, I said, of Heru. Clever, Marcus. Or should I say Heru? Heru, commonly known as Horus, was the fierce Egyptian god of kingship and war, whose beautiful eyes had led to one of the most famous ancient Egyptian symbols, the Wed Jat, otherwise known as the Eye of Horus. Marcus, who had kissed me, was Heru. It was impossible, but then a lot of impossible things had been happening lately. When I said his true name, he cringed, shaking his head. He explained, I hate the way that name sounds on these lips. He brushed his thumb across my bottom lip for emphasis. You say Heru, like you're talking about a god. Someone untouchable, unknowable. But when you say Marcus, you're talking about a man. A man can be known. Touched. With my palms pressed against the cool refrigerator door, I said, Marcus. I was surprised by the sultriness in my voice. Mm, yes. Lex. I do so love the way you say that name. My name. The way it rises from your tongue. Marcus remarked, raising his arms to press his hands against the freezer door on either side of my head. His arms flexed, and he leaned closer. Marcus, I whispered. He bent his neck, bringing his lips inches from mine. The muscles and tendons of his neck formed thick cords as he hovered, letting his quickened breath mix with mine. It was tantalizing, empowering, tormenting. Marcus, I don't, I, I need, I forced myself to look at Mike, and then the wounded version of myself. I need time, which was something I doubted a man as tantalizing and intimidating as Marcus would be willing to give me. Ah, uh, but Lex, we are Nejere. We have an eternity. By the time our courtship is through, you'll beg me to take you to bed, he whispered near my ear, before leaning back, keeping a hair's breadth between us from head to toe. And even then, I may make you wait. Every molecule of air disappeared from my lungs, and all of my blood set a direct route to my groin, spilling heat and tension through my lower abdomen. I was nothing but desire for the man in front of me, the god. Without thought, I closed the minuscule distance between us, softly brushing my lips against his. I savored his deliciously spicy scent. Instantly, 
Marcus shifted forward, pressing me more firmly against the fridge. Marcus, I breathed, and it was the last thing I said for several long, glorious seconds. Lex, you should know, he said, kissing the sensitive skin beneath my ear, that what happens in the art isn't real. These aren't our actual bodies. This isn't actually happening. And we've never really kissed. I could feel him grin. I think I'll make you wait for the real thing. Maybe for days. Maybe for weeks. I whimpered. Gently, he kissed me one last time. He was teasing me. I'll see you in the morning, he whispered. In a flicker of color, I was sitting on my couch with Thora curled up in my lap, leaning the back of my head against the couch. I sighed. Chapter 16 Do and Don't I shouldn't have been surprised when I found Marcus lounging outside the entrance to my building the following morning. Shouldn't have been, but was. He leaned with his back against the building's worn bricks, staring up into a sky that was almost perfectly clear. The stark contrast of his very short, very dark hair and long, black eyelashes against the rich, golden hues of his skin and eyes was even more striking in the early morning sunlight. As usual, he was impeccably dressed in slate-gray, tailored slacks and a black wool coat. And over it all, he wore confidence like he invented it. He embodied what almost every man wanted to be, and who almost every woman wanted to be with. Where's the photographer? I asked as I exited the building. His enthralling gaze locked onto me, and with the faintest shift in facial muscles, his jaw became more chiseled, his lower lip more luscious. He was so goddamn good at being irresistible. It was preposterous. Slinking down several concrete steps, I closed the distance between us. I dressed carefully, picking out a snug, boat-neck crimson sweater and my most flattering jeans, paired with dark leather boots that nearly reached my knees. With my second favorite coat, a hip-length forest green pea coat, my ensemble emphasized the few curves my slender body actually had. From the way Marcus's eyes narrowed as I approached, I could tell my clothing choice was having the desired effect. I wanted him to crave me so badly that he'd forego his ridiculous claim that nothing would happen between us for days or even weeks. I wanted, no, I needed his real physical lips to press against mine, his hands to caress me in a moment of uncontrollable passion, I needed evidence that whatever was happening between us was real. I needed something in my life to feel real. Mimicking his pose, I leaned against the brick wall beside him, our wool sleeves nearly touching. The way we look, it's just part of being Nigeré, Marcus said, silkily. I cocked my head, watching him watch me. We change more in the year after we manifest than in the rest of our long lives, and then we are forever altered, not human, other. He sounded slightly disgusted. Does he not like being Nejere? I don't care, I said, hoping to dispel his suddenly glum mood. If I were a photographer, I'd beg you to be my model. Admittedly, part of me was trying to provoke him, trying to get him to loosen his rigid control. I was hoping to reduce days or weeks to seconds or minutes. Rotating abruptly, Marcus planted his hands on either side of me and blocked the outside world with his body. Somehow, not an inch of him was touching me. I wanted to growl in frustration. What? will change about you, little Ivanov, he whispered. Apparently, he'd taken a liking to manipulating my grandfather's surname 
into his own pet name for me. The cage of flesh and bone was redundant. Marcus's penetrating gaze, again more gold than amber, pinned me in place better than any physical restraints possibly could. Why can't I keep you just as you are? Maybe I won't change, I said softly. He chuckled, causing goosebumps to pebble my skin. You've already started. Your eyes have deviated so far from normal human coloring that you'll have to start wearing contacts soon. Is that what you do? I asked. Usually, his eyes were a rich, black-rimmed amber color, but today they paled to liquid gold. When he nodded, I said, but not always. The corner of his mouth quirked. No, not always. I reached my right hand up and traced the sharp contours around his eye, from brow to cheekbone. I like you better like this. All natural, he smirked, raising a single eyebrow. So, um, what were your big changes? I asked, running my fingers along his jaw. I couldn't imagine a single piece of him different than it was at that moment. It's hard to describe. Maybe I'll take you back sometime. Let you decide, he said. I was about to tell him that I might just peek into the past on my own, that maybe I didn't need him to guide me around the ought. But he leaned down, inching his mouth past my lips, chin, jaw, never touching. Speech evaded me. With his nose barely skimming the skin beneath my ear, he inhaled. The noise he made upon exhaling was rough and animalistic, both satisfied and laden with unfulfilled need. Again, I could feel the blood rushing to my belly, and lower, moistening and swelling certain sensitive parts in preparation for what my body wanted, for what I wanted. Time to go, Lex, he said, his voice barely audible and entwined the fingers of one hand with mine. He pulled me away from the wall, and hand in hand, we headed toward Denny Hall and the work that awaited us. After hours of phone calls and emails arranging interviews with potential field school students, I finally left the pit and stepped outside to stretch my legs. I found it slightly amusing that I'd done nothing remotely archaeological for the past two days, not since deciphering the riddle at the end of Senenmut's tablet and possibly discovering the secret temple entrance, and instead was helping Dominic arrange the field school logistics, interviewing, selecting, and prepping the students, who would be the rough equivalent of his slaves, for several months, was apparently too menial a task for Marcus. Help Dom, Marcus had told me as we'd arrived that morning. But... Shouldn't I be using my deciphering skills? What happened to... Your job is to uncover Hatshepsut's many secrets, Miss Larson. I'd asked him, doing a fair job of imitating his confident tone and complex accent. He chuckled. You've already advanced us greatly with the tablet. Now, I need you to help Dominic. If you say so, boss, I'd teased before joining Dominic at the far end of the room. Marcus had disappeared from the pit shortly thereafter, and I hadn't seen him since. Early in the afternoon, I left the warmth of Denny Hall, intending to take a walk despite the weeping sky. Once outside, I made it about twenty feet. Just as I was nearing the building's southwest corner, the sound of two very angry voices stopped me in my tracks. Marcus and Nephi. Unabashedly, I slinked closer to the smooth, gray stone wall, inching toward the corner and the argument. You are unbelievable, Nephi shouted in exasperation. I cast my lot with you, put my trust in you for how many years? And now, now you want to risk it all for some, some... As I said, child, this is none of your concern, Marcus growled. Child. Me? She is the child. Why her? 
Huh? After so long, why her? At least tell me that, Nephi yelled, in a tone so cold I could almost feel the weak rain turning to icy needles, Marcus warned. You forget yourself, girl. I forget nothing, Nephi hissed right before she barreled around the corner, straight into me. Crap, I exclaimed. Had I not just been caught eavesdropping on a woman who seemed to despise me and the man I desperately wanted to jump into bed with? Nephi's expression would have been funny. Instead, seeing her perfectly made-up face frozen in shock, seeing her artfully arranged curls out of place, made me cringe. She looked scary as hell. A normal person would step back and attempt to compose themselves if they ran headlong into someone else. Nephi was far from normal. She leaned in close and whispered, If you ruin this, I swear. Razor-sharp, lyrically beautiful syllables cut off her mid-threat. I had no idea what Marcus had just said, but Nephi's reaction, her features going slack as she stumbled backward, told me he hadn't been talking about fluffy bunnies and milkshakes. She rushed into the building, or at least, I think she rushed into the building. My attention had been completely hijacked by the thundercloud of a man approaching me. How much did you hear? He asked, his voice hard. Um, I'm not sure. It didn't really make sense. With a frigid laugh, Marcus said, No, I don't imagine it did. Are you two, or were you two, you know, involved? I asked, shakily. It had sounded like a lover's spat, and I really wasn't interested in taking on an other woman role, not even for Marcus. His responding laugh shed some of the chill, sounding almost tepid. No, Lex, definitely not. I felt a sudden rush of relief. Oh, Nephi won't bother you again. But perhaps you should go home for the day, he suggested. Thank you, but no. I don't know if she thinks this excavation belongs to her or what, but I won't let her drive me away. Marcus's lips pursed slightly, like he was trying not to smile. Very well, he said. Just don't leave too late. I'll pick you up at seven this evening. Don't forget. Unwilling to let him tease me into a pile of goo again, I stood up straighter. I'm going to get back to work. I'll walk you up, Marcus said, leading the way to the door and holding it open. So... What's the plan for tonight? Where are we going? It's a surprise. For what seemed like the first time in my life, I was ready early. I'd been sitting in my usual kitchen chair, shaking the leather-clad foot of my crossed leg, when the knock sounded at the door. I bounced up and clacked across the hardwood floor in my knee-high boots. I opened the door and offered a breathy, Hi. Marcus looked more amazing than usual in an impeccably tailored charcoal suit and a faintly striped white dress shirt. The top two buttons were undone, making him look a little relaxed and slightly less intimidating than usual. His golden tiger eyes scanned me slowly from my toes up, narrowing to predatory slits by the time they reached my face. Mmm, legs, he purred. You look ravishing. I blushed at the compliment. I was wearing the only remotely acceptable date dress I had. It was a form-fitting, burgundy silk sheath that reached just below mid-thigh. I'd left my hair down, its dark, loose waves reaching the bottom of my shoulder blades. You don't look too bad yourself, I mused, watching his eyes glitter at the understated compliment. Marcus, I was sure was more used to women saying things like, Oh, you're so beautiful, do me right now, or you're the most handsome man I've ever seen. Sure, I was thinking both at the moment, but I figured his ego didn't need any additional boosting. He sighed dramatically. As much as I hate to say it, 
I must advise you to cover your delectable outfit with a warm coat. It's snowing. He said snowing like it was a disgusting wad of gum stuck to the bottom of one of his Armani shoes. What? Really? I asked, instantly giddy. Abandoning Marcus in the open doorway, I rushed to the living room window to peer out into the night. Outside of the pools of light coming from the street lamps, large, fluffy flakes of snow were nearly invisible, making the glowing areas look like conical snow globes. Do you always get this excited about snow? Marcus asked from directly behind me, slipping the sleeves of a black wool trench coat, my third favorite coat, up my bare arms and over my shoulders. <laughs> no, I said, laughing. Only in this city. It never snows here. I see, he said, reaching around me to fasten the top button of my coat. Unlike the previous time he'd tried to bundle me up, I didn't swat his hands away. He moved closer, pressing the front of his suit against my backside from shoulders to mid-thigh. His delicious, spicy scent, like a mixture of cinnamon and nutmeg, enveloped me, along with his arms. Even through the fabric of our clothing, his body felt like layers of powerful, hard-packed muscle. I let my arms dangle, feeling electrically alive with his immense strength wrapped so gently around me. It was like I was a kitten in the lethal clutches of a panther, and I'd never felt more safe. His wrists lightly skimmed my breasts several times as he fitted the first black disc through its intended slit, with each descending button an increasingly familiar fluttering amplified in my abdomen. It began like the usual butterflies that burst into life whenever I was around a man I was interested in. But by the third button, located a few inches below my navel, the butterflies had morphed into something larger and more substantial. By the fourth and final button, located directly over my pubic bone, I felt like I had a charm of hummingbirds buzzing around inside me, my whole body thrumming with their frenzied rhythm. Marcus lingered long enough on that lowest enclosure to assure me of his eventual intentions, without seeming overtly improprietous. Oh, he definitely seemed improprietous, just not overtly so. When he stepped away, my breathing was noticeably quickened, and I'd forgotten the snow entirely. Somehow, putting on a heavy winter coat had been the single most erotic experience of my entire life. Damn, I'm in way over my head. Marcus cleared his throat. We should go. I took a moment to compose myself before turning. Certainly, I said, with forced cheerfulness. I didn't want to go anywhere. I wanted to stand in that exact spot while the man before me removed everything I was wearing with the same agonizing attention he'd used to button my coat. I accepted his outstretched arm, slipping my hand into the crook of his elbow, and we departed my apartment. We left behind most of the sexual tension. Unfortunately, Marcus created the stuff like an industrial fog machine. So what kind of car is this, anyway? I asked, as he helped me into the same low coupe he'd driven me home in days before. It was slate gray, sleek, and a perfect match for its driver. An Aston Martin Vantage, Marcus told me, getting into the driver's side. Oh, wow, I said trying not to touch anything unnecessarily. I was about as far as you could get from being a car person, but I wasn't completely clueless. It's, um, really nice. He laughed, a deep, throaty sound. I agree. It's my favorite. I couldn't tell if he meant it was his favorite car in the world or his favorite among his own car collection. He's not just an archaeologist. I reminded myself. He's Negere, and a member of the Council of Seven. The short drive passed in aching, palpable silence, 
Though most of my mental power was focused on not jumping the driver, I did manage to spare a few thoughts about where we were going. We skirted the western edge of campus and its many apartment buildings until we reached Ravenna, the adorable neighborhood abutting the university's northern edge. Fraternities and sororities filled the first few blocks with their deceptively beautiful exteriors, slowly giving way to the ivy-covered porches and manicured gardens of a truly residential area. Some of the university's wealthier faculty members and scholars occupied the stately mixture of brick homes and craftsman bungalows. Unless there's an unmarked restaurant here, I'm assuming this is your house, I said as we pulled into a narrow gravel driveway. In Ravenna, the presence of any driveway was a sign of luxury, not that the house needed it. I examined my new surroundings as I emerged from the car. The house was ash gray, with white trim and had an adorable porch spanning the entire front. The centered brick steps leading up to the porch were lined with clay pots, brimming with purple, red, and white pansies. Welcome to my home away from home, Marcus said as he reached for my hand and led me into the house. On the walk from entryway to dining room, I peered around at the warm furnishings and tasteful decorations. It was comfy, but nothing I would have expected from Marcus, decor-wise. In the dining room, a square oak table was set for two, with the extravagant complexity and perfection of an Edwardian steward. There were more pieces of silverware than I knew what to do with. Why, Marcus, I said, laughing. Are you making me dinner? He chuckled as he held out the chair before the nearest place setting, waiting for me to sit. He sat at the spot on the adjacent side of the table and said, Definitely not. My culinary repertoire is, his lips widened to a self-effacing grin, dated. Breakfast is my strong point. His grin turned wicked, knowing. What do you prefer in your omelets, little Ivanov? I, of course, blushed furiously at the implication that he would one day be making me breakfast, likely after I'd spent the night tangled with him in bed. I'd never been a big blusher, and it was becoming an irritating habit. Like the flip of a switch, Marcus's face blanked, and he explained, My man, Carlyle, is preparing everything tonight. His food is as good as any I've ever eaten which is saying something. Besides, I thought we'd need the privacy. His lips quirked, but his face remained expressionless. For your questions, of course. I raised my eyebrows at his veiled presumptions. Before I could comment, a man, Carlyle, entered the room carrying two small plates. He definitely wasn't the seasoned, older gentleman I'd expected, for someone Marcus regarded as such a talented chef. After Marcus introduced us, Carlyle set the plates in front of us and retreated through a door that I assumed led to the kitchen. Carlyle is different than I'd expected, I remarked. I had to admit, the man was exceptionally talented, at least from a presentation standpoint. He turned a salad into a minimalistic composition of edible art, Taking a small bite, I noticed that the little bundle of color on my plate was at least as delicious as it was beautiful. With sliced heirloom beets, apple, and pickled fennel, all lightly glazed with a tangy vinaigrette, Marcus chuckled as he chewed. Don't let his appearance fool you. What do you... He's Negere? Marcus nodded. And he serves you? I asked doubtfully. Doesn't he need to do Negere things? With another chuckle, Marcus clarified, He works for me, Lex. We are born Negere, like humans are born human or cats are born cats. It's not our occupation. Negere is what we are, but we decide what we do. Oh, I said, a little abashed at my assumption. So Carlyle is a personal chef. Nodding, Marcus finished his bite. In a way, yes. We all find something we excel at. Something we enjoy more than anything else. 
Call it our, he paused, thinking, our passion. For Carlyle, it's the culinary arts and organizing things, people. You name it, he can whip it into working shape. I was quiet for a few minutes, contemplating Marcus's words while I finished my salad. And you? I finally asked, leading in with interest. What's your passion? Marcus waited for Carlyle to switch out our plates before answering. Instead of a mini salad, I now had two delicately flavored fish tacos, blessedly more substantial than the previous course. I started eating, not so patiently waiting for Marcus's response. I'm a fighter, a warrior, he eventually said. Lex, you know I'm on the council. Well, my role there is militaristic. I'm our people's general. It's what I'm good at. And what I enjoy. His serious tone implied something graver than his words alone suggested. Something I had yet to grasp. Slowly, I shook my head, feeling a crease appear between my eyebrows. Damn it, Lex, Marcus said with surprising ferocity and I flinched imperceptibly. You must understand this. He held my eyes, his demanding stare boring into me. Strategy and death. That's what I am. It's what I've been for millennia. Is he trying to scare me off? He was a fool if he was, and Marcus was no fool. The embodiment of tranquility, I said. That's very interesting. Interesting. He looked baffled. Yeah, Marcus. Interesting. You hurt people. Like you hurt Mike, I thought. You kill people. I glanced down at my plate, considering how best to say what I felt. I get it, and... Um, I'm okay with it. At least I was fairly certain that I was. How many battles has he fought? How many wars has he been a part of? Were they human wars or other, unknown to me, Negere wars? How much death has he caused? Exactly how old are you, anyway? Caught off guard by my question, Marcus's domineering presence evaporated. While I waited for his response, I ate. Everything. Carlyle was a genius. Marcus took his time eating and watching me, not speaking. Okay, I said, realizing he wasn't going to answer. So, Heru, Horus, is the god named after you or you after him? I asked, using a less direct tactic. It would at least give me an over-under. Please say you're named after the god, I thought. Please tell me you're under 5,000 years old. Are you sure you want to know? The truth is the truth, but you cannot unknow it. After reading my silence as acquiescence, he looked into my eyes and answered my question. I inspired the myths. My stomach dropped. Oh my god, I said, at a loss for real, meaningful words. If he inspired the Heru myths, then he had to be at least 5,000 years old, give or take a millennia or two, the world had changed so much in that time. Civilizations had risen and fallen. Thousands of wars had been fought. Had he been involved in most of them? All of them? How could a relationship between us ever work? How could I ever be enough for a man who'd walked the earth for more than five millennia? I shook my head back and forth, staring at him with eyes wide from both shock and awe. You? You're... My God. Carlyle, Marcus called out. Bring wine with the next course. Numb, I looked down at the suddenly full plate before me. A plump fillet of beef tempted me with its promised deliciousness. But Marcus is older than Alexander. Older than the Egyptian civilization. How many people has he killed? How many women has he slept with? How many has he loved? How many children has he fathered? How many? 
Marcus said nothing else for a long time, other than telling Carlyle to leave the bottle while I worked through my questions. I demolished the steak and wine with an intensity usually reserved for kneading bread or beating the crap out of someone. And suddenly, unexpectedly, I decided that it didn't matter. It didn't matter that my life so far had been a blink in comparison to his, or that he might grow bored of me in another blink. I wouldn't let my self-doubt get in the way of knowing the man who'd inspired one of ancient Egypt's most beloved and fearsome gods. I wanted to know Heru. I wanted to know Marcus. I wanted to know him. Okay, I said. What else? For a moment, I thought he might ignore me, staring as he was at his empty plate. Josh, Dominic, and Nephi are Nejore. They know that you are, too. Okay, I said quietly. He held his breath for a moment. And Nephi is my daughter. He sounded resolute in his defeat, like with that statement, I would run for the hills, shunning him, his excavation, and our people as I fled. I thought about Marcus's age and Nephi's status as a Nejaret, and a horrid, cold feeling seeped into my spine. What's Nephi's full name, Marcus? Nefurer. Nefurer, I repeated, as in Hatshepsut's daughter. Yes, he finished for me. Oh my god, I whispered. Nefurer, the daughter of the famous female pharaoh, had disappeared from historical record as a young woman. Her mummy had never been found, though a tomb had been constructed for her. Well, I guess that explains the mystery of the missing princess, I thought. Marcus refilled our wine glasses, emptying the bottle between us, but remained quiet. The others, are they your kids too? Josh and Dominic? When I nodded, he said, no. Carlyle? I asked, no. Carlyle is only a few centuries old, and I haven't fathered a child in over a thousand years, Marcus explained. Our plates were replaced twice more, and a second bottle of wine had been brought out while I processed the information. Finally, Marcus said, You must have other questions, Lex. Now is the time to ask them. It was the understatement of the century. I had other questions like stray dogs had fleas. What are your talents? Obviously you can cloak yourself or whatever the correct terminology is. But do you have any others? I asked, genuinely curious. For the briefest moment, Marcus looked offended, but the dark emotion quickly melted into amusement. You should know, Lex, that asking a Nejere about his talents is akin to asking a woman how many men she's bedded. So how many men have you bedded? I waved his question away. But Alexander didn't mind, I explained. I, I don't need to know everything. It's okay. I'm sorry if that was rude. I looked down at my hands, which were resting on my lap, wondering if there was any way to hide my sudden shame. Lex, Marcus said, his tone like honey dripping onto white-hot coals. I'm not offended. If I were weak or had no talents, I might be, but I'm neither of those things. Just be mindful in the future of whom you ask that question, okay? After a weak nod, I raised my eyes to meet his. He smiled, genuinely. My main talents are that I'm a manipulator, which includes the cloak you witnessed, and the tracker, so I can follow another's ba as it journeys through the art. His gaze turned sharp, and he said, Quid pro quo, little Ivanov. Have you discovered any talents yet? Yeah, I'm a finder, and to some degree I'm a seer. I responded nonchalantly. Inside, I was bubbling, eager for his approval. For the first time, Marcus was visibly stunned. I hope you realize how unusual it is for one of our kind to discover so many talents within a few weeks of manifesting. Sure, I guess, 
I said, when in reality, I hadn't realized it. Even with Alexander's proud, grandfatherly reaction to my skills. Taking a sip from my recently refilled wine glass, I bolstered my nerve. I'd overstepped one huge boundary already, so I figured it wouldn't hurt to jump over a few more. Alexander was able to test me for the finding talent. Can you do the same with me for manipulating and tracking? Marcus looked into my eyes, his black-rimmed gold meeting my sienna, as he silently struggled with something. He licked his lips before speaking, an unusual display of nerves. For tracking, yes. But there's no need to test for manipulating. Why not? You don't think it's possible? I asked, feeling slighted. You know, I might surprise you. Evidently. He took a long, deep breath through his nose. There's no need to test you for the manipulating talent because we already know you can do it. What? I asked, my mouth open in surprise. Patiently, he explained. You lifted my cloak in the echo. Only a manipulator, someone who could alter the very fabric of the art, could achieve such a feat. Oh. Um, sorry for getting snippy, I apologized. Don't be. I like when you're snippy. And with that simple phrase, the business side of our conversation evaporated. Do you live here alone? I asked, glancing around the unmarcus like decor. Carlyle stays here, as does Nephi, he replied cautiously reminding me of his 3,500-year-old daughter, who seemed to despise me. Is that normal for you and Nephi? Does she also live with you in Oxford? Before he could answer, a thought occurred to me, and I added, Are you really a visiting professor from Oxford, or is that just a cover for being Nejere? Smiling, Marcus said, It's not just a cover. I enjoy it though I rarely actually teach humans. There are quite a few Nejarets at Oxford, and I focus my attention on them, helping them get the degrees they need to do what they want to do in the human world. And thankfully, no, I don't usually cohabitate with my daughter. I love her dearly, but after millennia, we'd slaughter each other if we spent too much time together. We're only sharing this little house now because of its convenient location near campus. And truthfully, we almost never occupy it at the same time. My line has another, much larger compound on Bainbridge Island. Nephi prefers it and she finds the daily ferry rides calming. I made a very unladylike snort, thinking Nephi could use a little more calming. Hesitantly, I asked, is there, well, is there a particular reason why she's so hostile toward me? Marcus's slow, silky smile was half the answer. She's worried I won't be able to focus on my work. But it's just an excavation. How was that at all interesting when you lived through the time period you were uncovering? His raised eyebrows and pursed lips seemed to say, Come on, Lex, I expected more from you. Think about it. Several puzzle pieces suddenly snapped into place. Nguyen, father of Nejere kind, as Nun, Hatshepsut, and Marcus. The mention of Set and Nguyen on Senenmut's tablet, a Nejere excavation surrounding a secret temple that had been hidden by someone manipulating the ought, the nothingness in the future ought. I slapped my forehead. Oh my god, how could I be so blind? The whole excavation is about the solstice, isn't it? It's about trying to stop the nothingness from taking over the possible futures in the yacht. You think there's something in Senenmut's secret temple that can prevent it? Reading the subtle approval in Marcus's eyes, I thought back on the tablet I'd deciphered. Senenmut had written that Nun's power, creation, was locked away in the secret temple. Marcus! I exclaimed, breathily. Are you telling me that Nun's, Nguyen's power, is a real thing? That it's really in there? He nodded, 
one slight, sharp movement. Oh, well, that's just, just crazy, impossible, terrifying, Marcus offered. Yes, I quite agree. And what makes it even worse is that we don't really know what this power is. I knew him, Lex. I spent time with him, and he never seemed anything but the strongest of us all. He looked around, shaking his head with frustration, or possibly disbelief. I've spent millennia wondering what his mysterious power might be, and he laughed bitterly. I just don't know. While I processed Marcus's revelations, Carlyle brought out dessert, two small plates and a tray containing a variety of delicate confections. He added a clear, dainty bottle of toque to the table for good measure. Marcus poured a few inches of the dessert wine into each of our glasses. It was the color of golden raisins. I popped a bite-sized fruit tart, lemon custard contained in flaky, buttery crust, and topped with a blueberry, raspberry, and strawberry slice into my mouth. It was heavenly. Swallowing, I studied my wine glass and looked at Marcus. If I didn't know any better, I'd say you were trying to get me drunk for nefarious purposes, Professor Bahur, I said, purposely diverting our conversation to a lighter subject. After all of the delicious food and wine, I was hardly in the best state of mind to contemplate such serious matters as mysterious powers and the impending nothingness. Marcus licked a bit of chocolate filling from a tiny cream puff off the tip of his thumb. But, Miss Larson, what would possibly make you think you know better? Because you won't make it that easy, I said, completely unsure of my words. Perhaps he purred, and perhaps not. He leaned forward, as if he might whisper some forbidden secret, and I suddenly felt his fingertips tracing the top of my boot. His thumb played tenderly with the back of my knee. Closing my eyes, I shuddered involuntarily. His gentle touch sent bolts of electricity along my nerves, I couldn't believe the sensations he was eliciting simply by touching my knee. Deliberately, he inched his hand up the bare skin of my outer thigh, pausing halfway up. My heart felt like it had been relocated to my groin, and with each pump, like it might explode. My breaths became shorter, quicker, my lungs tightening every time I inhaled. But only if you beg. Marcus whispered. His words from when we'd been in the echo together resounded in my head. By the time our courtship is through, you'll beg me to take you to bed. Will you do it now? So soon? He asked. So easily? My eyes shot open, then narrowed to slits. You'll have to try harder, Marcus, I said softly. His smile was roguish as he whispered, You have no idea how much I wanted to hear you say that. He withdrew his hand. I rearranged my skirt and crossed my legs, emphasizing my decision. It was possible that one day I would beg, but one day, I decided, so would he. It's late. I should get you home, Marcus said, taking another sip of the golden dessert wine before standing. Can we walk? I asked, accepting his offered hand. I wanted to extend my time with him, and the cool night air sounded refreshing. It's snowing, he objected. Exactly. Can you walk that far in those boots? And in the snow? He asked, suspiciously. He led the way back to the front door collecting my coat from a closet along the way. Seriously, Marcus, it's not that far. Besides, I was a ballet dancer growing up. I've done a lot more in far less comfortable shoes. I could feel his eyes examining every inch of my body, devouring my every movement as I shrugged into my coat. Ballet, hmm. One side of his mouth turned up in a sly grin. 
That explains so much. Like what? Wear these, he said, handing me some fur-lined black leather gloves and wrapping the softest scarf I'd ever felt around my neck. The way you walk, the way you move, just the way you are. You're graceful. It's very appealing. Hmm, I mused. Finding out what attracted him to me gave me confidence, and equally important, power. Marcus had been using his enigmatic and unavoidable sex appeal to manipulate me since our first official meeting at the bar. The scales were beginning to even out, at least a little. Marcus pulled my hair out from the charcoal gray scarf and arranged it on my shoulders. Whose are these? I asked, holding up my gloved hands and touching the scarf. Nephies, he informed me. Oh, maybe I shouldn't wear them. I began to pull the gloves off, but Marcus stopped me. She'll never notice they're gone. The girl has more clothing than a department store, he said irritably. So says the guy with an Aston Martin and a suit for every day of the century. Shall we, he said, opening the front door. I took his proffered arm and together we stepped into the gently falling snow. We took a path through campus letting the empty streets and brick buildings transport us to an earlier time period. You're very tall, I said, breaking the silence halfway through the midnight stroll. Correct. I laughed softly. No, I meant, how are you so tall? You were born thousands of years ago. You shouldn't be anywhere near as tall as you are. Also correct, he said, infuriating me, probably on purpose. So? He chuckled. Before I manifested, I was around your height, maybe a bit taller. I was tall for the time and among my people. But one of the changes we all experience is the fulfillment of our physical potential. Had I grown up with ideal nutrition and care, I would have reached my current height. But that was impossible then. The changes. The cellular regeneration. It fixes all of that. Huh. So, I won't be as tall as you in a year, right? I asked, seeking confirmation. You've grown up in a time and place that provided you with all of the nutrients you needed. So, thankfully, no. I was never a big fan of the Amazon mythology. I doubt you'll even gain an inch. This is all so strange, you know? It's like a dream I could wake from any moment, I said, my voice hushed. Marcus's arm tensed in mine. Would you want to wake up? He sounded a little sad. I hugged his arm with both of mine and said, not anymore. When Marcus abruptly stopped, I almost slipped on the slick brick path. With his free hand, he turned me to face him. His cool, leather-clad fingers cupped either side of my face tilting it up so he could examine my features better in the light of a distant street lamp. I could feel the faint kiss of each snowflake as it landed on my face. What are you, Alexandra Ivanov? He breathed. What are you and what are you doing to me? As his deep, silky voice released each word into the starless night, he leaned closer. Our individual white puffs of breath slowly merged, becoming indistinguishable. But, shh, little Ivanov, he murmured, closing the distance between our mouths. His lips touched mine with the faintest possible pressure, brushing first one way, then the other. When I tried to deepen the kiss, he pulled back just enough to maintain the maddening softness. I slipped my fingertips into his coat pockets, pulling his body closer to mine, and groaned in frustration. I wanted more. I needed more. One of Marcus's arms dropped lower, his palm pressing into my lower back, and he grasped the nape of my neck with his other hand. He'd understood my desire. He'd complied. His burning lips worked furiously against mine, and his tongue delved into my mouth exploring my own with a skill and sensuality 
I'd never before experienced. Purposefully, I not so gently bit his lower lip, earning a growl. He responded by shifting his hand from my back to the swell of my hips and pulling me even closer to him. His fervent mouth laid a trail of fire across my cheek and jaw, then down to the tender flesh of my neck. His lips became feather light, perfectly straddling the line between tingle and tickle. Beg me, he whispered against my skin, making me shiver. Beg me to take you, right here, right now. I whimpered. I really, really wanted to. Beg me, Lex, he repeated, shifting his leg so it pressed against my coat's conveniently placed lowest button. I moaned brazenly. Lex, beg me, he said roughly. I could hear in his voice that nothing less than my desperate pleading would make him take the next step. Oh, I was almost certain that he wanted me just as badly as I wanted him. But I was starting to understand him. This man, who'd inspired millennia-old myths, who'd seen the Egyptian, Greek, and Roman civilizations rise and fall. For Marcus, sex was about more than desire. It was also about control. In the heat of the moment, I almost acquiesced. I almost begged him to lift my skirt and take me in the shadows of the abandoned midnight campus, but I wasn't ready to give up the little piece of control I had left in my life. No, I whispered, the single word audibly hoarse. Embarrassingly, I was pretty much panting from the way his leg was manipulating that damn button. With a throaty laugh, Marcus returned his attention to my lips, kissing them tenderly. You will. Soon. I hope you're prepared to wait, I said with a victorious smile. In my head, I was wondering if I would even be able to hold out until the following day. He kissed me one last time before moving his mouth to my ear and whispering, however long, little Ivanov, it will be worth the wait. Chapter 17 Show and Tell Are you planning to do this every morning? I asked Marcus, who currently had his arm draped over my shoulders as we walked to Denny Hall. It was drizzling as usual, but I didn't care. Why? Marcus murmured, glancing down at me. I shrugged. I'd just like to know what to expect. I don't like being disappointed. And if I wasn't waiting outside your apartment building to walk you to a classroom in which we would be spending the day together, would you be disappointed? His tone was too unconcerned, too disinterested. He really wanted to know the answer. Oh, I don't know. Hmm. I stopped walking in the middle of the cement path and rose on tiptoes to plant an undeniably steamy kiss on his lips, unconcerned that other people were passing around us. Yes, Marcus, I said, resuming our meandering pace. I'd be very disappointed. Well then, yes. I plan to do this every morning he replied. That is, every morning until we wake up together. I didn't know you were planning on staying in Seattle for years, I teased. Years, <laughs> he chortled, like it was the most ridiculous thing he'd ever heard. It was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever said. But still, he was a cocky bastard. Have you spoken to Alexander in the past few days? I asked. If Marcus was surprised by the drastic change of subject, he didn't show it. No. Why? So he doesn't know that I know about you and the others? And he doesn't know we've been all over each other for the past two days? No, Marcus said. There was something, many things to be sure, he wasn't telling me. But then there was something I wasn't telling him. And the others on the team? They don't know that I know their are do they? No. 
Will you do me a favor? I asked tentatively. He narrowed his eyes and looked at me askance. That would depend on the favor. Oh no, Marcus wasn't on the verge of professing his undying love. To declare he'd do anything for the woman currently holding his attention. Just don't let anyone know that I know about you and the others until tomorrow. Please. I added the last word for good measure. That was phase one of my plan. I had just set a platter of oven-fried chicken on the table between a serving bowl of mashed potatoes and a gravy boat when Alexander knocked on the door. It was exactly eight o'clock. Pleasantly, I greeted my grandpa, and we headed to the table. Anxiety and excitement flooded my veins as I hurtled into phase two of my plan. I'd really like to be able to trust you, Alexander, I began, scooping mashed potatoes onto my plate. My grandpa looked acceptably confused. You can trust me, he said, meeting my eyes. I thought I could believe him, and I desperately wanted to. Lately, my world had been one big tangle of lies and half-truths. Some people lied to protect me, like my parents and Grandma Sue's, while others withheld valuable information because it was against the rules, or for completely unknown reasons, like Marcus, Dr. Issa, and Genevieve. Alexander, too, hadn't given me the full truth, leaving out several important pieces of information, like, your new boss is Nejere, and I had someone spying on you for the past six months. I'd never been one to surround myself with crowds of acquaintances. Instead, preferring to keep a few true friends, close confidants who I could trust completely. At the moment, I had a grand total of zero true friends. It was time to figure out who I could add to that category. I know about Marcus, I told Alexander, after I'd finished dishing food onto my plate. At his quizzical head cocking, I realized he might not know that name, so I clarified, Heru. What other names will I use if I end up living as long as Alexander and Marcus? Alexander set down his fork with a soft clink. I see. And what exactly do you know about Heru? It was time for the truth test. Tell me what I should know, and I'll tell you if I do. When his mouth pinched and his eyes narrowed, I said, I'm sorry, Alexander but I really need you to do this. I need to know I can trust at least one person in my out-of-control life. Desperation resounded in my voice. Alexander took a deep breath and held it, studying me. Finally, he exhaled. Heru has been my closest friend for over 1,500 years, which is why I asked him to keep an eye on you, just in case you manifested. It was a very large favor to ask of him, considering his position on the council and the unlikelihood of you manifesting. But he owed me. This is delicious, by the way, Alexander said, taking a bite of chicken. Tastes just like Sue's used to make for me, back when she could stand to be in my presence long enough to cook and share a meal. Thank you, I said, watching him. I decided he wasn't trying to change the subject, but was just being kind. I dug in, eating while he spoke. I'd been watching you for a couple of years, since everyone manifests between age 18 and 25. You were nearing the end of the window, so I was fairly certain it wouldn't happen. But I called in a favor from Heru anyway. He only agreed because he could still plan the big excavation, using your university as a hub. Alexander seemed to consider his next words carefully. I've been putting off telling you about him because I didn't want you to think being Nejeret was the only reason you were on the excavation. In the process of observing you, Heru, or Marcus as you know him, discovered that you were a talented ancient linguist. He called me in November, asking my permission to invite you to join the excavation. I wasn't against it, 
but I let him know I didn't think it was the best idea, considering what could be happening on the solstice and that there would be so many Nezurets present. At that point, you hadn't shown any signs of manifesting. And like I've said before, you manifesting didn't show up in the possible futures at all. There weren't even any possible futures that showed us ever meeting or interacting. He shook his head, clearly confused by the big old blank spot in the future ought surrounding my Nezuret status. Heru is... well, Heru, he said. He's used to getting what he wants. And since I didn't prohibit it, he asked you to join his little team of Nezure archaeologists. The last time I spoke with him, in mid-December, he let me know, much to my shock, that you were beginning to manifest. I was planning to return at the end of January. It should have been plenty of time. Unfortunately, your Nezuret traits developed more quickly than expected. And Suze called me in a panic when you started showing that you knew things you could only have learned from an echo. And, well, after a thoughtful moment, he said, I think that's the gist of it. And you two haven't spoken since? Heru and I? No, Alexander said, resolutely. Why not? Alexander glared at the wall. That, my dear, is between Heru and me. I pressed my lips together, thinking, Alexander was my grandpa, my blood. He'd helped me understand what I was, and he'd just told me far more than I'd already known about the months leading up to my first journey into the yacht. If I couldn't trust Alexander, then I couldn't trust anyone. Okay, I said simply. Okay? Okay, I repeated. Okay, he agreed with a nod. Minutes passed, and we ate in silence. I cleaned my plate and took seconds, while Alexander managed seconds and thirds. I wondered what would happen to a Nezure who didn't receive adequate nutrition, but it was a question for another day. When both of our plates were clean, and we were sitting in contented silence, I decided it was time to initiate phase three of my plan. There's something I want to show you, I declared. Are you done? Alexander let out a blissful, yes. Great, I exclaimed and grabbed his hand. Hold on. Taking longer than I was used to when visiting that particular echo, the usual swirl of colors surrounded us before the world resettled in the form of a night-darkened waiting room. Surprisingly, the fertility clinic didn't seem nearly as dark as it had the last time I'd visited this particular echo. Maybe my heightened Nezuret senses are finally kicking in, I considered. Would you care to explain our current setting, granddaughter? Alexander asked curtly, and I wondered if I had yet again breached some Nezure social norm. We're in the fertility clinic, Mom used. It's the night before I'm, er, conceived, I floundered. Just watch. There was a click, and the door separating the clinic from the stairs creaked open. A tall, slender man with pale skin and black hair entered the waiting room. And who is this? Alexander asked, suddenly very curious. My father, or my biological father. Come on, let's wait for him in here. I said, leading Alexander to the laboratory, where he would be able to get a good look at the man whose DNA made up half of mine. I had a theory, but I needed to see Alexander's reaction to know if it was correct. What makes you think that criminal is your biological father? Just watch, I repeated. The man entered the lab and turned on the lights. He headed for the pair of small freezers. Deus! Alexander exclaimed as he stared in horror at the man. He leapt in front of me, gripping my upper arms tightly. We must leave now, Alexandra. I could feel him attempting to pull me away from the aunt, but stubbornly, I held us there. What? Why? 
I asked. In my surprise, I had inadvertently paused the echo. The man, my father, was frozen, with his arm reaching into one of the freezers. Alexander, realizing I was holding us in the echo, stopped fighting. He studied the man, examining and memorizing every detail of his appearance, as well as what he was doing. I believe you are right. He is your father. But, Alexandra, you must release us so we can return to our bodies. It's imperative, he urged, wrapping me in a tight hug. I returned us immediately, and once again, we sat at the dinner table with our empty plates in front of us. I let go of Alexander's hand. What? He cut me off. I've never seen him in person, but we are all forced to memorize his likeness, so we know to get as far away from him as possible if we cross his path. He is very dangerous. He breathed deeply. The man in the echo was set. Set? I asked, astounded, as in the council member who disappeared over 3,000 years ago set? I'd thought the man in the echo was Najere and had showed him to Alexander to receive confirmation, but set? That I definitely hadn't expected. Yes, Alexander said, and he's my father. So it would seem, he said carefully. This discovery is extraordinarily important, but I'll just confuse you if I try to explain why. I should have paid more attention to... Abruptly, he lifted his fist and brought it back down on the table, hard. Damn it all to hell! I jumped, then leaned back in my chair. Alexander? I asked, my voice small. What's going on? I was suddenly very frightened. I'd never seen Alexander act like this. I'd never seen anyone act like this. I'll stay with you tonight and accompany you to work tomorrow morning. Heru and his team are the best in this regard and will help you understand. Understand what? I asked. What it means to be of the line of Ivan and of the line of Set, he said somberly. But, no, Alexandra, you must wait until tomorrow, and whatever you do, do not enter the art again tonight. For the sake of your life, please, do not.